And what position did you play, Sean? Uh, not to sound unseemly, but I played both ways. I played offense and defense on the line. Ah. So, so we are we are live on YouTube now. We are live. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Budget Committee meeting for March 24th, uh, 2021. Uh, we will be uh, uh, talking this morning, uh, well, I guess all day, about the Transportation and Public Works budget. I would like to call this meeting to order. And uh, our standard practice with the virtual meetings is moving through the list of councillors and, and just doing an AV check. So let's start with uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon and District 1. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, fellow colleagues. All ready for Transportation and Public Works. District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadaba Valley, and all of the beautiful communities in between. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hensby, District 2. Ready to hit the road. Let's get on with it. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kent, District 3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. President accounted for. Ready to roll. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Purdy, District 4. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. Ready for the day. Looking forward to it. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Austin, District 5. I'm here, Mr. Chair. Ready to go. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mancini, District 6. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, ready to go from uh, District 6 in Dartmouth. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mason, District 7. I guess they wanted to wait for the uh, the highlight <laughs> reel, right? Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, Councillor Mason, District 7, uh, Halifax South Downtown. Another beautiful, sunny, clear day out there. Uh, hard to uh, stay focused when that's happening just right over there out the window, but we'll all do yes. our best today, I'm sure. You should probably move off the bridge for the remainder of the meeting. It might be a little more safe. Uh, oh, uh, Councillor Smith, District 8. Happy to be here, Chair. Councillor Smith, District 8, Halifax, Peninsula. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary, District 9. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to be here on behalf of the residents of Halifax West Armdale. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morse, District 10. Good morning, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Happy to be here and looking forward to getting on the road with this session today. So thank you. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, District 11. Good morning from Purcell's Cove. Glad to see everyone here this morning. Good morning. And Councillor Stoddard, District 12. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. It's sunny in District 12, Lakeside, Timberley, Beachville, Clayton Park West, mm -hmm. and Wedgwood. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace, to, <coughs> excuse me, District 13. Yeah, I have that effect. Don't worry, Councillor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, District 13, ready to roll, ready to rumble, ready to uh, run and bike, walk, all that kind of stuff. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Good stuff, thank you. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, District 14. Hey, good morning everybody. Here in uh, beautiful downtown Beaver Bank, pencil sharpen, extra big mug of tea, we're ready to go. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Oath at uh, District 16. Good morning from uh, sunny Bedford Wentworth and looking forward to hearing from the fabulous team at uh, TPW. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Mayor Savage. Good morning, Chair and colleagues. Good morning. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody. So let's proceed with the agenda. The next item is the approval of the minutes of March 3rd and 10th, uh, 2021. <coughs> Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 3rd and 10th, 2021, Councilor please? Cleary so moves. Uh, okay. Councillor Cleary, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Uh, any errors or omissions? Hearing none, all in favor of the minutes of March 3rd and 10th, 2021, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Great, the motion passes, thank you. Uh, call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Super, thank you. Uh, hearing none, we are moving into the public participation section of the meeting. And as a reminder to those watching from home, in order to have signed up as a speaker, the deadline was 4.30 p.m., the business day prior to the hearing. We have two speakers signed up for today's meeting. Uh, they are Shalom Mandeville and Curtis Larsh. 
any member of the public who has registered with the clerk's office on this matter will be given five minutes to address the topic. When I call your name, you may unmute your mic and begin speaking. Uh, Shalom, are you in the meeting with us today? Mr. Clerk, have we confirmed Confirmed, uh, Shalom is with us? He is in the meeting. We're just getting him to unmute his mic right now. Beautiful. Thank you. Shalom, you appear to be unmuted. Can you try your mic, please? Would this be an issue of pressing star six or the mute button on your phone? It may be some device settings. I do see his name has popped up and he is unmuted. Yes. No, I'm sorry, Shalom. We can't hear you. Uh, so we can see him, but he's not speaking yet. Mr. Chair, it may be prudent to move on to the next speaker. Uh, and I, I was thinking the same thing. That, that's fantastic. Uh, Mr. Larsh, Curtis, sir, good morning. Are you there? Hello. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, you may proceed. You have uh, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak directly to you today. My name is Curtis, and my pronouns are they, them. I recognize that I'm standing on unceded land that belongs to the Mi'kmaq people, and I'm here today to sound the alarm on transportation. The design and policies of our crosswalks are killing us. The community of HRM is calling on you to swiftly act to solve the human rights issues strollers face every time we go outside. Stroller, an inclusive term for pedestrians. I'll start by sharing my story with you. I was born six weeks prematurely as a direct result of the stress and trauma my mother was forced to live after my father was hit by a careless driver. My mom, who was seven months pregnant, suddenly had an overwhelming amount of stress to deal with. Money, security, our home, a three-year-old toddler, and me, a baby on the way my life was forced to start prematurely because of the lack of municipal and provincial decisions that should have protected my dad traveling home from work. I have never known my true dad. I was reminded of this constantly through my mom's despair and depression growing up. This tragic event that literally shaped my existence was preventable. It's something I live with to this day, and I'm 32 now. When we think of vehicle or car, incidents or collisions, we think of them as accidents, uh, whoops. We are programmed through the culture of driving cars that, lang that the language accident is the only way to describe the situation when a driver collides into another driver, a building, infrastructure, or worse, humans. It's just a fender bender, but there are no accidents. We need to place responsibility on drivers' actions that have a direct impact on vulnerable humans. We must remember that as much as we love our cars, they are not alive. It is time for an immediate adoption of new language, collision, traumatic event, incident, driver of car, not an accident. On March 20th, the stroller movement in HRM 
was able to successfully influence a global news story to accurately reflect the realities of the recent tragic event of Dr. David Gass being hit by a driver operating a vehicle who later died. The stroller movement asked Global News to change the headline from a man has died from injuries sustained earlier this week when he was hit by a pickup truck in the north end of Halifax to Halifax pedestrian hit by a pickup truck driven by a man has died, police. So what can we learn from this? One, that our current car culture places blame on a car, an inanimate object. And two, that it's possible to change our perspective and language, placing blame on the driver, not a car. 11 people of HRM have died from being hit by careless drivers since 2018. We lost Dr. David Gass after a careless driver collided into them at a fatal speed. I condemn and denounce the policies and laws in place that have protected this driver to be charged with a failure to lead for a yield for a pedestrian and will likely face little to no lasting consequences for their actions. Compare this to the generations of suffering that the Gass family now is forced to live. This is not justice. I believe this was manslaughter. Our stroller community feels defeated because of this unbalance. I refuse to let myself become desensitized to hearing about these deaths in the community. And where is your sense of urgency? 383 humans have been hit by a driver in the last 38 months in HRM. Unacceptable. You, HRM City Council, Mayor Mike Savage, are barely getting your toes wet with a few efforts improving safety in crosswalks. After reviewing the 2021 Traffic Safety Measures Budget, Five advanced yield lines at crosswalks and 19 rapid flashing beacons are not ambitious enough solutions, to name a few. Our human rights are actively being violated due to your complacency. Where is your steadfast commitment to Vision Zero? Why are you not holding traffic engineers accountable? It's time to jump in. The water's just fine. Imagine if we designed our cities as if cars serve people instead of people serving cars. Pete Buttigieg, Secretary of Transportation in the US said on March 21st, 2021, we're better off if our decisions revolve not around the car, but around the human being. This is the start of a monumental cultural shift worldwide. Right now, fearless commitment from all of you is the only way forward. I leave you with this. What will you do when your father, cousin, friend, dies from their injuries sustained from being hit by a driver in a crosswalk. Will you act then? Thank you very much, uh, Curtis, for that impassioned uh, presentation. I, I appreciate that. We will certainly take that to heart. We do have a number of priorities that we have to balance. And unfortunately, we aren't able to do everything that we would like to do. And uh, this is one of the areas that we have to make uh, difficult decisions about. Shalom Mandeville, are you with us? So, so we have reached out to Shalom. Uh, he is going to be dialing in. It appears the internet connection that he has was not allowing it to happen. So he should be here momentarily. He is going to have to call in due to his internet connection. Okay, thank you. In the meantime, if I may, we have in-camera minutes from February 17th, uh, 2021. And I'm wondering if the committee would be interested uh, in, in so moving move, those. Mr. Chairman, so move the move. minutes of February 17th, 2021 is provided circulated. Okay. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Second, Councillor Kent. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Is there any need to go in camera and look at those minutes? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of the minutes of February 17th, uh, 2021, signified by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we do have 
Shalom back in the meeting. Uh, he is joining via phone. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello, this is Shalom Mandeville. Hello, Shalom. Uh, welcome to the uh, Budget Committee and the Transportation and Public Works uh, presentation. Um, okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, you, have, you have five minutes. Uh, I apologize. My Zoom wasn't working. I've been on it many, many times for, with my scientific groups that I belong to, international ones. I apologize. No um, problem. And uh, I represent a, another scientific group called Soil and Water Conservation Society of Metro Halifax. And we have been involved in uh, sam uh, sampling, analyzing uh, not only the chemistry, but the biology of about 1,000 lakes in the HRM and the adjoining th four counties. Um, we don't do all of these things for every lake because it's a lot of work. So we have already provided all this information back in 2002 to the regional plan. The regional plan went into a lot of details and we provided a whole bunch of documentation. And we also uh, put that in a DVD disc and His Worship the Mayor has one of them. Uh, when he became the mayor first, I gave him one. I think some of the councillors have it too. The councillor from Bedford, I think I gave one to him. But the rest of you are uh, relatively new, so I didn't give it to you. So. What I request, I know the times are bad financially now, but they're not going to be bad all the time. So five years down the road, 10 years down the road, it will be nice if um, the works department uh, sets up uh, treatment along the highways, um, mainly in highly crowded areas. A lot of people don't realize, and I've not seen consultant studies refer to that, but there's a lot of literature showing that the pollution from lakes, I'm not talking of gases, I'm not talking exhaust gases, but small metal particles, small rubbers, you know, from the tires, they do reach the lakes through the catch basins. And street cleaning will not help because these are small particles, less than 40 microns. The micron is a millionth of meter. You cannot remove them. So you have to use some kind of treatment. And back in, I'm sorry to give you a little bit of history, but I have to. I attended two conferences in the United States on, on invitation. One was in Orlando, Florida. The other one is in Maine, uh, Lewiston, Maine. In each of them, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, exhibited treatment devices along the roads they allegedly uh, implement in the United States. I've seen pictures of them. I never visited one. And I'm sure our very good engineers in HRM and Halifax Water can combine together and design them. They're pretty simple. And I've given a sketch. It's a part one of my email. I get provided for pictorial stuff. I also have the major design plan from Monash University in Australia, but you have to revise that to meet our, uh, what do you call, precipitation and runoff characteristics. And the problem basically is that the metals, small metals like copper, zinc, and others, they uh, add to what's called the conductivity. And with higher conductivity, about 500 uh, micromoles or, or microsiemens per centimeter, the lakes don't turn over. So there's a lot of problems occurs in the lake. And the second thing is, um, what was the second thing? Oh yeah, the particles, the rubber particles exert an oxygen demand. And Mr. Chairman, you, you and I communicated, and I thank you for your courtesy. Um, you know that many of the lakes we discussed with, or at least addressed, have oxygen problem. You know, And this is one of the reasons. So it's not all fertilizer. A lot of people blame fertilizers, but we have no proof of this fertilizer. So it's automobile traffic. And lastly, I sent you as an item there as, as an attachment from Dr. Bill Hart, who used to be with the Center of Water Resort Studies at Dalhousie University for many, many, many years. He was involved in the first lake study as well. And he sent me something, I wasn't aware of it, um, about use of uh, pentaphosphorus in gasoline uh, for, uh, you know, uh, to raise the octane rating and also for uh, preservation or storage. And some of this leak in very small quantities. It's, you don't see that. But if you measure 
not in the lake because lake it, it gets flushed and some of it goes into bottom sediments. But you have to measure at the end of uh, um, you know the pipes. You will see that. So the only way is treatment, and I'm hoping that uh, the works department will pursue that. I first suggested that the county in 1989 uh, uh, when they had a meeting on First Lake. So I think I'm almost five minutes now. I've got a stopwatch here. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you were just about five minutes. I, I appreciate the information and the correspondence. Uh, you sent that through to the clerk? Yes. And, and I just want to make sure that, uh, uh, Mr. Clerk, you have forwarded that to all members of council? Correspondence has been distributed to all members of council. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Shalom, uh, for the information and in your presentation. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Can I hang uh, up now? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. That ends the public participation section of the meeting. We are moving on to the presentation by Transportation and Public Works. Uh, over to Brad Anguish. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, and members of Council. It is always a sincere pleasure to present a business unit budget on behalf of the hardworking, very dedicated men and women of the business units I've had the opportunity to represent over the years. Uh, in this case, uh, this will be my, my basic third budget representing transportation and, and public works, and uh, glad to be here this morning. As we work through this presentation this morning, um, it is loaded with information. Unfortunately, I don't have all the time to work through all of it in detail. Therefore, I'll be moving quickly in some spots and glancing over some of the material but obviously uh, very interested in receiving your questions on any of the material in the presentation. Next slide, please. Our mission at Transportation and Public Works is we take pride in providing high quality transportation and public works services to benefit our citizens. We make a difference. This mission is also known amongst most of our staff as get stuff done. Thank you. Next slide. So I'm fortunate to be a part of a very strong leadership team. Um, most who are, have joined me this morning. Uh, TPW is comprised of five divisions along with the Cogswell uh, Redevelopment Project Office that reports to me. Um, Salt Waste Resources is led by Andrew Philopoulos. Parking Services is led by Victoria Horn, who is also the Parking Authority. Traffic management is led by Tasso Kucherlakis, who is also the traffic authority. Road operations and construction is led by Beverly Odette. Project planning and design that delivers all of our capital program, uh, the majority of our capital program relating to roads is led by David Hubley. And of course, the Cogswell Redevelopment Office, which is uh, John Spinelli and Donna Davis. Next slide, please. Certainly one of our primary responsibilities in TPW is the long-term life cycle maintenance and management of the assets under our charge, of which there are many. I won't go into details around all of these numbers. I'll just pick off certain ones that are interesting. Given the new council and its composure and where, these, where the councillors are largely hailing from, I thought it was important to focus on roadway lanes this morning but we always report on the kilometers of roadway lanes. I can tell you it grew 12 kilometers over last year. Uh, that primarily happens through development. But what is most interesting is that um, 4,700 lane kilometers in HRM are the responsibility of the province. So I think that's uh, certainly with many of the new councillors uh, on board, um, learning how to uh, work with the municipality and the province has been a challenge and motivating the province and ourselves to coordinate and get work done in those 4,700 lane kilometers from everything from state of good repair to safety. Next slide. On this one, I'll uh, just focus on the pedestrian ramps with tactiles. Um, this number grew uh, from 823, it grew from 400 last year. So we implemented uh, 423 pedestrian ramps with tactiles last year. We continue to accelerate this program 
uh, out of respect of our focus and dedication to achieving accessibility within our community. The other significant number here that's new this year is the 172 parking pay stations that have taken the place of the former 2000 meters that were removed this summer. Next slide. On this slide, this shows mainly our uh, solid waste assets and our parking assets. I'll just highlight that the 163 uh, accessible on street uh, parking spaces on the peninsula grew by 10 last year. And of course, a uh, little known fact, there's about 138,000 green carts in circulation, which is an interesting number, especially when you uh, figure out the supply issue we had this year from Schaefer that we did not anticipate through COVID and the impact that it has on our community. So we learned some lessons about contingency and supply chain and uh, hats off to the teams that uh, kept the green cars going through that challenging period of supply shortage. Next slide. I think with all business units, uh, as we start to look at some of the successes over the past year, um, EPW was no exception to those successes. I won't focus on everything we've done, just pick off some of the few unique things we did. Certainly parking was a, a significant initiative that we undertook. Uh, obviously it had a, a significant ramification on revenues, but nonetheless, we believe it, it absolutely helped out businesses during a difficult time. Of course, there was free parking from March to June. We went with the 15 minute loading zones to help curbside pickup and uh, 15 minute free parking that we did again in December with the next wave. Um, and of course, we were working in behind the scenes with stakeholders to create uh, on street parking uh, spaces for all of the COVID 19 testing and vaccination clinics that were occurring throughout the municipality. Of course, we supported uh, planning and development in the uh, activation of the mobility response plan, uh, such as the uh, expanded sidewalks and the slow streets. Um, we transitioned all of our active transportation public engagement to virtual, which was key in keeping some major initiatives moving, such as the AAA bike network. We transitioned to virtual pretender construction reviews in order to keep construction moving. Um, and our hats are off to ICT, who were able to move our staff uh, to home offices with the significant uh, technology requirements they have in, in managing through all of these drawings. In terms of uh, the cost, though, we did have to, and, and certainly was forecasting our recast budget, we did have to defer many non essential uh, initiatives and, and administration. Certainly, this has put us behind the gun with our council reports. It has also put us, uh, for instance, we had to, we weren't able to advance our AG Auditor General recommendations around road and sidewalk asset management, but you'll see that'll be a focus this year. Um, and, uh, you know, we had to put off some software implementation and other initiatives. So we focus solely on keeping the economy moving and keeping our end of the bargain up in terms of moving money to the street. That's anything that didn't have a direct uh, basically benefit to citizens was uh, was put to the back burner. So it's, next slide. Just quickly dancing through some of the other successes we had, uh, certainly getting the Cogswell District construction tender out the door, uh, the value of about 100 million, estimated value at 100 million dollars was a significant uh, achievement. Um, I look forward to be back to you in the spring with an award report. Um, we developed a four-year integrated transportation capital program. This is key in terms of meeting IMP demand and balancing uh, state of good repair against all of the program activity that is required under the integrated mobility plan. And I'll stand on, on the importance of this uh, in, a, in, in another slide coming up. We were able to tender 89% of our uh, 89% of our capital plan, it was a recast capital plan, and deliver, construct 77% uh, of it, which isn't far off where we were the year before, uh, which is a significant um, achievement given the COVID circumstances. We're also obviously very grateful to our construction partners who were there uh, throughout to, to respond to the tenders and deliver upon them. Of course, we had a significant increase in road safety countermeasures implemented this year. I'll focus on this in a future slide. Um, and then in terms of uh, um, red tape reduction, we have implemented the one call uh, 
known in other parts of the country as the one called Before You Dig system. We are, uh, HRM is now on board with all utilities with the exception of Nova Scotia Power. So this has a big benefit to business uh, and construction, uh, you know, getting into the streets, uh, not only quickly, but safely. We also amended the streets bylaw to allow for annual permits. This is a, a big game changer for uh, high frequency uh, work in the right of way, such as uh, sign industry and window washing industries where they no longer have to worry about individual permits and they get to get annual permits, which relates uh, to time and, and money savings for them. Next slide. We undertook, uh, in terms of cyc cyclical proactive tree pruning, uh, we undertook a, a research assignment with, with Dalhousie. I'll just cut to the chase. Basically, they looked at two years before we started cyclical pruning two years after we started cyclical pruning and basically validated that that work is is critical not only does it improve the tree health which we always knew it improves safety within the street but most importantly it reduces the reactive calls from uh from citizens significantly and it also reduces cost so it's it's an area where we continue to want to make um, progress in terms of trying to grow our budget wherever possible uh, in terms of uh, trees, again, we were uh, named Tree City of the World. I think Council is very aware of that. Obviously, we awarded the $450 million design, build, own, operate, and transfer contract uh, that will secure um, our organics uh, operations for the next, uh, give us a new plant and our, secure our operations for the next 25 years with the chance to expand that as, as far as 35 years. In terms of the parking technology implementation, I think you're well aware of that. Uh, got the new pay stations in the street. We're getting all the benefits of the new technology in terms of the data. And uh, of course, the citizens got uh, an enhanced mobile app. They've got multiple payment options and they've got self-service ticket portals uh, and permit management systems. So significant improvements made in that system and with more to come as we fully embrace the, the capability within the technology. We were able to transition all of our solid waste education programs online and actually graduated the first online uh, master composter recycler class of 2020 folks. So uh, that was quite an achievement. As well, and is very important for TPW is diverse hiring. Um, we're very proud that we had a couple of significant achievements this year. One, we've, we've uh, solid waste has brought in an ISANS candidate and uh, it's turning out very well there. And in terms of um, our African Nova Scotian uh, recruitment, typically TPW has a history of having to designate the positions. We're pleased to say that we had our first um, leadership position uh, filled without having to designate it, which uh, we're proud of. We've got a long way to go, but uh, we, are, we are taking pride in the steps that we have made. So hats off to our team in that. Next slide. So we'll get into some of the performance indicators. Uh, I won't be able to dive into all of these in any detail. Uh, my key thing I wanna drive home is that TPW is highly measured and monitored. Um, and so we pay a lot of attention to satisfaction surveys. Um, we've listed out the four recent ones here. The thing I'll draw your attention to here is that not all of these surveys are statistically comparable. Um, so the 2014 and 2018 surveys represented in the blue are statistically comparable, um, and uh, they were the past citizen surveys, so we keep an eye on those. And of course, the recent two, Shape Your Budget Survey and the Municipal Budget Survey, they are not statistically um, uh, comparable. However, uh, if you look at the two bars in each of the cases, really, uh, we're either holding ground or gaining ground slightly. Uh, the only area that were had a, a downward trend of more than three percent was in traffic management, and we know that you know anecdotally and through the uh, on, online comments that this has uh, has uh, relationship to congestion. So, and we know that through our IMP work, that that number will is going to be what it is um, going forward. Next slide. In terms of uh, just showcasing some of the work in, in uh, parking, um, you can see that the response to service request remains very high, even throughout COVID. 
And as well, we threw in some facts here on the parking session data that's rolling off the system. So you just get a sense of what we're able to, the, the kind of data we're able to get. So there were 17 million roughly minutes purchased between October 13th to February 19th with an average session length of about an hour. So uh, all data, which really we had no grip on before. So very powerful stuff as we continue to work with that. Next slide. Okay, here I'm gonna pause. This is a very critical slide for council. This is key to your direction to staff. So I think council is very, very aware. Um, you have given the staff the very pointed goal of achieving a 20% reduction in reducing fatal and injury collisions by 2023. Key pieces to pull from this slide are the, um, the baseline year has been established. So the baseline year uh, for total fatal and injury collisions is 800. Uh, seems very round, uh, but that's the way the numbers worked out. So it is the 800 number that we're watching uh, and obviously uh, trying to improve upon that by at least 20% by 2023. So that's the baseline year. Baseline year was combined of 2018 and 2019. That was the best practice recommended that we take an average of two years. So you're seeing the 2019 results compared to that baseline and you're seeing the 2020 results compared to that baseline. So of course, uh, you will see that uh, our 2020 date uh, results to December uh, indicate a 23.6% drop. Of course, that is obviously highly influenced by COVID and the re high reduction in traffic volume. Obviously, what we did though, is we uh, worked with my counterparts in the US who uh, was trying to get underneath this number to know whether we did really bad during COVID or we did really good. The data coming out of the U.S. from April to June of, of the, call it the first quarter of COVID, from their estimates, what happened was, yes, they had a reduction in the total amount of collisions uh, and fatal, uh, fatal and injury collisions. However, uh, their rate went up per kilometer traveled. And so what we wanted to do with our team was try and look to see if we can understand our data better. So what we've included here is that we used all the data points we have at the bridges to figure out our reduction in, in uh, traffic volume over the course of the year. So it was about 18%. And so we were pleased to understand that our reduction in fatal and injury collisions was deeper than that. That said, I, I can't underscore enough, especially in the wake of the events of, of this past week and the tragic fatality. Um, we are absolutely on fire to make a difference here. The team absolutely hurts when these incidents happen and they get motivated by it. It kicks us and then we get rolling. So I, I just want everybody to understand there is nobody on our team that isn't absolutely committed to this goal. And so we're, we're pleased because when we compare it to other municipalities, we have very clear direction from council and it's a direction that we feel is achievable and it motivates us. I will say other cities that we compare with uh, certainly you have the towards zero goal, but nothing else to drive them towards zero. There's a lot of futility amongst those staffs. We are very, very focused um, in making a difference here. And uh, thank you for your direction and your commitment to this goal. Um, the other interesting fact out of this uh, is that we also started to look at where these collisions are happening and on, quite frankly, on whose roads. Um, because one thing about our numbers that you have to be very careful is that there's a few things we do different than most municipalities. One, fatal and injury collisions. If you look closely at the fine print on a lot of measures from a lot of municipalities, they will call it severe injury or major injury. We do not make any uh, clarification on that. If somebody gets injured, period, no matter what the degree, it's counted. Second thing is, this is all collisions, no matter whose roads it's on. And again, I go back to the 4,700 lane kilometers of roads that are within the provincial jurisdiction. I don't bring this up to divert blame in any way, but rather show there is a limited uh, amount of application in terms of how far our staff can go. As you know, we work on the with the province on our road safety committee to make a difference with them. 
and uh, and obviously work with our policing partners and our uh, communication partners to tackle the three E's of road safety, which are enforcement, education, and engineering. It is uh, interesting to note though, in two of the last three years, the fatalities that have occurred within our municipal boundaries have been greater on the provincial roads than they have been on the municipal roads. And obviously that just continues to uh, impress upon us the need to collaborate and make a difference throughout the entire municipality. That's uh, next slide. In terms of uh, pedestrian collisions, uh, when we made the switch to the road safety strategy and moved to the overall indicator of collisions, one of the concerns was is that we were not focused on pedestrian collisions. I want to make sure that everybody knows that we are very focused and we continue to watch this, these numbers. Uh, obviously, while there appears to be an improvement, as, as you know, any, any death, any injury is purely unacceptable and we're doing everything we can within the resources we have to eliminate this from HRM. Okay, next slide. So what are we doing about it? Um, there's a lot going on. We're pressing on a lot of pedals, if you will, at the same time. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that we've been doing over the over the past few years, some of the pilot programs that we've been doing. This is not all inclusive by any stretch. Much more has been happening. What is not included on this slide is, for instance, all the work that's going on on the top 10 uh, collision intersections. We Over the course of the past uh, year, we made about 50 adjustments at those intersections. They include things such as leading pedestrian intervals, but they also include important things like uh, um, visibility of the lights, um, missing, dealing with any missing signs, relocating signs, increasing visibility of, of uh, certain things, moving parking. So there's a lot of adjustments happening uh, based on those, uh, based on those intersections. We're focusing on some of the pieces I've put here. You can see how we are ramping up outputs in a number of areas. I, we look forward to your guidance in this area as we continue to uh, advance our work here. Certainly uh, I'll highlight that we have an annual report that goes to council in the June timeframe, starts at Transportation Standing Committee, goes to council in June. It is the point at which we engage council to make sure that the plan for the upcoming year is as you would wish. That is the best point in time to give staff guidance to adjust our plans going forward. Um, so just highlighting some of the things that we'll be doing this year. Um, we'll be increasing our outputs, as you can see, in leading pedestrian, uh, leading pedestrian intervals to 15 for this year. Uh, uh, sorry, my apologies, to 20 this year from 15 last year. We'll be increasing the RRFB rollout to 19. I will highlight here on the RRFBs where there's a lot of interest from council that staff did review the 365 basic mark, uncontrolled marked crosswalks. I can tell you that there's 58 that have been identified for our RFPs. There are another 41 under consideration for approximately 100 to be implemented. Right now, based on budget availability, um, we're, we're planning a five-year rollout at 20 per year. If we want to go faster, we can. We At this point, we'd likely have to do it through um, contract, and that would double double the investment. So we'd move from basically a million dollars to more like $2 million. But I, I say this not to advocate, but rather just indicate that I know there's a lot of interest. Of course, we're moving on as accessible pedestrian signals, speed display signs. You know, we've made a lot of progress on traffic calm streets, um, rapidly increasing the amount of output. Uh, moving to estimated 52 streets this year, I will talk about the additional million dollar briefing note that was distributed to council uh, last evening. I'll talk about that at the end of my presentation. Uh, we continue to move quite painfully, but determined through uh, getting our 40 kilometer hour neighborhoods approved uh, by the province and signing them accordingly. So we're estimating another six to be rolled out this year. Uh, advanced yield lines at crosswalks that was brought up. We're still uh, in, a, in pilot mode on those advanced yield lines. We believe they're gonna work. Um, and so we'll be looking to really accelerate 
output once we've confirmed that we're getting the kind of yield yield uh, success and safety outcomes that we're looking for. And as you know, we piloted the RA8 in street uh, school crosswalk signs this year that did not go very well. Um, basically within months of five signs being installed in the street, four were gone. And so we will not be advancing that as part of our uh, inventory going forward. I will also add that durable paint, because paint markings came up from both walk and roll, which I thank them for their input as always uh, to our presentation. Um, durable paint markings are also uh, under pilot. Uh, They're being implemented with all of our capital programs. They are being observed. The quick, quick piece about durable pavement markings is they're about eight to time, eight to 12 times more expensive. They last about four times as long, but they are very difficult to top up and repaint. So we are, and they also have uh, had um, uh, friction challenges with slipping in streets, especially with cyclists, motorcyclists. So we are, we are continuing to implement at a cautious rate uh, through our capital projects and monitoring these success. Next slide. Yeah. So in terms of uh, current plan initiatives for integrated mobility, as you can imagine, there would be many. Uh, this is only a tip of the iceberg, the highlights. So um, starting tomorrow, we seek input from Transportation Standing Committee on our thoughts on improving the traffic calming administrative order to really hit on the priority streets first. Um, we will be increasing the deployment of traffic safety measures, as I just uh, outlined. Uh, we'll be increasing school zone traffic calming. We will be increasing school zone parking enforcement. In fact, many of you may have already experienced the work of Victoria's team and of Tasso's team as they respond to your top three school priorities in terms of getting things sorted out at the schools uh, for safe arrival and drop off. Um, we will continue our signalized intersection improvements. Uh, we'll be on to uh, in safety service reviews of our high collision intersections, really, AKA the next 10 in the, uh, in the batting order. As well, we made a foray into diagnostic vehicle, uh, sorry, diagnostic video analysis of near misses. Um, this is something that council had been wanting us to look at because this has been the big concern from residents is that, you know, it's one thing to look at everything in the rear view and where collisions happen, but it's, now, where are the near misses? I can tell you that uh, we uh, we worked with their an insurance partner over the last year to undertake the diagnostic video analysis. We are now going through that data now to understand um, what improvements uh, will be suggested as a result of this video analysis. We'll also obviously be determining whether this is a new diagnostic tool that we'll add to our inventory. So um, great work going on there. Another big move next year, uh, even though the um, legislation isn't proclaimed yet, we will be moving, we are recommending to move ahead with a photo enforcement implementation uh, study. And essentially just to be sure we are not studying whether it's effective, we know it's effective. We intend to study how to implement. Um, this would include uh, speed detection and red light cameras. We also, uh, based on recent uh, guidance and, and uh, commitment from Transportation Standing Committee, we are moving to increase pedestrian recall. So this is the uh, pedestrian recall is basically the removes the requirement to hit the push button to cross the street. And essentially, uh, we'll move that from 38% of our current network to 72% of the total traffic signal network. That'll be done uh, starting in the spring. And that will be uh, basically in flight from 6 a.m. till midnight. Um, so that's a big move as well. Obviously, we'll be continuing our railway crossing safety measures to be fully in line with uh, the federal requirements. And there's six crossings remaining there. And finally, uh, we'll continue to in, uh, submit significant traffic safety act input to the province, uh, we've submitted dozens already that I believe council has been copied on and uh, much more to come from staff on that. Just quickly on the sign, the, sorry, the one picture there of the billboard sign, I'll just highlight that this is kind of a piece that we, to show that we work closely with commun corporate communications. They have the budget for Heads Up Halifax. This is one of their initiatives. Uh, there was 14 of these billboards 
put out with an estimated 14, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, an estimated 4.7 million views. All right, next slide. Okay. This is another busy slide, but a very important slide. And I wanna take the time to highlight key things here. So you have likely heard a lot about the declining pavement condition index. That is the yellow line represented on this slide. The red line indicates the budget and the black columns indicate the amount of kilometers paved. Quick visual, you will see the, very quickly that in 2018, there's a change. The primary, in other words, for the same, about the same amount of money spent, less kilometers of pavement being applied, okay? So what happened? Well, beyond the fact that I joined TPW, uh, what, what truly happened was IMP started to take effect. And essentially with complete streets, what happens is with the amount of extra curb, bump out the concrete works, the drainage, the traffic calming, as we go to implement complete streets, there's about a 25% premium on that work. And so basically for the same amount of money, you're getting 25% less pavement, blacktop. And so that's the key difference there. Um, so one of the things when we're thinking about road safety and folks are fixated on the road safety capital budget, I highlight that a lot of our road safety is being achieved through complete streets. So this premium of about seven, currently about about seven to $8 million on our capital projects also is being invested towards road safety, towards uh, better uh, active transportation infrastructure, such as uh, you know, uh, our MOPs, right? And all the work that goes into that. So our bump outs. And so this is an important factor when council is assessing how much they're investing. A lot of this premium does go into complete streets and road safety. Um, the other thing to understand about this slide is that in 2014, we were advised, uh, HRM was advised that we were under investing in the pavement. So it is catching up with us over time. Um, we, at that time, the estimate was about $10 million per year. You'll notice uh, down below at the bottom of the slide, I've indicated um, that we have a gap roughly that has now grown to about $25 million a year if we are to hold the pavement condition index because many counselors have said, what would it take to hold the line? Well, it'd be about $25 million more. And that's using complete street type rollouts. Obviously that's, that's not possible. And one of the key pieces that the auditor guided us on and we'll be in undertaking with council this year is to set what that condition index should be and start to drive the budget to maintain the index at the point which council wants to be at. I'll, I'll speak a little more on that in a second. So the concern with the PCI and the declining of it, the, the key concern here is that it can eventually, if it keeps degrading, it can eventually reach a point where essentially preventive maintenance is no longer effective. And we're, we reach a point where the average street uh, condition is such that everything has to be rehabilitated. Obviously, we don't want to get to that point. That's why it's very important that we work with council over this next year to sort out exactly where council wants to be based on condition and affordability. Next slide. So I won't go into too much here. These are just slides to show where we are. Not surprisingly, these next three slides show the pavement condition, the curb condition, the sidewalk condition. You, should, you wouldn't be shocked to understand that they're all sliding a bit. Um, the reason why I wanna show these slides is because this is the type of indicator that we want to work with council on, understanding exactly how much of your road network you want in a very good condition versus good versus fair versus poor versus very poor, and then drive to uh, fit our budgets to achieve your goals. So that's an important piece of work that we'll undertake this next year. So I'll ask that we skip through the next two slides just quickly. You have them there for reference. Okay, next slide. So potholes, everybody's favorite subject. Um, key piece I wanna drive off this is that we did very well through COVID in addressing potholes, not surprisingly. 
uh, less road wear from COVID, uh, but also there was less identification. With less people on the road, there's less people identifying uh, potholes. Obviously, our, our supervisors do their best to identify them all, all there, but we count a lot on citizens reporting them as well. So the, the numbers that you're seeing in priority one potholes, that decrease, is impacted by two things. So we had about 4,000 roughly potholes identified in 2019, drops to 1,200 in 2020. Um, two things drive that. One, of course, is uh, the reasons I just said, less road wear and less identification of the problems. However, uh, I will say 2019 was artificially high because of the impacts of Dorian the year before. We had to defer a lot of our pothole work into the following year. So. That's that slide in a nutshell. Next. Okay, so what are we doing about our, our asset conditions? Essentially, we're establishing road and sidewalk asset condition targets as approved by council, as I explained. We will be completing all Auditor General recommendations regarding roads and sidewalk, uh, side, sidewalk asset management. I will tell you that the auditor is currently working with us on the follow-up from that, because it's been 18 months. I don't expect uh, the results to be uh, entirely favorable, given that we had to defer a lot of the work. Uh, that said, um, we're well on our way to being able to address the recommendations. And, and that's largely because of our work uh, focused on the pavement management system. We'll be reviewing and updating the long outdated streets and encroachment bylaw, um, working with legal to get that one done. It's been well over a decade uh, in the works. We'll be evaluating uh, municipal uh, operation, maintenance, and funding of active transportation infrastructure. We'll be establishing the rural pedestrian program, including funding mechanisms. Uh, certainly, you've heard some engagement already on this. Uh, we expect to be back at council by summer um, with this re long awaited report. Um, we'll be developing a walkway and update the new sidewalk uh, selection criteria. That was a, that's a specified IMP action. We'll be getting on with that. We will be establishing a per council's direction. You just recently received your tactical mobility update uh, from PND. Part of that was to increase resources to um, implement and maintain uh, all of the infrastructure in the streets, such as that, that would accommodate slow streets and tactical urbanism. So we have four positions, uh, three FTEs and one uh, term position in our budget to address that. We'll be preparing for the road transfer, 310 lane kilometers to be transferred from the province effective June, 2022. So we're well into getting on with that preparation. And in that case, we will be uh, implementing some staff as well. I'll get to that in a second. Of course, we'll be implementing roadside memorial guidelines. That is a report due to council and completing our downtown parking supply assessment. The name, but a few things going on in our, our uh, integrated mobility asset side of the business. Next slide. Certainly, I hope by now you've all met with Dave, you've all received your uh, uh, list of capital projects for this year, uh, certainly. So I'm not gonna spend much time here other than to just uh, talk about some of the highlights. Of course, uh, we are striving to commence construction by late fall with Cogswell. Um, Remains to be seen whether we can break physically break ground, um, but it would start with a bypass for the start of construction of a bypass road, and we hope to be there by late fall. Um, Bears Road Transit Corridor, complete that phase, the first phase of that. Uh, Dutch Village Road, obviously a multimodal project that's in the uh, capital plan for this year. We're undertaking detailed design. Uh, highlight the Prince Albert Road because we just heard about uh, from Mr. Mandeville about the need for some stormwater uh, work uh, ahead of uh, kind of the lake management works. So the Prince Albert, by sorry, by direction of council, Prince Albert Road will uh, contain a stormwater best management practice component with it um, when it is uh, constructed this year. Lady Hammond and the CNR bridge on South Street, um, both bridges being rehabilitated, of course, these are just one of the many things digging into your uh, capital budget. Bridges are in need of rehabilitation, and this is a big area where we're starting to invest more and more funds to make sure our bridges are kept up to date. 
We'll finish the Forest Hills project and uh, very excited to get on with Kane Street in North Preston to do the recapitalization that'll have traffic coming in and sidewalk, a much needed sidewalk in, in North Preston. So this just gives you a sample. Next slide. Obviously another uh, uh, critical priority of council is delivering on the AAA bike network. Um, we are 33% complete to date or 18 of 55 kilometers. I won't go through the list here. You can see all the major pieces that we're advancing this year, uh, including getting on with the, uh, the project management design of the critical McDonald Bridge bikeway connector. Next slide. Turning to some of our environmental indicate indicators, and uh, we've added a little feature here. Um, first, uh, the goal was to uh, was to plant 26,000 trees by 2023. Uh, we're in, close enough now to project that we won't make it. We're going to hit council will hit about 50% of that target. Uh, we'll get to about 13,000 trees by 2023 based on the current level investment. What we are projecting, you'll see, is 1,450 trees to be planted this coming year. We have done that through uh, reinstating the planting budget, which was removed for COVID. We've re uh, sorry, reinstated $900,000 for tree planting, as well as augmented that with $275,000 from capital uh, to deliver on those 1,450 trees. Um, the price of trees has gone up significantly. Um, we were at a time looking at $500 per tree. We're now looking at about $800 in the ground. So that's making a big difference in kind of how, how far the money goes. What we have added this year though, is, is the actual, something we haven't reported on before is how many we're losing uh, so that council gets a sense of where we are. And this is critical. And it kind of came about once we realized the tree planting was cut for COVID and we tried to get an assessment. So to really sum it up, between Dorian and the trees lost during Dorian and the impact of no tree planting last year, essentially between the years 2018 to 2020, um, we lost 2,700 trees and planted 3,000. So we've, we've basically held ground. So it's, I think it's just important that we understand everybody thinks it's a net gain on the trees, that they last forever. They don't. Uh, we have we have uh, aging aging inventory and we're losing trees uh, as well. So the good news is again we remain tree city of the world and we are you know we are at least uh, replacing what we're losing. Next slide. No surprise here. Uh, again, this just talks about diversion. Uh, HRM continues to uh, have a strong position within the national framework for diversion. Um, I'll leave it at that. That's no surprise to council. Next slide. This is a number, obviously, we're this new to the slide this year, and we want to show um, this is basically our disposal rate per capita. Good news story here is we're well below the uh, provincial average by about 10% on disposal per capita. The other factor that goes into this is obviously we want to keep an eye on the rate at which we're disposing and that impact on Otter Lake. So I've also included the estimated Otter Lake site life right now is sitting at 2046. That is primarily, uh, its life has been primarily extended in that the commercial waste is being hauled out of the municipality. And so we continue to keep an eye on this rate because obviously it's about a 10 year runway to site a new landfill. So at this point, based on all indicators, we still have long lead. Next slide. In terms of our environmental plan initiatives, uh, we'll be getting on with developing the solid waste strategy terms of reference. Uh, our guidance from council was to wait EPR results from the province. However, we believe it's wise to do concurrent activity and get on with at least establishing the terms of reference with council so that we are ready to go when, uh, when the province uh, moves forward with EPR, hopefully soon. Uh, obviously, we'll be implementing the new collection plans that were just approved by council for curbside collection. We will be commencing the construction of your new composting facility, improving the legal dumping and litter bylaws. Uh, so you've approved first reading. We'll be second reading very soon at council. That involves a multimedia education program, along with the addition of a diversion officer, which is included in our budget. 
um, to, to put more teeth behind that program for council's direction. We do a lot in the promotion game. I won't go through all of these. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, we will be advancing. Uh, we are in good position to advance the pet waste pilot project this year as, as directed by council. Obviously we cannot advance it under uh, during COVID. So we'll be working with parks and recreation on that. Finally, um, we per council's uh, direction um, and approval of the lake management report that came to council. We have included funding for enhanced street sweeping program. We've added, uh, we have funds identified within our budget for one operator and within the capital program for one more sweeper. And this will allow us to, uh, while we haven't got the routes all sorted out yet, this will allow us to increase our, uh, our husbandry around lakes. Next slide. Almost there. So service excellence. Um, Council has wanted us for a long time to improve construction communications. We will start that journey in earnest this year. Um, one of the key pieces we need to implement with construction communications is the rationale for the construction and its relationship to IMP. One of the challenges we had, and we saw it very, very quickly on the Four Sills Parkway, is that the community still believes that construction, road construction projects are all about getting wider and faster. And uh, IMP is all about getting narrower and slower with the long-term goals of improving safety and the overall cost of maintaining our assets into the future. And so um, we'll start that journey of making sure that it's more than just saying construction's coming, but to try and draw the relationship as to how it benefits our community overall. We'll also be getting on with uh, the uh, delivering the report to council on a mobilization, mobilization best practices, AKA booting. Um, we also want to explore the integration of our contaminated site locations. There are many contaminated sites in, in, in HRM. They are in paper, uh, they are in paper form, in electronic form. What we wanna do is build it into a system in our one call system so that when folks are looking to dig, they'll know whether they're in a contaminated site or not. Um, we'll continue to optimize parking service delivery. We wanna update our long outdated billboard agreements, which haven't been updated for over 20 years. We believe there's a revenue opportunity here. And finally, as not surprisingly, council would expect, we want to, uh, develop a service level agreement with our fleet partners in order to ensure uh, equipment availability and reliability going forward. Next slide. Diversity and inclusion, a lot of work going on here. Uh, developing the action plan to improve pedestrian accessibility through construction sites. We just received that motion from I believe, TSC. We'll be acting on that. Uh, obviously there's work already going on um, in that one of our construction supplements for this year. Uh, if you look to the picture to your far right on the slide, you'll see the problem that occurs when you put a highway sign in an urban setting. So a couple things going on there. Uh, one, we are implementing a, a minimum two meter uh, construction sign mounting height that will be effective this year. I can also advise that TASO at the TAC, at the Transportation Association of Canada, had the, uh, had the traffic control sign guidelines for the country updated to include a new urban size sign that is about one third smaller uh, that will be available probably year after next by the time province implements it so that we can put smaller signs in our urban settings to uh, uh, create better accessibility. We'll obviously be getting on with our direction to uh, developing uh, new internal policy for accessible parking spaces. And again, I, I added this measure of accessible parking tickets issued. Certainly you can see a significant increase uh, in 1920. Uh, and of course we had a, a slight decrease last year because of COVID, but the focus remains on making sure that accessible parking is available for those who need it. We'll be increasing our push button rollout, accessible push button rollout. And also, I think you're very aware, we briefed council, we're removing the need to hold the button for three seconds to activate. And now it's equality for all. It will be single push, we'll activate the APS. Moving on with the uh, social procurement policy, of course, along with all other business units. And we're very pleased to be advancing our, uh, our uh, commemoration program for Cogswell and engaging with our uh, African Nova Scotian Mi'kmaq communities in doing so. Next slide. All right, 
finally, we're at the money. So that's the plan. What does it cost? Uh, this slide is very difficult to manage. There are a lot of changes going on in our uh, unit, especially given that we cut a significant amount of money heading into COVID and then reinstated it. So I will try to get to the highlights of this slide. You will see in 2021, the March budget was 107,832,000. By June, basically cut 7.4 million to deal with COVID. And so when we look at what our expenses are, and again, I'm focusing on our expenditures right now, because again, that's where we pay the most attention to is where, where, are, where are our expenditure levels? So in terms of our proposed budget, we're proposing $108,259,000 expenditure budget, which represents about a $400,000 increase over where we were last March. Not surprisingly, with re reinstating all the services, it represents a $7.8 million increase from where we were last June. But again, that is primarily driven by some extra services that we've added to our budget, offset by some savings we made, as well as reinstating the services that council had previously. And I'll go through that in a second. In terms of revenues, wow, a lot of things happening here. There's over eight transfers between business units that have occurred in our budget. So it's very hard to uh, deal with. The most significant thing happening within our revenues right now is a significant loss of revenue on our tickets, uh, whether they be summary offense tickets or, or parking tickets. We've had a significant drop, three plus million dollars. So we're fighting uh, to, against that. That said, we've had money added to our budget in terms of transfers from finance. And again, I'll go through those in a second. The bottom line is um, our net budget is at uh, proposed budget is at 90,579,000, which is a uh, $1.7 million increase over last March. Oh, sorry, 1.7% increase over last June. So, Let's dig into it a little bit in a second. Next slide. I won't review this. If you're interested in understanding how our budget breaks out by service area, uh, by all means, we're ready to, managers are ready to address those questions. Next slide. In terms of staff plan through the operating budget, we're proposing 10.4 many of which I've already listed uh, earlier, but it breaks out to six full-time positions and, and a term position uh, to cover the areas of street sweeping, as I mentioned, illegal dumping enforcement, the mobility response tactical team, along with we're adding one uh, traffic management supervisor to deal with the significant demand uh, in from coming from council in terms of traffic uh, and road safety response. Uh, as well from the operating cost of capital, um, we have included three full-time positions and one term position, and that is to really start our journey on the road transfer to get those folks in place to be ready to go for June 2022 and to support capital project delivery. So that's the personnel side of it. Now into the summary of changes. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm going to sum up. <laughs> Basically, we've got a million dollars from reinstating all of the hiring freeze vacant positions and seasonals. That's uh, an increase to our budget, along with obviously pay increases, uh, sizable compensation changes that occur uh, through our uh, collective agreements with QP. There's three years there, three years of uh, budget adjustment for QP. Uh, our new positions come in at about $453,000. And uh, that's the highlights on the compensation side. On the revenue adjustments, I won't go through all of these. Key ones to focus on really are the uh, increase in diversion credits that we're counting on. So that's an increase to our, our, um, our budget. Uh, the other big one here is our parking ticket revenue. Again, we continue to see this decline. We're not anticipating a big recovery this year. Therefore, we expect a further loss of $1.6 million from last June, um, from last June's budget on the ticket revenue. And I'll leave that as the big revenue adjustments. In terms of our other budget adjustments, 
basically what you see here, everything that has the word reinstate in front of it is basically bringing back what we had before. So you're seeing tree planting and pruning in there. You're seeing the weekly organics collection, right? Again, we are previous service level approved by council was weekly summer green cart. Our assumption is that is expected. So it's been restated, uh, reinstated. Um, we've reinstated our household hazardous waste service, um, our education and uh, advertising promotion budget for solid waste, our traffic control uh, budgets, so on and on. So I'm not gonna go into it, but essentially we've brought back the service levels pre-COVID. Moving to the next slide. There's further budget, budget adjustments. Again, uh, all the impacts from our solid waste contracts net uh, amounts to an additional $1.1 million pressure on our budget. And of course, as long with the winter works uh, contracts, another half million dollar pressure. I won't go, well, there's, there's much more here to talk about, but um, there's new services. The one I will highlight, I guess, for the benefit of Councillor Outhit, we've added another 50,000 to, uh, to stump grinding, um, to our budget for stump grinding. Basically, this over the next couple of years would get us, combined with our investment from capital, would get us caught up on stumps uh, throughout the municipality. Uh, of course, depending on how many more are created. So I'll, I'll go with that. And then finally, we conclude with all of the transfers in and out. The biggest transfers that occur are um, the, the decision uh, from the parking strategy, which is to centralize all parking costs and revenues uh, in one business unit that has been determined to be TPW. Therefore, you're seeing the parking pay station revenue transferred in from fiscal at 2.25 million. Um, you're seeing the Bell and Sackville lots, uh, revenues and costs coming in uh, to us. You're seeing Metro Park being transferred to us. And so those are the big changes uh, there. So that gives you an overall feel for what changed in our numbers. Next slide. Options over budget. So there's many things we could put on the slide. However, what we've done is we've isolated this analysis down to those things which have had council direction. So uh, from your information report that reached council yesterday um, regarding the desire to move from 36 hours to 18 hours for residential sidewalk snow clearing standards throughout the municipality, it's an estimated 3.5 to $4.5 million increase in budget required there. Previously, when we brought the snow standards report to council, uh, council indicated a desire to move from 48 to 24 hour standard on uh, transit, stop, transit stop snow clearing. That's an estimated $2 million uh, increase. Traffic calming on residential streets. Uh, you received the briefing note last night. Uh, that would result roughly in uh, um, 16 school zones, an additional 16 school zones being picked up, 26 more streets that are in from the ranking process and another six streets where we are concerned about uh, neighborhood impacts from projects that have been implemented. And this is where you're seeing we implement on one street and moves to another. So we've got a package proposed there that would see roughly another 53 streets traffic calm with the extra million dollars. Um, and that's there for your, that there's, that information is there for your consideration. Non-accepted streets, I continue to bring this up. This was cut for COVID from the capital budget. Uh, we could not make it fit again this year. This does have direction from council to, to proceed with it. Uh, we're having trouble prioritizing it over other urgent uh, needs. And then finally, we had a lot of feedback uh, about household special waste over the past few years. And so, We've put in an item just to indicate it's about $19,000 for each event. And so we put in the price of what it would be to increase by six, uh, six um, events per year. So that's our options over budget. Next slide. Options under budget. I'm not sure you've seen any yet this uh, so far this year in the presentations, but in, in terms of under budget, uh, essentially what we did and, and when we came forward the collection contracts, we, we made you aware of this work. Um, certainly, uh, there are opportunities to reduce costs. Um, some of the things that we do a little different than other municipalities, uh, such as bulky item collection and CFC removal, uh, those are programs that are 
fairly unique to HRM. And, uh, you know, obviously there is an opportunity to, if council wanted to, to cut that service. In terms of weekly organics collection, of course, if council wanted to continue uh, with bi-weekly organics throughout the summer, that would save another $850,000 annually. However, that decision has to be made by May 1st, one way or the other. Um, we have to make that decision. And bi-weekly recycling, this came up as well as we were getting prepared for COVID cuts. Um, so we built this into the collection contracts that if we could off-ramp um, uh, weekly collection of blue bags and make it bi-weekly throughout the entire municipality. And that would save roughly $850,000 annually. So those are some options under budget. Finally, pressures and risk. Well, there's numerous. I've just highlighted some of the key ones. Uh, the provincial road transfer next year is going to represent about $5 million uh, increase to the operating budget. Um, on the good side, um, if our some of our revenues recover i.e our ticket revenues good piece of this could be offset going forward uh, we remain hopeful of a recovery of our revenues on tickets not that tickets are where you want to ultimately get your revenue from but it will make a difference uh, road and sidewalk state of good repair remain a huge pressure uh, new sidewalk requests of course it's backlog of 600 huge pressure um, again we'll work with council over the course of this year to determine uh, what some of those numbers should truly look like. In terms of risks, we continue to work under the, the risk of the Otter Lake contract with Mirror and that they could early terminate uh, if, if we don't see the operation of the front end processor and uh, waste, stabilizing, waste stabilization facility. We will have a report to you next month on this issue, but that is, remains a $2 million risk that uh, could be implemented upon the municipality at any time. Um, in terms of uh, increased processing fees and parking revenues, we've highlighted these only in that our assumption on Otter Lake is that people will not house clean like they did last year and will return to more normal levels. And therefore we are expecting that we won't have the extra costs because uh, of course we pay to dispose at Otter Lake. Uh, and so we are expecting things to return to a more normal standard, but there is a risk they won't. And of course, parking revenue, we've had a, a dickens of a time trying to, to nail that number. So there's obviously risk there. Thank you for the opportunity. Sorry for the length of this presentation. Hopefully you found it helpful in your decisions and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh for that very comprehensive presentation. Um, Councillor Outfit, uh, you were the first one to indicate that you would like to speak, so go ahead. And would you mind putting the motion on the floor, please? Thank you, Chair. And uh, my camera's not coming up, but it'll be up shortly. So thank you, Chair. And I'll start by putting the motion on the floor. It's moved that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the uh, Transportation and Public Works um, I just lost it. Uh, proposed 2021-22 budget and business plan is set out as discussed in the March 9th, 2021 staff report and supporting presentation by staff into the draft 2021 operating budget. So move. Thank you. Can I have a seconder, please? Seconder, Lovelace. Councillor Lovelace, uh, go ahead, Councillor Rothen. All right. Thank you uh, for the presentation, uh, Brad. And as I always start uh, every year, I want to pay tremendous tribute to the folks in traffic, in uh, construction and design, rock, winter work, solid waste, et cetera, who I know we probably bother on a daily, if not weekly basis on so many issues. And the response and the cooperation that we get is absolutely outstanding. And I've gotten to know a number of these people over the years and boy, they care about their work and they don't work nine to five. I hear back from them evenings, weekends, holidays, everything else when we have issues. And it's, it's absolutely uh, tremendous. The people that, you know, the public will never know, but how much they do for them. So I want to start off that way as I always do. Another good thing I want to say, Brad, is last year I noticed particularly in my district, but in other, a lot of other areas that it seemed that with the in-house line painting and also with the outsourced crosswalk stop by turning uh, arrow paint, uh, paint, painting that it seemed that we got them done a lot sooner so whether something must have changed there it did seem that they were they were done sooner they may need to be done again but they were done sooner um 
I have uh, a bunch of concerns here uh, as well, but uh, they're not criticisms. They are concerns and questions. So I'm going to hit you with these questions, Brad, and then you get back to me and maybe I won't have to come back again. Uh, trees, when I'm going down the road, and I should know this by now, when I'm going down the road and I see, see more and more in trees tangled up in uh, wires, is that do the utilities help us with that cutting or do we have to take all that on? When I'm out walking the dog and I see so many trees, including my own now, uh, tangled up in the wires. Uh, another comment I had for you to respond to, and I've talked to Tasso about this at length, and I'll tell you the one thing, uh, one thing you can say about Tasso and his team is they do try and explain things well to us. May not always agree, may not always understand it, but boy, they, they try to explain things to us and it's appreciated. And I understand it's more complex than it appears, but I'm not happy with only six more 40 kilometer zones being brought forward uh, in this year. I know it's unnecessary hardship and I wish the province would let us do it uh, as a default speed limit. You're very familiar with that, uh, that all residential side streets would default to 40. But uh, in the meantime, we have to do this uh, very labor intensive and costly approach, but I'd like to see us do more than six. I also want to know what the plan is for school zones on hills, because we know traditional speed bumps don't work and I'm not comfortable and I don't think HRM should be comfortable saying, well, if your school is on a flat, uh, street that we're going to get uh, speed bump sooner and thus be safer. If you're on a hill, sorry, we haven't come up with a cost-effective, easy way to deal with that. So I have a real problem with that. Um, crosswalk colors, the poles, how are we doing with getting the color reflective, uh, lime green reflective colors on the poles? I know we're not allowed to change the signs yet. I uh, hope we'll continue to do that. I'd like to know how we're making out on the, uh, the markings for the poles. And knowing you a little bit by now, Brad, I'm just wondering, uh, a couple of things jumped out at me during this uh, presentation that probably wouldn't bother a lot of business people, a lot of residents, and probably you. The fact that it costs $800 to plant a tree, what are we going to do? Get that price down. It's ridiculous. And secondly, $19,000 to run a uh, solid, uh, take a solid waste uh, on the road. Uh, that also sounds ridiculous to me. What are we going to do to try and get that? Uh, that price down. So there are some questions for you. Overall, many, many thanks for all you and your team do. And uh, But I do have some concerns here that I'd like addressed by you or your team. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, just trying to make sure I understand the last question was solid. Oh, yeah, okay. Got it. Okay, from the top. Uh, the trees and wires. Well, I think the first thing that uh, we didn't have room in our presentation to talk about is uh, a piece that we're working with Nova Scotia. I am working with Nova Scotia Power at, uh, uh, at Jock's direction to sort this out. Um, trees and wires is a big deal. So there's come, we're coming at this in a few directions. So first of all, when it's entangled, well, there, there is no clear uh, direction or agreement between the two parties now. Most of the time we end up handling it. Uh, so uh, it really, it's on a case by case basis. Uh, in terms of going forward, we are working on a vegetation management agreement with Nova Scotia Power that will make it clear about whose responsibility it is, uh, where there may be compensation required uh, so that we are uh, making sure there's proper tree maintenance in and around lines and the overall health of the trees. Um, there are numerous approaches to this, but uh, we're, we're, I'm actually encouraged. We're a long way there. We just got to sort out the money. This, this does require in, improved administration and it is on the books to get done. In terms of uh, 40 kilometer hour zones, look, I, I share the frustration. This comes down to doing six neighborhoods this year. Uh, that's the, based on everything else that we've taken on, that's where the balance becomes. We're, we're, you know, we're limited to the resources that I've got in my budget. Obviously, if council wants to go further on this, we could take it away and look at how we, we do this more. Um, but our track record, we'll do more if we can. But as you know, six neighborhoods is hundreds of signs. Um, and so, it's, it's, it's very difficult and there's no guarantee we'll get provincial approval. So uh, it is a laborious process as you suggested. We have indicated repeatedly to the province, we want the default uh, speed limit. That is not likely to occur. However, we have heard encouraging news that they may be willing to move more like Ontario and potentially give the municipality the right 
to uh, to sign the neighborhoods ourselves. In other words, we have, wouldn't have to go through this process where we apply. And so that would save us a lot of time, allow us to have the certainty of, you know, or control over our destiny and plan our budgets accordingly. So that's that, that would be a game changer for us, even if they did that, that would help a bunch. School zones on hills. So I hear you. Um, there's no there's no silver bullet here. Our staff is uh, in, in doing the work on the school zones, most recently for the briefing out. We're trying to, uh, we're reviewing our position on vertical deflection on a hill. Um, we have gone back to a couple of zones, relooked at the grades, and we're going to, uh, we are going to implement in a few areas. I, I can't speak to yours specifically at this very moment, um, but I will say there are certain grades at which you cannot work a vertical deflection and where you have to go to horizontal. And if you saw from the briefing that we gave you last night, you can see the challenge. Horizontal deflections are basically a major rehabilitation of a street. They, they require yep. a lot of ripping and tearing and they're very expensive. And so <clears throat> what you're seeing as council says, you know, let's move and let's move fast. You're seeing us at short notice, always reverting to vertical deflections. What that means is that high priority streets requiring horizontal deflections are getting passed over on a regular and consistent basis. So this is one piece that we hope to fix in the AO, the administrative order work that we'll start with TSE tomorrow, and get clarity on exactly how council wants us to move through the traffic calming priorities, um, because there is a fundamental and huge cost, cost difference between horizontal designs and vertical designs. And I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's, that's the truth of it. Uh, lime green poles, boy, they should be at 100%. If they're not, please report them to 311. We, we have fully implemented, I, but I have noticed myself, I don't know whether citizens are just having fun trying to rip them off, but I noticed a couple of poles uh, will probably be topping up in the spring. 800 bucks a tree, look, uh, uh, the demand for trees, I don't know, demand for nature, I, I, I don't follow it like uh, gas prices, obviously, uh, but staff's telling me tree stock is is a uh, is a big deal. That's the primary driver is the tree stock. Everybody's trying to grab trees and put them in the ground, and so that is the price, the estimated price right now. And I will say, estimated, we have we have found out before and been pleasantly surprised that we may end up with a better tender price overall. But essentially. And, and the folks we deal with, we outsource all this work that is not done with in-house staff. So this is, uh, you know, we are getting the best price we feel that we can, but it is estimated to be about $800 this year. And in terms of $19,000 per, per uh, mobile event, look, it costs a lot of money to handle uh, hazardous waste, but even more so when you kind of take it away from the key depot and all the infrastructure they have to deal with it. So uh, $19,000 per event has, has been our average cost. And so that's how we, we priced it here. Um, and again, this is through contra standing contracts. So the price, that is the price. Um, so hopefully I've addressed all your questions. You have, and thank you. There's a little bit of sticker shock on those two things. And I hope you'll keep working on them, but I, but I do understand that it's complex. Yeah, thank you very much to you and the team. And thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, first off, I want to start by uh, using what we should now call the, the, the Kent Gambit and ask to be put on for a second and third uh, round as well right now, because I know I'm coming back because I've got four pages of notes. Uh, my, uh, I, I want to say, Brad, and to your whole team, uh, thank you for everything that you have all done this last year. I, I, a lot, you know, parks, everybody's faced a lot with COVID, but parks and TVW have been the front line for HRM core staff. And, uh, you know, uh, from when I think about the last 18 months from, uh, you know, uh, e emailing and calling Bevan 301 as a citizen notices a sinkhole happening on Barrington Street, which was was more than a year ago, but only about 14 months ago, and everybody being out there and dealing with that uh, very quickly to, you know, relatively small things. Staff have been excellent this last year, and, and I, I really uh, enjoy my colleagues, uh, how hard they work for our citizens. Uh, you know, 
going through this presentation the last two days, reading it over and over again, and then, you know, the, the report and then hearing what you had to say, what really strikes me is there's, for me, there are three big buckets of concerns that I have or areas that I want to explore. And that's why I've asked to come back and speak two more times, because I know I'm not going to get it done in five minutes. Uh, the, there's a, the funding gap issue is one huge issue that we need to talk about on core paving and and how we are going to address that because we have to address that and that will be another budget pressure and that is going to drive in my opinion uh this is not something we're going to do on debt it's going to be it's a core structural financial problem we need to spend more on paving we need to close that 25 million dollar gap and uh and that's going to uh, impact taxes the second area is vision zero and pedestrian safety and i'll come back to that and then my third big issue which is kind of talked around in here but that i would like to dig into and, and i'll come back for this i'm probably going to talk about this in in a second will be uh capacity for larger projects and capacity of staff to deliver on you know as this federal money is coming and things like the bike and thing uh, the the minimum grid on the peninsula uh regional center things like wizard street exchange you know my, my deep and abiding concerns uh, there. But before I even get into those, I just, there's a couple of things in the presentation and in the report that I wanted to identify very quickly. Uh, photo enforcement, photo, photo radar enforcement. Uh, I, I know the TSA uh, rules aren't done yet, but um, I think a robust discussion between TBW and the CAO and council needs to happen as we approach that point, because as soon as those regulations are in place, I expect we haven't tested council yet, but we're going to vote to spend money on that and start moving on that right away. Uh, as unpopular as that will be with some people and even some councillors, uh, I, I think that's where we're going to go. And, and I want to expedite that. I want to note how happy I am that the Macintosh Depot is being built, despite the, the cost. Like this is... Uh, you know, and Brad's heard me say this before, I had a tour of the relatively new depot in uh, the municipality of Saint Laurent, Montreal with their mayor, and it was uh, beautiful and awesome. And I was thinking about uh, the conditions our employees, our workers work in, and it's not fair to do that to any of our colleagues. And, and it's easy for a depot uh, or an office it, that, that folks never see, the public never sees to be a bottom priority. And I think it, uh, this is the kind of values that we need to have. So uh, we will get better work and, and they deserve it. Uh, as an aside, billboards, yes. And I'm not convinced council would approve all of them staying. So like build that into your work plan because a lot of them are just visual garbage and should be removed. And, and most billboards along roads are on our property folks. So let's have a discussion about that. Uh, vegetation management, excellent. Uh, uh, the more we do, I got to say, so they're getting ready to replace the power in uh, my district or in, in my immediate neighborhood, upgrade the, the Nova Scotia power. So they've been in with Asplund and they've done a tremendous amount of clearing, getting ready for the higher voltage wires. And they haven't replaced the old, the 70 year old system yet, but our power stays on now because of the vegetation management. So uh, I think that's great. Um, so uh, that's it for a kind of like low hanging fruit. I, I want to talk about capacity. I only have 38 seconds left. I've set a timer, Mr. Chair, on your behalf. Uh, and so I'll do that one first because I think it's really quickly. I don't, I would like a business uh, a briefing note about uh, what's going to happen in the next three years to make sure that we get the regional center bike lanes done. Cause I, I, I just don't, I don't see it happening fast enough. We're at 33%. We're three years in, uh, we're not building enough to get it done in the five years that we promised the feds, but more importantly, the council has said over and over again to the public, it's going to happen. And then on capacity, three seconds. I'll come back to finish that thought. That would be my one one ask this round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's the sound of me stopping. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mason. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Anguish. So uh, I just want to quickly top off one answer. Sorry, part of the, uh, I missed out on part of the answer why the trees are more expensive. One thing we are doing differently and in response to concerns over council is we are enhancing the bracing requirements for the trees. As you know, uh, many councillors have brought up the fact that the nursery stock, there's a stock goes in the ground and, and, and we lose it. And so we are increasing the bracing, uh, which, which increases the probability of survival that is that is contributing to cost per tree. Uh, I think uh, I look forward to hearing on the three buckets, but I think where we landed was major project uh, major project work. So absolutely, that's uh, um, 
glad you're seeing that trend and uh, I'm whether we're ahead of it, we're certainly on top of it. And so, yes, projects are growing in significant size. We used to be a, a size of project over $2 million was a rare occurrence. Um, other than, for instance, Harbor Solutions, 400 million. That was really the last major project that we did in the street. So we've, we've really become an organization built on $2 million projects. Knowing what the landscape looks like going forward and experiencing the AAA bike network and other projects in flight, um, we've engaged uh, a firm. We are in the throes actually next week. I believe we get our first results back on project management. So based on some of the AG reports that we've got back, we've asked for outside advice to really understand how we need to set up to manage large projects going forward because they will be a steady diet from here on in. We will move from really a, a sub $2 million project uh, game plan to a regular diet of 20 million and above. That requires a different operating uh, posture, a different management approach. And so we are engaged on that and taking it very seriously. So um, if, if you need a briefing note right now, um, sure, I'll be in better position to respond to that in a few few months from now. And I would suggest it's not, it's not a, it is not a crisis uh, or something that, you know, I would have brought it forward if it needed to be urgently addressed right here, right now. The AAA bike network, I think that bears, look, that, that, that criticism is fair. Um, that is not where council wanted to be. Um, I think we're learning a lot through the bike network. Um, one, uh, consultation is turning out, I think as most councilors are fully aware, um, very difficult. Um, in some cases impeded by legal action. Um, another factor is just trying to thread these into pre-existing streets that don't contemplate having this kind of uh, right amount of the right of way dedicated, and, and again, drainage plays a role, uh, dedicated to active trans, you know, the balancing act between active transportation, a tree canopy, and, and all the other pieces we want to put in the right of way. So that that's, without a doubt, is a bigger challenge than first anticipated. Finally, um, you know, the mixed blessing, we are developing at such an incredible rate. What we're finding in many places we want to construct, we're having to work hand in hand with developers. Now that's, that's great because, uh, you know, we're, we're sharing and, and they're quite frankly, in some cases, bearing part of the cost on the, uh, on the downside, we're losing control of our schedule because it makes no sense to rip the street up twice where we've got development on the street. So these are factors that are affecting us. Uh, you know, would a full blown project management approach change this uh, current trajectory? I would say that the jury's out, um, but I can assure you we're taking steps to finish and um, we expect currently projecting to be done by 2025. And uh, we, have, uh, we have not jeopardized our funding. So I think that's the key thing I wanna drive home is that the funding is not in jeopardy. We've been keeping everybody informed of our progress. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cuddle. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Brad, for that uh, that presentation. I mean, it is a lot of information and a lot of detail, but uh, you know, this is such an important topic, um, and I just want to note that uh, the effort that has been made by by you and your department to address council's direction in terms of making traffic and pedestrian safety or, or stroller safety more of a priority. Um, and I also want to thank the speakers at the at the top of our meeting here who spoke about, you know, the importance of, you know, designing for people and human beings and not cars. Um, you know, I think Mrs. Mr. Larsh's comments on crosswalk safety were, were very well put and that many of us on council feel very much the same about that. Um, you know, on that note, I'm happy that in the budget we have flashing beacons going in at this 
crosswalk here at Woodcrest and Herring Cove Road where there was a terrible accident um, back in December. Um, and, you know, we, it really highlights the need for us to be more proactive than, than reactive um, when it comes to dealing with pedestrian safety. So, you know, with that, I do support the increase to help advance, um, advance this work more quickly. It, it is really important. And um, I look forward to seeing more about what that strategy will be. Um, you know, just uh, to Mr. Ohit comment about $800 a tree just so you know if it's an urban tree um on an in a in a paved area it's 25 to $30,000 per tree so um yeah because they put it they put in the civil cells underneath the ground very very expensive for urban trees um $800 trees go on like little verge medians where you can dig up the grass so uh yeah trees and trees in urban areas are really important because that's where our heat sinks are so I don't know what we can do about the cost of those trees in urban areas and I know that you know we need the trees to thrive and be successful but um you know where it's most expensive is often where we most we most need them um to mitigate that kind of urban heat sink environment I I want to one of the things I really want to note here um and I'm I'm so glad you brought it up uh, is the 4,700 lane kilometers that in, in HRM that are managed by the province. I think this is really important to understand and that we need to make um, some progress in working better with the province on managing and working together and aligning strategies. Um, you know, right now there's like two different standards that exist in this, in, in our municipality. And that, you know, creates a, a lot, an inconsistency in, in service delivery and opportunity and well, as well as confusion with, with residents. Um, you know, it's also important, that relation is also important for advancing, you know, the creation of those 40 kilometer zones or, or the permission for us to set our own speed limits. But um, I'm just wondering on the 310 kilometers that are anticipated to be transferred this year, I'm just wondering, do we know where they are? And, you know, with those road transfers, do we know what the projected increase in, ex I think you'd mentioned the projected increase for, for, the, for, the, for the 310, but moving forward, is that like above and beyond the $25 million gap or is that being calculated together and as more provincial roads get transferred to HRM, like I'm just, you know, wondering what we're getting ourselves into and to that gap just getting wider and not narrower and how we're going to handle it. Um, a couple of other things, the traffic safety measures, you mentioned the RA8 uh, for in-street school crosswalk signs and there's zero proposed and you said it didn't work. I'm not familiar with that and I'm just wondering what those are. Um, I'm also wondering with the school pickup drop-off zones, um, you know, just to get back to District 11, is there one for Central Spryfield in that list or where might I find that information? And um, the rural, I know I'm, I'm going to have to come back, <laughs> um, but uh, the rural pedestrian program, um, I'm wondering where that comes out in the budget and, and what's being planned for that this year more specifically. Thank you. And I'm, you can add me to the list again there, Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Uh, thanks, Councillor, for your questions. Uh, regarding provincial coordination, uh, look, uh, I think the reality is hit that we can't continue to be in our silos uh, like it's historically been. To that end, I can tell you that both planning and development and my team are part, have started and are participating now regularly on a strategic joint planning committee between us and the province. That is happening at two levels, is happening at an executive level and at a staff level. Um, can't say we always agree, we can always align, but we're getting started. That's that's a good news story. And it really matters. You know, I'll use the example in Councillor Austin's district where we desperately need a fix for Woodland Lancaster. It is their road. We need we need a we need a roundabout there to improve the safety and, and flow. And you know, this is this is something that's been talked about and talked about and talked about. It's it, you know, it's time to to get down to business. What I will say is where we have had success, and again, you know, council can assist hugely in these in these efforts. Where we have had big success, for example, like the Mineville, um, the Mineville uh, shoulder extensions that were put in this year through the provincial paving project, 
you know, there's an example where the, the uh, counselor and the MLA get on the same page and apply the pressure. Um, and, and that, you know, it doesn't always work politically, but it helps. Um, certainly uh, that, that was fixed in a hurry. And furthermore, there was pressure applied to get, uh, to help get things moving in East Preston as well. So I use that as an example of, of that's helpful to us when, when the MLA and counselors can align on priorities. In terms of uh, your comment or question around what the 25 million gap is, that is on the existing road uh, inventory here in HRM. That does not consider, if you will, the, the transfer. The transfer will be net new capacity to us uh, at an estimated cost of $5 million total. Um, we'll be bringing a report back in May. We do know exactly what roads they are, and certainly the counselors that are impacted are aware of those. Um, and so it basically, it's there's two areas, uh, primarily in Councillor Lovelace area and primarily in Councillor Hensby's area. And so uh, there will be a number of changes there, but you know the big drivers of the cost there are, you know, obviously the condition of the assets we're getting, um, the types of assets we're getting, as well as vegetation management is a big deal in those areas. And of course, uh, without question, uh, winter operations is a cost driver and so is uh, drainage. And so drainage, uh, Halifax Water will be our, uh, will be their recommended service provider for that drainage. And so that $5 million cost I gave you was kind of uh, all in. Um, but again, more to follow on that. So again, $25 million is the existing gap on the existing maintenance uh, required to our street network or to maintain pavement condition. The $5 million associated with the road transfer will, the large part of that cost will arrive next year when we inherit the asset and ramp up to deal with that. Um, I'll jump to the rural pedestrian uh, piece uh, that is coming to council, um, like I say, uh, hopefully uh, early summer. What that program involves, currently a uh, council's policy is not to fund uh, from our capital budget based on current taxation. We don't, uh, basically rural AT has to pay for itself. Um, case in point, she Harbor sidewalk. Um, they had an area rate to, to pay for that. Um, and so therefore, uh, I don't wanna speak for council, but essentially IMP action number 82 was to address this. Um, and so the report we're bringing back to council, we'll look at the funding uh, required for that um, with along with some priorities uh, to focus on, um, but that will be net new funding that is not in any budget right now. Finally, I think it was school drop off and I apologize. I'm just gonna look to my left to see if I can get guidance. Oh, sorry, what's an RA8? I don't know if I'll pop up and give you a photo, but it's essentially a sign that's built right into the street uh, that's there permanently. Um, suffice to say four of them were, uh, were snapped off. Obviously they're not very, they're, they're, they're designed to, to break because you don't want to put a hazard deliberately in the street. But the idea is it slows folks down. Um, essentially four were gone very quickly. I'm not even sure as I sit here today whether the fifth is still in existence, but it, it didn't work. Um, and so we tried. Um, we don't think that's the best solution here. Obviously, from school zone, traffic calming, um, given council's uh, appetite to move on with this and the $1 million extra that you requested, there are a significant number of school zones that would be planned to be dealt with with the uh, vertical deflections. So that's, uh, that's the focus going forward in the school zones, along with the work that we're doing uh, with our parking management, traffic management teams to just try and sort out, as you know, with COVID, schools changed the way they dealt with their parking lots and turnarounds and, and it, it, it became difficult. Uh, from my own experience, I'll call it hell. Um, I did not like being in the zones of the schools. Uh, so we learned from that. We're working with council. Uh, certainly, if you are experiencing problems with your school zone and uh, in terms of drop off, pick up and just overall vehicle management, please let us know. Um, but yeah, Victoria has stepped forward with her team to uh, help manage these hotspots from a parking perspective. And of course, she's working in close proximity as she always does with our traffic management team to make sure the signing uh, the signage is appropriate. And we have had to adjust significantly throughout this year to the changes from the school board. 
Um, the school board does sit on the road safety committee uh, with us. And so this has been brought up as a key issue that we have to have more advanced notice when changes are gonna be made. Hopefully I've addressed all your questions. Thank you. Yeah, for now, thank you, that was great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you to uh, Brad and the team for that uh, incredible uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you know, you do have an amazing team there. I've, uh, I've often said that uh, your, uh, your main gal, Bev, is one of my favorite people on the planet. So uh, thank you so much for everything that you guys do. Uh, I'm just uh, following up and I was very pleased to hear that there's increased communication between your shop and the school board because that is where a lot of the frustrations that I've had have, uh, have you know, that's where it's all started. Um, there seems to be a lot of decisions made at the school board level that impact what you guys do. And, you know, everything from the bus eligibility requirements is as soon as those are changed, you know that the phone calls come to us saying we need a sidewalk in front of XYZ school. Um, and as you pointed out, a lot of uh, schools actually implemented, uh, you know, parents weren't allowed to drive on school property this year. So that created a whole host of problems for the streets surrounding many of our schools. So. Glad to hear that uh, you guys are working on the increased communication with the school board, so that we're uh, you know we're we're reacting as opposed to uh, or we're we're proactive as opposed to reactive and always playing catch up with the uh, with the province. Um, I guess the, since that uh, that part of my question was taken care of, the only other one that I had was about uh, the uh, the traffic counts, and you you mentioned that. Uh, uh, you guys are back doing tra traffic counts that uh, you're at pre-COVID levels. And I'm just wondering, the, the data that is collected, I mean, how is that going to be parsed? Because let's face it, we're, we're still not at pre-COVID levels for, uh, for traffic. And where we have, you know, so many projects that, uh, that rely on those traffic counts for implementation, crosswalks, that sort of thing. Um, you know, how, how are we going to manage that data going forward? Is it just going to be with an asterisk and, uh, you know, we, we just kind of uh, extrapolate where the, uh, the counts could be pre-COVID? I'm just wondering how that data is going to be managed. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Ranguish. Yes, uh, thanks, Councillor. So, yeah, traffic counts. So, a couple, a couple things uh, in in there. I guess the first thing is uh, the reference in my presentation uh, that we use to measure kind of uh, overall traffic, uh, um, uh, yeah, counts is basically volume across the bridges. I, I will tell you that the February results are in, which, if you recall, February um, was pre-COVID last year uh, compared to February this year. What's interesting is traffic is up 3% overall at the bridges. We are almost at full recovery at the PM peak. And I think many people are experiencing that. Um, and I'm seeing that based on my own observations, just seeing the, the long lineups backed up almost to the circumferential for Coal Harbor. Um, so PM peaks almost fully recovered and the AM peak is the one that's still showing uh, not full recovery. Um, no doubt related to flex hours. Obviously, one of the concerns we have is, and again, this is not to throw darts, but uh, transit, you know, the transit recovery is critical. Um, getting folks back on transit, with transit being at 50%, and with the growth of municipality, you know, we are seeing more, more vehicles on the road. There's no two doubts about it. So um, in terms, so we, we are getting very close to being full, full recovery from a traffic point of view. In terms of counting, we have changed the way we're going to do it, um, given the importance and, and the demands from council. We used to do this through a student approach. Um, we have changed, we are moving, and we've taken the money and converted it to full-time equivalents and putting in a permanent office to work year round on uh, getting our projects uh, uh, measured and ready to go. So we're moving to a different uh, a process, um, obviously, Never like to see the loss of the student student uh, student jobs. We'll try to make it up elsewhere in our system, but certainly we now see the need to be in this game all year round. There's activity for us, and so in order to get our, our projects ready to get out the door. So, 
hope that helps. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. And you're muted. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. A little finicky today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, big shout out uh, to TPW. Uh, Brad, you and your team have done a fantastic job. I, I really appreciate it. You've been very responsive to my gazillion questions and requests over the last couple of months. Um, really appreciate, uh, you know, the very fast action in addressing school zone, need, school zone needs at Madeline Simons Middle School, uh, you know, in uh, addressing some of these historic issues uh, that we've had in District 13. Um, really pleased to know that, yes, 310 kilometers is coming over. I recognize that, you know, it's going to be a huge cost, but as uh, Councillor, uh, and also unknown cost as of yet, but as Councillor Cuddle suggested, you know, being able to have uh, one service standard for road uh, maintenance and winter operations uh, will really help our residents moving forward. I am looking forward to that May report uh, to learn specifically which roads and which uh, neighborhoods will be moving over to HRM so we can ensure that we have a strong communications effort, uh, you know, uh, along with Halifax Water, of course, with stormwater management, um, but also being able to, uh, you know, look forward to what that audit or what that analysis looks like. So with those three uh, new uh, staff positions, you know, I'm just wondering specifically, what are they going to be doing? Uh, do we get a report back from the province from their assessment on their roads? Do we then analyze, uh, you know, what they've provided with us, um, you know, provided to us? Uh, just trying to get a sense of, of what those staff members will do with that road transfer. Um, on slide 19 and uh, yeah, slide 19 in regards to street and road maintenance and potholes, uh, you know, I just want to reiterate that for the public, there is confusion. What is an HRM road? What is a provincial road? So when I look at key performance indicators with regards to potholes, I know we all get calls on potholes. Uh, but I don't, I, you know, my assumption is that this is just on HRM roads. And so I think in, in having communications such as this very important uh, slide deck to ensure that it's clear that these are HRM potholes only, um, and they do not reflect uh, the provincial roads within HRM. Um, I agree with uh, what Councillor Mason uh, said about fo photo enforcement. Let's do it, do it, do it, do it. We've got to get this done. Um, it will uh, take a lot of education, obviously, and uh, certainly will be a quite a, you know, transition phase uh, to help, uh, you know, folks understand what fo photo enforcement is and how it's going to be integrated uh, within uh, the larger in enforcement uh, with HRP, with RCMP. Um, and uh, certainly we, we just need to make sure that the education program there is solid uh, and that it's delivered uh, effectively. Um, recycles, uh, recyclables. So currently we have a little disjointed program. We've got a two week uh, recyclable pickup in some zones and we've got one week pickup in another zone. So it sounds to me like we're going towards just the two week uh, pickup across HRM. I just wanna clarify that. Street sweeps, just wondering, again, I'm assuming those are only on HRM roads and wondering, you know, is that just in the urban, urban suburban, uh, where exactly are the street sweeps taking place? Street lights, Brad, I, I, I'm really concerned about the number of street lights in our rural areas uh, where we, I don't think effectively need them. Uh, there's over illumination and loss of gorgeous night sky. And I'm thinking about, you know, the light pollution that's happening uh, needlessly. So I'm wondering, is there a policy or is there a way that uh, we can review whether or not those street lights are actually needed? Are we putting them up uh, because we have, uh, you know, a system in place that says, Here's the distance um, that we that we need from light to light, uh, or are we thinking about over illumination from a light pollution perspective? The rural pedestrian program, um, you know, I think the connectivity there is extremely important, and I, I'm I'm questioning whether or not we've actually had conversations with the province around the Public Highways Act and amending that. Um, certainly the, the TSA, we don't have those regulations yet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, 30 seconds. Um, but the Public Highways 
Act clearly uh, puts our rural communities at a disadvantage. Um, and I'll stop there and look forward to coming back a second time. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Councillor. Thanks for all your questions. I think I'm learning today. I'm getting old for this job. I feels like I used to be able to take a battery of questions and do much better, but I'm hanging in there. All right, not complaining. These are great questions. Okay, so uh, the road, uh, sorry, 311 um, in terms of reporting potholes. So you are correct. The only thing we're showing in our KPI is our streets. However, however, know that if someone reports a pothole 2311, which I would encourage them to do, and it's on a provincial road that will get forwarded to the best of our ability to the provincial uh, teams to handle. So if you are reporting now, don't, don't stop and don't question, right? Because it's road safety, we take it very seriously and it's in our region. So we do our best to make sure they get to the people that need to fix it. In terms of, you asked about the uh, preparation for the road transfer. Um, I may have, you know, again, I had to move fast through the presentation. It took a long time even at that. Certainly the three staff that we're bringing on board now of, of several more to come to deliver the service for those 310 kilometers. But essentially later this year, the first staff we need to load in is our urban forest supervisor. We need an additional service uh, urban forest supervisor to be able to to handle the significant load that will come with those streets on vegetation management. Okay, so that's one staff member we're getting on board later this year. And again, these are all from operating cost of capital because, of course, we're getting a new capital, albeit donated to us, so to speak. Um, we need to get uh, uh, training. We're going to have an enhanced uh, need to train a lot of people quickly. So we're getting a training administrator to to join our team uh, to make sure because it's our our training. First of all. We need to improve our training in any event, but this is going to kind of as a tipping point for us. We need to make sure uh, this is a big deal, making sure that everybody's license is up to speed, everybody's qualifications are set, everybody's loaded on training at the proper, uh, proper time, everybody's on ramps properly. So it's a big deal for us. It's a significant issue. So that that's one of the staff. And the final staff is another is a contract supervisor. Uh, bringing them on um, uh, early on with traffic management because again we're going to get a whole new load on traffic management with these roads as far as the condition goes huh, we're working now we're in negotiations as requested by council this is a, a very old this was the first admin uh, sorry first agreement after amalgamation that requires these road transfers it is in dire need of updating and council has given us that direction so we're sitting down with the province and talking to them about the way this thing moves forward because there are more transfers to come um, based on, and the way it works, it's on density. As the city hits certain densities, then the roads transfer over. And so there, the councillors that would have had the first briefing uh, would have saw there were four areas proposed. <laughs> um, we, we said to the, they said, you know, the province would mandatory transfer two of them. They said it was an option us for to areas three and four based on the cost. Council said, no, thanks. We'll deal with areas three and four when they hit the density levels. So again, um, the challenge here going forward is obviously mitigating our risk. So one of the challenge, one of the things we're on when we negotiate this new agreement, we're very concerned about getting assets in poor condition. And so therefore, through this new agreement, we want to mitigate and share the risk around that. We, we understand they can't transfer everything perfectly conditioned at one time. That said, we believe they need to share the risk if they do transfer an asset and it's in poor condition. So that's what we'll be working on in the coming months with, with, uh, with the province and reporting to council on it as we, as inevitably uh, more reports will come to you around this uh, very significant transfer of, of responsibilities and assets. Uh, in terms of, uh, and I apologize on the pickup, bi-weekly pickup, I may have confused you. So you are correct. There are areas in the municipality that have uh, a weekly pickup for blue bag. There are areas in the municipality that have bi-weekly. That did change somewhat through the last contracts and essentially each passage was added to the weekly uh, um, group. The reason for that was density. So there's no tried or true formula to this, um, but essentially the way it works out, it's on density and, and need, if you will. So right now we have a portion of the municipality on weekly, a portion on bi-weekly. 
The plan is to continue that unless council wants to put everybody on bi-weekly. So what that would mean is there's a savings to be had and we negotiated in this current contract. If council wanted to exercise the option, there's money to be saved as I point out my slide deck to pull back uh, the folks that are on weekly to pull them back to bi-weekly blue bag pickup. And that would require direction from council as a result of this presentation or you know, in, in the weeks ahead. Um, the nice part about the way we did this is it's a price point that's there. Council can execute it on it when they, when they wish. Okay. Uh, I believe the next question was on street sweeping. Um, the street sweeping is primarily driven from a report that came to council, recommendations around urban lake management. So the street sweeping uh, that we'll be focusing on as a result of this additional capacity will be focused on urban lake management. Um, we will, we haven't got the routes planned, but certainly we will get, we will get that and get a briefing note out to council once we've got it planned and let people know how that works, uh, how that will wor work in terms of the new capacity. In the meantime, I would say for any, especially the new councillors, if you have questions around street sweeping, absolutely please reach out to Bev and, uh, and she can bring you up to speed on what the, how it works throughout the municipality. Um, Finally, I think light pollution, <laughs> great question. It's all in the eye of the beholder. So simply put, when the LED conversion happened, I think uh, 40,000 uh, lamps uh, changed out, um, the, we converted to LED. And yes, uh, depending on the distance of the, and they were put on the existing poles. So yes, there has been, there was an initial reaction of folks that got, felt they got way too much light that they were not used to. Conversely, we have areas that are still underlit. So it's not, it's not consistent throughout the municipality. For example, uh, Tasso's team is preparing to move, I think, 33 new lights into North Preston um, to uh, enhance the lighting standard. And so, sorry, not the standard, to achieve the lighting standard. So to your question, yes, there is a lighting standard. Yes, staff can review the light uh, levels in the community and and the best way to approach that is to let Tasso know you'd like to advance this and uh, we'll, we'll absolutely try to get to it. Um, but like I say, it's not, um, certainly there were a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, growing pains when we made the conversion. But uh, yeah, there's, there's some communities still need more light and there's some wishing to have less. So just bring that request to Tasso's team and we'll, uh, we'll endeavor to get on it. Thank you. Oh, okay. was there one more? Oh. Oh. Sorry, I think there was one more question around the Provincial Highway Act. The public public highway highway Act. Act. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'll have to get back to you on that, Councillor. I'm not aware of anything at the moment. Okay, okay. thank you very much, uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Brad, for your very detailed presentation. Uh, it's an absolutely great run through of everything going on in transportation public works. And uh, I just want to uh, shout out, I've always found your team very responsive and of, of the many places facing change in HRM. I can't think of an area seeing more change than everything having to do with streets over the last couple of years. So I appreciate all the work that everyone's doing to uh, adapt to new to, to requirements of new times. Um, uh, street sweeping, we've already kind of touched on that. I'll look forward to the briefing note. Um, my, my one comment on that is I, you know, the report suggested that we have to be pretty aggressive because we want to catch the material in the roads before the rain uh, sweeps it into the lake. So, I mean, for Dartmouth uh, Peninsula, it would not be a big change at all. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any lakes on the peninsula because, I mean, there it's uh, the street sweepers are through quite frequently. But in Dartmouth, we typically see it twice a year. So um, for this to be an effective program, um, it will have to be a very considerable ramp up in capacity there to actually do what the consultant reports has said that we need to do on that. Um, and Shalom's points this morning were, were I think, well, well, well placed. Um, I, I did want to touch on uh, the traffic common piece. Um, the, the briefing note, uh, I think, is really good work. And, I, you know, to be blunt about it, I was actually quite surprised. I thought we, we were going to get a report back um, that said, 
well, thank you very much, Council, for your offer of a million dollars, but uh, there's no way we could possibly spend that because we don't have the in-house capacity to actually do anything with that. Um, so it's it's uh, kudos to trying to take that um, potential budgetary addition and make, make, make it work, right? I think where we need to be as a council and as a municipality is – you know, we need to be thinking about that not as a one-time thing. We need to be thinking about this as a permanent expansion of the program so that we can actually staff up and, you know, make the best use of these funds in future. So that'll be a discussion, I'm sure, for our budget adjustment day. Um, I, I wouldn't be me if I didn't raise trees. Uh, I think I've done that consistently every single uh, budgetary season. Um, so uh, re refresh my memory because on the on the slide it doesn't actually give the number. It just kind of has it, and it looks somewhere over fifty percent right now. With where we're supposed to be on urban forestry for twenty twenty three, we're looking at just getting uh, just just getting over fifty. Okay, so I mean, colleagues, uh, to me that is really profoundly disappointing. And I mean, I I know we we last year threw us through for a loop because of COVID. I mean, uh, that is what it is. But the reason we're so far behind is not because of one bad year. It's because this was chronically underinvested in uh, for all the preceding years leading up to it. I mean, once once we started ramping up. Um, it gets harder and harder to catch up because we did not invest in this in the early 2010s when it when this when the urban forestry plan came along. So uh, what I would like to do, uh, Mr. Chair, is I would like to request a briefing note on what it would look like. You know, we're not going to get to 100 percent of this, but I, I'd, I'd at least as the analogy I've used in the past. Um, I'd at least li like a, a, a conclusion on this that is something that you could hang on the fridge without uh, without complete shame. Um, so uh, I'd like a briefing note on what it would look like over because we have three years left, um, what it would look like to get to 75%. Um, so if we could get a briefing note to come back to say, okay, so if you wanted to get to 75% over the next three years, this is what you need to spend this year, this is what you need to spend the next year and the year after that. So then council can actually look at this and say, well, you know, is there is there anything more we want to do here or not? Because I, I don't want to just spitball a number right here and now. Right. So you're looking to make a motion for that? Well, I don't know. Do I need a motion for a briefing note? Um, because I just, I just don't want to make up a number off the top of my head. I'd like to actually have some, uh, some more detail back for, well, if council, if you were going to put more money into this, this is what that would look like. This is what the dollars would get you. I see Mr. Traves has popped up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think we're sort of using the term briefing note and and a motion to put it in the parking lot interchangeably. I, I would suggest that a that a motion um, uh, to put it in the parking lot or for a briefing note for consideration when we get to the parking lot items would be would be the route that I would suggest. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, then I'd like to move uh, a motion for a briefing note on where on what it would take to get to 75% of the urban forestry plan over the next three years. Second. Second by Mancini. I'll give it to Mancini. Oh, okay, thanks, Councillor thanks. Mancini. There we go. Thank okay. Uh, well, and, and colleagues, uh, you know, at this point, it's uh, information. I would just quickly put my pitch in for trees. They're the, they, you know, from climate change, they take carbon out of the air. They cool, they cool our urban heat areas, as, as uh, Councillor Cuddle noted. They actually make the pavement last longer. They suck up stormwater. They provide habitat for nature. Uh, they, there's no other asset out there that actually increases in value year by year by year. Um, they're, they're an absolutely uh, sound municipal investment, and it's something that I think is really important. Um, and we have areas, a lot, a lot in suburban HRM where, you know, product of different times where there weren't trees included in parts of subdivisions. So we have parts of the municipality where there really aren't, isn't much in the way of street trees at all. So I think this would be an, uh, something that we should absolutely look at. So I hope you'll support it. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we are uh, discussing uh, Councillor Austin's motion on uh, increasing the budget for trees. Um, are there any other speakers to that? Uh, please signify by putting your name in the chat. I see Dave, uh, Councillor Hensby uh, waving. So go ahead, Councillor Hensby, and we will then get to Councillors Purdy and uh, the mayor. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I would support that uh, request, but you know, we just recently, uh, just yesterday, uh, approved that uh, motion for the forestry grant from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and we all know that Justin Trudeau has made a big problem with planting so many millions of trees over the next number of years. So, I'm sure, there should be federal, federal, more federal funding available to us, so it doesn't have to come totally from our own municipal tax base. Uh, but I'm also hoping that uh, through that um, urban forestry project, uh, they may talk about some of our. Uh, uh, edible trees in regards to the fruit trees and stuff that we should be able to be put around to our community parks and and, and uh, public spaces for uh, for for that kind of stuff so i'm hoping that uh, the report will talk about um, not just deciduous and evergreen trees but also uh, the fruit trees as well thank you okay thank you uh councillor purdy thank you mr chair and sam you sold me on trees <laughs> we need more trees. I just wanted to speak to trees. Two things. In my district, I, and I heard this a lot, and we're all wondering why were the trees planted directly under the power lines? Because that seems counterintuitive to me, talking about them getting tangled in the power lines. And I know it won't happen for a few years because they're planted as young trees and it takes a while for them to get bigger. But just want to. Uh, I guess, clarification on why they were planted where they are. And the other thing is the edible trees. We're getting, I know I am in my district and Councillor Kent is in hers, a, a lot of rat um, problems and issues. And if there are edible trees planted and of course the fruit falling and decomposing on the ground, like what would be the impact on our rodent and pests uh, problem that we already are having a very difficult time trying to mitigate and control. So I just wanted um, maybe Brad to speak to that, like what, what would be the plan in place to help mitigate that risk? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Anguish, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a couple of quick just to help situate this, because you can do some of these numbers off the top of your head. So I'll try to address all the questions that I've heard today. So first of all, to clarity on the goal, um, the slide indicates 2023, but just to be clear, that's one January, 2023. So there's really only two years left in the program. However, I have the spirit of the motion is what can we do over the next three years uh, to get to 75% uh, of what that goal was, if you will, by the end of 2022. That is roughly 6,500 more trees over and above what's already planned under current budget levels. That 6,500 trees at today's rate is going to run you around an additional $5.5 million of budget over the next three years to put those trees in at the current cost. Okay, so that's, I can give you that number now. Um, in terms of types of trees, uh, certainly I, from my parks and recreation background, I have a little bit of experience around the, the fruit trees. Uh, they are best managed in a, in a community uh, garden type environment where uh, certainly there can be proper care and maintenance of them. Uh, as you say, uh, proper uh, maintenance of the waste that falls from them and uh, just to just really to ensure their safeties. Um, that is the best application for fruit trees. Uh, in terms of planting under power lines, well, uh, Pandora's box gets opened. I guess at the end of the day, um, what came first, the trees or the power line? So uh, the street trees carry a very critical importance, I think, as most counselors know. And if you haven't got the link, we can send that to you. Um, they have tons of benefits, both mental health, physical health, pavement health, uh, cooling, um, on and on and on. So what we are doing um, going forward is this conflict is going to continue to exist until either Nova Scotia power goes underground or, or we amend our ways. So one of the pieces that uh, Urban Forester is leading is making sure that uh, appropriate tree species are being planted in the right of way consistent with the height of the lines. So in other words, they're trees that will only grow to a certain height. Um, and that's how we're managing to live uh, going forward uh, in harmony in the right of way. Not everything is perfect yet. We have work to do uh, with the Red Book. And so uh, we're working on that. And we have work to do with Nova Scotia Power, as I mentioned earlier. So that is uh, the, the nub of it. Um, it would be 
around 6,500 additional trees over above what's planned at a rough cost of about five and a half million dollars over the next three years, in addition to what's already budgeted, which is 900,000 a year in the um, operating budget. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Just a question for the council. So, th so this briefing notice to come back for this budget, is that what we're looking at or is this just a, uh, a briefing note for further years? Are you looking for implications in this budget, Sam? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other uh, speakers for this item. Um, Can I just conclude, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, I mean, uh, I mean, if council wanted to um, instead select a number, um, I still think it would be useful to have a briefing note. Uh, Brad can rattle off some numbers. I mean, 5.5 million over three years. That's a that's a fair bit of sticker stock shock. I'm not sure that, you know, that's uh, that, that even I can justify that. But I mean, I'm uh, I'm uncomfortable just picking a number from the air. I mean, maybe it's a million bucks, maybe it's 500,000. Uh, it would be good to actually have this written down so that we can all kind of stew on it a little bit rather than just doing it on the fly. And that's my own, my own take, but if council wanted to instead uh, have me choose a number, I, I, can, I can go that route too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anguish, would you like to respond to that uh, right now or would you prefer for the briefing note? Sorry, I wasn't sure exactly what the question was. The, right the now, question I'm... was looking at uh, picking a, trying to identify a dollar amount at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. If you would prefer hard. to wait for. Yeah, my, my budget, I have no budget room. I, I don't know where I would find it right off the bat. So this would be a ballot list item. Um, and so what the briefing note would do, unless council gives me a specific target, you want to cost we can just count i mean you know what the cost per tree is about 800 bucks so um i can come back with uh, some scenarios uh, as part of the ballast uh, discussions i think that's the spirit of what i'm hearing okay thank you uh councillor morris yes thank you mr chair uh i have a suggestion for the briefing note i don't know if it's uh workable or not but um I wonder if you could also look at options for less expensive trees. And I think part of it is, as uh, Councillor Cuddle mentioned, that the trees need uh, certain requirements to be planted, like protections for the roots and that sort of thing. But there must be other locations in HRM that aren't as um, that aren't close to sidewalks or roads that we could put forward as potential locations for trees where the cost wouldn't be eight hundred dollars per tree, where it might be lower. And I'm wondering if that might extend the, the possibilities in terms of what we could afford and, and we, could, we could plant more trees for the, for the same amount of money or less money um, if there were other alternatives considered as part of the briefing note. Yeah, we could certainly come back with those types of options. I, I would just caution that the primary driver for the urban forestry program and for this program of 20 goal of 23,000 trees was the street tree canopy right not just any tree anywhere um, but you're right you in terms of total carbon offset you know a tree is a tree so to speak but more value when they're uh, in, in tied in with the street canopy so uh, we, we can certainly do that I, I just want to drive home and you're right that, that would change some of the numbers I, I just I I apologize because I've kind of fouled up the original um, my original thoughts on the, the cost of the tree. There are really two key, three key elements driving that cost from 500 to 800. One is the tree stock. Yes, I don't know. We'll find out if there's a difference if we change the type of tree. I, I doubt that's going to be much of savings. Second is the big drivers now are we are specifying uh, planting depth, soil requirements, and um, bracing. So again, we've had some, you know, it's one thing to plant a tree and have a warranty. But the problem with the warranty is if the tree keeps dying, you're just, you're into a cyclical waste of time. And so the spec, we're enhancing the spec and that's driving costs. So I just, I'm sorry, I 
bobbled that earlier, but uh, that's the key cost driver right now. And again, our prices are primarily presumed to be around street trees, but it does average out. So we can absolutely build that into the briefing note uh, as part of the consideration. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to support the um, the idea of the briefing note and getting some money back, but more, more and more, of course, this is, again, sticker shock around what we are putting in the parking lot and how, how much we can handle it um, when it, the time comes for consideration on the implications of tax uh, increases and such, and uh, I'm still holding fast on no change, and I don't want to take this out on the backs of the constituents. I agree that that trees are important. I'm just not sure where they land in the priority lists of things that, you know, really are uh, are pressing. And and I, I, I'm not looking forward to that big fun fight when we get to that one. But anyway, I am happy to support this at this point. Um, uh, Brad, you had mentioned a link for Councillor Purdy around the <clears throat> benefit of trees to roads. Could I ask that you send that along to me as well, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mason. Uh, and I feel your pain, Councillor Kent. I do. Uh, but at the same time, it's like it was our residents that asked for the urban forest master plan. And when you read the urban forest master, forest master plan, which, uh, you know, I think the link should maybe be sent to all, all of council uh, by uh, Brad's staff. You find that if we make the investment now, it saves us money, substantial money in the long run in terms of pavement maintenance, right? So it's a it's another one of those Robin Peter to pay Paul scenarios. If we don't make the investment now, we will spend more money on asphalt, which we also heard earlier in the in the presentation. We're not keeping up on the maintenance of that either. So this exacerbates that problem. So for me, you know, I I I really do. I know this is like Jennifer Watts's baby, not more than mine, uh, Councillor Kent. So so I feel like I have to speak on her behalf. Uh, but like, you know, this was a huge, uh, you know, big, uh, big, uh, big, hairy, audacious goal for the municipality back in 2010 when this was adopted. And, and I, I hope that we can actually move toward if we get, I don't think we're going to get to full funding this year, obviously, or next year. But, but like so many things, if we set a five year path to get to full funding, then it will actually get done. If we don't do it, it will never get done. And I think that would be unfortunate. So I just wanted to throw in those two cents there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, I don't see any other speakers uh, on this motion. And so with that, I would like to uh, call for the question. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the clerk for putting the motion in the chat, which is that the budget committee request a briefing note detailing measures necessary to achieve 75% of the goals established in the urban forestry plan over the next three years as a capital budget over option for additional funding in the proposed 2021-22 capital budget to the parking lot. And can we uh, please go through the roll uh, for the vote? Thank you. Beginning with District 6, Councillor Mancini. Trying to unmute. I try to unmute. Sorry, I in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Council Morse. In favor of the motion. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Council Lovelace. Yes. 14, Council Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Chair Russell. In favor. Deputy Mayor Otet. Voting yes. District 1, Council Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. One, Councillor Hensby. Or two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Uh, in, in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Mayor Savage. I, I believe, believe the Mayor, mayor Savage. has left the meeting. So that motion passes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. It is now a little after 12. Uh, so let's break for lunch and resume this meeting at 1 p.m. Um, Ian, just please clarify on what we do when we get back at 1. 
So everyone will return to this Zoom meeting, the same link that you had before. Please come back to this exact same meeting. There's no other calendar invitation. As a note, as those of you who attended training will remember, hopefully, uh, they we will not be pausing the live stream. So when you return to this meeting, your cameras and your microphones will be off and we will be going live as soon as we, when we have quorum. Uh, so we will be returning to a, a meeting that is live streaming. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see everybody at 1 p.m.
Good afternoon, everyone. We are returning. We have quorum and we have our staff members. We will be going live here momentarily. Ian, uh, how's my audio? Can you hear me okay? Sure can, loud and clear. Okay, I was having some problems before. Thank you. Let us know if you need any assistance from ICT and we'll send Corey your way. Yeah, I think we're okay. Thank you. I am not able to start my video, which a lot of people will appreciate, I'm sure. <laughs> True. Are we live? Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> yes, we are live. Uh, this is a continuation from this morning. Um, we have been broadcasting through lunch. Uh, so welcome back everybody for the afternoon section, the second quarter of this meeting uh, where we will be talking about uh, transportation and public works. Um, we are continuing the discussion on the main motion now. Uh, and I'd like to start off with uh, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Brad, uh, once again, thank you very much to you and your team. Uh, great presentation. I would like to take the moment to start off, Brad, by saying thank you for the enhanced street sweeping program as be part of the budget. Extremely important to uh, Councillor Austin and I, District 5 and District 6 with Lake Micmac and Lake Banook. So, uh, Big thumbs up on that. Appreciate seeing that in the budget. So I've got three uh, sections. I'll probably only get to the first one. I'll have to come back, but I want to discuss or ask questions about traffic and safety. I've got waste management, recycling questions, and then finish uh, finishing off with uh, street trees. So I'll start with the uh, traffic safety uh, questions uh, first, if I may. Um, you know, one of the questions around major collectors, and for those watching at home, I'm just going to paraphrase here. The definition of the uh, major collector street is the Movement of tra traffic is considered a priority and traffic calming measures such as speed humps or speed tables are not appropriate on these higher volume streets. So I understand that. My challenge is in my district, I have many streets that fall in this category and particularly three that's most concerning to myself and my residents, Waverly Road, Mount Edward Road, Albert Lake Road, which I share with uh, Councillor uh, Austin. Um, and having those streets as priority, I understand, but the challenge is what do we do? Um, you know, we can't put uh, traffic calming. These streets don't qualify for reducing the speed limit on. Uh, I, I can't even, you know, get uh, the speed sentry signs on the street. So I don't know what to do. I speak to HRP. I ask them to enforce, which they do, uh, but they can't be there all the time. So uh, I'm frustrated because I don't know how to respond to my residents when they, they bring up the uh, speeding on that, that, those uh, types of streets. Um, the traffic calming. Um, we're doing the uh, the bump outs and the doing the green ballers as a test on uh, Montebello. We're testing that. I think you know it's it's doing well. I think from from the pedestrian perspective, it's doing well. There's actually concerns from many of the drivers, but that's fine. I guess my question is really around right now when we're doing these pilot programs with the green ballers uh, on on Montebello, they're fastened directly to the asphalt. And we see that the cause of problems throughout the winter. I see in other uh, parts of HRM, we're now putting them in with a cement base. And so could you speak to that? Is that going to be the standard? Do we see switching those out to the cement base, especially as we go into next fall and, and into the winter time? You know, speed reduction has been brought up a couple of times today, uh, of course, and uh, we as the municipality not have the ability to reduce the streets on the, on the streets we choose to. Uh, you, I guess I have a couple of questions around that. The streets we have reduced, the speed, uh, do we have any measurement of it? Has that made a difference? Do we know there, how do we determine that successful? And I know that we continue to have asked in the province, uh, Brad, the, to allow the municipality to make, to make these decisions on our streets. But there is a new sheriff in town down in the province, down the street. And I don't know, is it an opportune time to make it another official ask with the new sheriff? Uh, he seems to have a different approach. Uh, so uh, I asked that question. Photo enforcement, uh, I agree with the Councilor Mason wholeheartedly that we need to move forward on that. So in your presentation today, uh, you're looking at doing uh, the uh, feasibility study. What does that mean? Uh, do you know, can we do a pilot in 2022? I mean, you know, I've identified a couple of streets and do we have any sense of what the cost were to at least start off a pilot as opposed to just, just doing the feasibility? I think you get the sense of uh, the eagerness of all of us wanting that, uh, Brad. Uh, when it comes to new developments, uh, are we putting in place uh, traffic calming into complete communities? So for example, in District 6, we have two that are 
will be coming up, whether it's this year or next year or in the near future. Port Wallace that we speak of quite a bit, it's a large development, 10,000 people. So when that road structure is put in place, are your, your team having conversations with our planning department to make sure that the way that it's designed, because most of the problems we have in HRM, as you know, uh, are, have to do with the design and the structure uh, uh, and the engineering. So when we build Port Wallace or build, uh, Port Wallace gets built, and I would add to that Shannon Park, are those conversations in place? So those are my uh, traffic safety questions, and I'll come back uh, second and third time around, uh, Brad. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Excellent. Yeah. Well. It's always depressing when you tell me how many rounds you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> At least you didn't say four or five. No, no. <laughs> well, let's knock them down. So let's, uh, let's start with the major collectors. So you're absolutely correct. There's, there's really nothing in the inventory. And this you're not alone in this. Pretty much uh, every district has the same concerns. Thus, the photo enforcement. That's why the priority is there. Um, is, is major collectors and major arterials are where we're having the majority of our collision issues. We know that photo enforcement will make a big difference. Okay, so that's why the press, as far as the pilot goes, um, two, two issues of that. Uh, one is there's a, the, the cost is not in the camera, <laughs> right? You can put a camera on anything. The cost is the back end and the enforceability of the tickets, the, uh, evidence gathering, the processing, and everything else. So it, it is a big endeavor. Um, it can and be Brad, it's the same as, uh, sorry, it's the same as the HRP is looking at body worn cameras. Same deal. The cost same. is in the back end. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's the back end. And so um, that said, um, we, you know, a lot of cities have kind of broken that mold, if you will. And there may be potential partners out there that depending how legislation works across provincial lines, we might be able to partner with another municipality, for instance, to do our back end processing. So these are the types of things we, you know, our study will be focused on as to how we can get this in and for uh, best bang for the dollars. Uh, in terms of, uh, you'd asked also about, I think uh, you said speed sentry signs. I'm gonna interpret that to mean dynamic speed display signs yeah that's correct for sure yeah they come by many names so yeah. so as you know we've started into that uh area um and we're going to expand it a little more this year the biggest thing we've realized out of piloting the the first batch and i say pilot it's the, kind of the first time we've gone with any significant number of course the police have had them out there in in small quantities before however we're out there in a fairly large number now um, there are a whole pile of management concerns that we've come across in making sure that the program is managed appropriately to get maximum impact. So one of the things we're doing right now is, is developing uh, procedures around this, uh, primarily to help our police partners, uh, because they have asked us, for example, to install these signs on their behalf. Um, and so because of uh, workforce issues they're having, obviously, with their members being in the right of way and potentially hurting themselves and other things. Uh, so it makes sense that we would do that as well to coordinate with the province, uh, because, of course, it, it, you know, uh, right at the boundary lines, you can have two completely different approaches. And so we want to make sure that that's well understood where we're in a hybrid municipality. Uh, so so long story short on that is, you know, if you're looking to uh, move your and by the way, the speed display signs are semi permanent. And so therefore, if, if a counselor is looking to move to a different location, just please send your uh, request into TASO or the road safety team, and we'll, we'll uh, look at what we can do there. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. There's much I could say about those signs. Um, <clears throat> speed limits. Uh, we have been dropping speed limits in, in some of the major collector's main arterials. Uh, a couple that come to mind are Forest Hills, Parkway, when we put in the new design, we dropped the speed limit from 70 to 60. Old Harbor Road was dropped. Um, and we're also working right now to look at uh, Highway 7 or Main Street outbound, uh, where it interfaces with the provincial as it heads towards North Preston, uh, and probably some other areas that I'm not aware of at the time. So we, we have been working on speed reductions as well uh, as, a, as an approach. Um, uh, success. Uh, 
We do do both before and after, um, but the reality is once you make that commitment to the reduce the speed, you're not likely going back. So, <laughs> right. And, and so it's more about what is the speed before we start that reduction process and to, to really make the decision that we're going to be successful uh, ahead of time. Okay, Brett, so did you say uh, major collectors, we are, we are able to reduce the speed? Some of our gate, so where the traffic, great question. So that's a good, good question. So traffic authority, where the differentiating line is, 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 is the traffic authority has the authority to deal with speeds above 50 kilometers an hour. All right. So we can, so in other words, uh, for instance, if it's 70 and we want to drop the 60, the traffic authority can make that decision. Okay. Where we get into the situation right now with current legislation is below 50, right? Going from 50 and underneath, uh, there's, there's all kinds of issues there in the current legislation, including speed zones and how they get set up. So, uh, sorry, school speed zones and how they get set up. So it gets a little complicated, perhaps too much for this session, but absolutely glad to talk to you about those options. Uh, you asked about... Uh, the cement base on the green bollards um, that are typically used for tactical urbanism in a way of getting ahead of the pavers to see if the solution is going to work. You are correct. There are a couple uh, options out there straight to the pavement and straight to the cement base. We're in a learning curve on this. Um, primarily, um, what we learned through our snow report was that the advice from KPMG is that many cities are doing the urbanism, but they are picking up the bollards for the winter. Um, and so we have, you know, been trying to keep these in the street to get a true test in all seasons, whether this would work. The bases are, uh, do have different applications. So for instance, and I don't quote me on Montebello, but if you did a cement base there and you impacted the drainage significantly, that could change the characteristics of the safety of the road. So we have to be careful what solution we use where. So that's, that's that one, but we are learning as we go. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned the new sheriff. I, I assume that means the new premier. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and, and a new department name, which we're also, uh, you know, the trans, uh, transportation and active transit. Um, look, but, it, you know, it's still the same staff team. And as I've said earlier, we're trying to build relationships there. Certainly the Provincial Traffic Authority sits on the Road Safety Committee with HRM. We're grateful for his presence at those meetings. He certainly hears firsthand of the challenges we're having. He's aware of them. Of course, he reports upstream. So uh, your, your question about do we continue to advocate and loudly, my, my quick answer is yes. Um, on all fronts, we, we advocate from a staff level with using evidence and, and professional uh, advice. And of course, uh, also advocacy at political level. As I said earlier, it can make a difference. So. Um, New developments. New developments. Sorry, yeah, new developments. Yeah, so so the quick answer is, uh, and I, I'm a, when Kelly presents, I'm sure she's going to give you an update on the latest of the Red Book. But essentially, when we get into new development, uh, they are working hard at the Red Book update. I believe it's been out with the development community most recently, getting feedback and consultation, and so it will likely come in for another round of review by staff, and then hopefully find its way to council. Um, obviously, we look to those guidelines, those municipal guidelines, to be the, uh, the answer in getting new development, uh, quote unquote, right out of the gate. So, All right. Thank you, uh, Brad. I'll come back to Mr. Chair. Add me the second list, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have done that already, Tony. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, some ground's already been covered on what I wanted to say, uh, and, and everyone's thanked Brad and his staff, so that's already been covered too. Thanks. Um, I'll get into the meat, and I don't, I don't think I'll have to come back three or four times. Um, so the, the one thing was you mentioned the, the near misses, although I think most people call them near hits, because if you nearly miss, you actually hit. But anyway, it's a whole other thing. Um, 
So where did that analysis take place? We can get back to you with the list of intersections. So I'll distribute that. Uh, I think uh, I think eight to 10 intersections, as I recall, but we'll distribute a list to council so you know where that occurred. For okay, sure. awesome, thank you. Um, the other thing was the, the traffic calming. So in the balance adjustment list or the budget adjustment list uh, that was sent out by the CFO, I did notice that it said in there, the traffic calming, the 1 million was in quotes a one time. And so I would assume that we could then use surplus for this, but we'll have a conversation with my colleagues when we get to that uh, uh, budget adjustment list. But in your analysis, you had indicated that it was ongoing and it would be so much of the, on the tax rate. And so I just wanted to get some clarification because I, I have heard several of my colleagues say this needs to be a permanent program, but I also remember uh, not only in this presentation, Brad, but in previous uh, previous ones, just a few meetings ago, where you were talking about traffic calming on, in residential areas, you and your staff believe that we really need to completely rethink how we're doing this. So I wouldn't see this as an ongoing thing. I mean, our effort to tr calm traffic in residential areas will be ongoing, but we don't know what program or what kind of ideas you and your staff will be bringing forward. So. I, I would hesitate to call this an ongoing investment because what it looks like or how much we invest may be vastly different. Am I getting that sense from you? That is a great question. Um, let me try to unpack it a little bit. Hopefully I'm not interrupting your time too badly. So, so $1 million, so we were asked, uh, if you recall your motion, we, we can find it strictly to the list as it existed today. We have identified some challenges with our list in that um, you know, certain streets are being prioritized over others and we think we've missed out and I won't go in, tomorrow we'll get into all those areas through some benchmarking that we did. There's some things like consideration of schools, you know, should they have more, more, more weight in this analysis? Should, should sidewalks or no sidewalk availability have more weight in this analysis? Should there be an equity lens? So there's a lot of things to look at. Is it completely upside down? No, not at all. In terms of you know, a, a ranked list, where the AO is particularly causing us some trouble is combined in that administrative order is the idea that we're, we're doing complete streets through our rehabilitation program. That's where we run into getting a little bit upside down because what we may be really rehabilitating a very uh, low priority traffic calming street, if you will. I use the ridiculous example of it might be street number 2900 if you actually rank them all from top to bottom. That AO would actually tell us to do that. And, and what we're saying is while it may have value, it's taking away from desperately needed resources for higher priorities. So that's the, the key message we're trying to, to drive home. It's not that anything's particularly wrong. Um, but uh, to the next point of your question, does the million dollars live on? So apologize for any confusion in the briefing note. As we understand it, that briefing note is around a one-time uh, deal as it sits now. We would then, we have a, a backlog of, I think, 209 streets to still measure and rank. Obviously, we'll be working on the AO with council to get that priority straight. Whether council wants to live on with another million dollars in the program next year, we're obviously very interested in understanding because if so, we need to think about resources in the long term. You know, we think we can pull this off by this year by sticking to vertical deflections, passing a lot of the streets on the list that require horizontal work um, and more detail and design and, 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 and do this for you. There's risks, of course. But, but going forward, the question is, if you want to be at that, I'll just use $2 million level, that is something we're obviously very interested to know because that should be built into our capital planning up front and, and resources as well. So um, hopefully I didn't shoot the, the gap on your answer and that was clear enough for the moment. So we're really, we look to that June meeting when we come in with our annual report on road safety to really get council's guidance as to where you want to be in that next budget planning year how much money you want to invest. Yeah, no, and that makes that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think we do need to be more strategic as my colleague, Councillor Austin has said on a couple of occasions, our current AO is really about uh, design repair for uh, crappy streets rather than an actual traffic calming policy for all of our municipality. Um, so what I would like to do at this point though, 
is I, I noticed from uh, Mr. Uh, Chair Russell, I'm at my five minutes. So I'm going to sneak it in right now. Uh, I want to put in under and a, and a request for a briefing note on that green card going to the biweekly. Um, but what I'd like to see in the briefing note is not just a wholehearted, let's do everyone biweekly, because there are, as Councillor Mason and maybe Councillor Smith can attest to, and maybe even Councillor Austin, there are some areas, especially in the old part, like going back to the 1800s, 1900s, where you have a lot of these row houses where people don't have access to a front, or sorry, a backyard or a side yard from their front. And you're gonna end up with really stinky green carts on the, on the sidewalk. Um, and so what I'd like to in the briefing note is maybe a look at for these very small special areas, should they be weekly and what would the, the cost of that be? Uh, so I'd like uh, if there's a seconder for that. Uh, to put I'll that second that, Mr. Mancini. And I'll, okay. I'll give up my time, uh, Mr. Chair, for someone else now that I put that out there. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mancini, would you like to speak on it since you seconded it? No, very quickly. I mean, I, I agree. I think the, uh, we need to be a little more flexible. I know I did receive complaints about going by weekly. To be honest and respectfully, I say this, most of the complaints came from million-dollar homes on the lake. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I think it's okay to take a look at that. It makes sense in the older part of HRM that if we are going to do that, that uh, we allow them to have it weekly. But, you know, my property, we survived through it. I know it's, it's complicated, but I think it's worthwhile looking at it and having the discussion once we go to the parking lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you. So I'll support the request for a, a briefing note and, and to understand the implications, especially the way it was framed. You know, what I remember from the debate around going to buy uh, to weekly when this was introduced, uh, part of the issue always was that they did, in fact, bring it in biweekly. And you have places like Schmidtville in the old North End that where there is no, as Councillor uh, Cleary said, there's no access to the rear yard. So you have the big green bin sitting on the sidewalk, taking up space uh and stinking <laughs> in the height of july and august so you know uh and then from there it has just grown and grown and grown and grown uh, throughout all of hrm you know I, I we made it work uh, uh and and my neighborhood uh, and the immediate area outside of down that kind of down down area made it work despite the relatively high density of the single family homes in these areas so i think it can work uh I, to the public because i know you know i had one or two emails complaining about it but that was it the public who maybe is concerned about it, I also would be open to exploring get it, uh, moving blue bag to every two weeks. I, I, I don't really have a problem with that either. But I think that it's got to be done as a pilot project for one year where we actually engage with the public and see what the operational difficulties are. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to do it, I don't think we want to say to people, we, we're not listening to you. But what I saw when we did this with the green card is that it, that it worked out fine for most people. So I am willing to explore it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have had a request for the motion to be pasted into the chat. So, uh, Councillor Cleary, if you could, uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Hensby, go ahead. Uh, following up on Councillor Mason's comments, I would also like to amend that and include the rule bag, and perhaps that should be bi weekly. I'll be a strong advocate of restoring the weekly organics. Uh, we learned from this past year how relevant that was. More people have to be around. Uh, we're gonna have the same kind of growing season this year with the, with the COVID. Uh, we're not gonna get out of this till late summer. So we're gonna have a whole growing season where people are gonna be out doing the yard work and stuff. And uh, I think the green bins are gonna be more important than ever. I also have the situation of wildlife um, problems. I have bears in the Lake Echo area uh, terrorizing the, the, the trailer park there. You know, we had to go in and put locks on the green cards. You know, over 300 green cards up there now locked to try and uh, to frustrate the bears from feeding on the uh, organic. So I'm not in favor of uh, going to, uh, to a bi-weekly collection in, in, in the prime seasons, uh, you know, the growing season and stuff, the early spring when the bears are out in, in the early growing season. I like to see it extended right till the end of September and, and maybe the half a year be weekly and the other half be bi-weekly. But uh, I think the blue bag uh, bi-weekly should also be under consideration as well. So if that's a friendly amendment to the to the movers and seconders, if we're looking at our solid strat solid waste strategy, we should look at all of it, you know, not just the green cards, but the blue bags should be also considered. I think uh, Councillor Kent made a reference to that as well, so. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Cleary has indicated that the blue bags, uh, he does not consider them to be a friendly amendment, and I was going to suggest the same. So if you would like to come back later when we're back on the main motion and uh, make a motion for the blue bags, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm going to support this going to the parking lot. Um, I, I think it was maybe one of the only incumbents that uh, did door knocking. Um, and uh, oh, Councillor Russell did. I think maybe College Clary too. And uh, I, I, this did come up on the doorstep um, in a couple places. My sense of the issue is uh, for the vast majority of people um, going to buy weekly was, you know, maybe it was like a grumble sort of thing, but it wasn't the end of the world. Um, um, and people understood that it was it was a cost saving thing. Um, the people who really cared about this really, really cared about this. And uh, so so I think that that's my sense as, as to where the public is on it. Um, you know, as, as we look at our heading towards our parking lot, I mean, we have a million dollars for traffic calming, um, which uh, I think the briefing note is very convincing on as to the value of that. Uh, we have trees, uh, we have other things on that list as well. Um, it grows all the time. So um, here's the reality of budgeting is you, you have to pick and choose, you know, you there's no reality in which we get to have uh, low taxes, more services and no cuts uh, and no debt. I mean, that, that that's just fiction. You have to select some of these things um, to, uh, in terms of what your priorities are. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, I've, I've probably been less sensitive to tax than some of my colleagues, mainly because I think as a municipality across the country, we stack up very well. The complaints I get from my residents are primarily service based, um, but I'd be okay to take a look at this and see about, well, there's other things on the list that I think are probably a higher priority. So I'm okay with moving this to the parking lot so that we can consider it um, during the budget adjustment list when we look at, you know, the totality of what, what we want to do extra wise and, you know, what our choices are going to be in terms of tax rate or services. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say, Anything that increases the likelihood of rodents being attracted to residences, I am not in favor of. And the, the idea of raising our tax and decreasing our service is not palatable to me either. And I did door knock during the campaign, and this was one of the, the sticking points. And of course, people, I... They, they were understanding because of COVID, everything changed. None of us were, you know, business as usual, but, but to put this as a permanent change, I just, I, I don't think our residents can stomach that. I, I think the messaging, pulling services, raising taxes, um, they're gonna feel very unheard. So I'm not in favor of, of this at all, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Othit. Thank you, Chair. And uh, first of all, I'll start by saying I agree with Trisha's comments there. I heard the same thing from folks that uh, they were willing to accept this during a, uh, a pandemic and a recession, I dare say, as well. And uh, the idea being that it would be for one year. I'm uh, If there was going to be a change made, I'm, I'm intrigued by moving blue bags to every two weeks because a lot of people actually did suggest that when we brought out the green bins. They said, why didn't you do the, uh, the uh, blue bags instead? Because they don't create stink, they don't attract rats, they don't attract maggots, they don't attract flies. But if we are going to look at this, I would want it to be across the board. Um, again, there are areas in my, and, and remember, I've been to everybody's house now. I made a little delivery there before Christmas. And I tell you, a lot of you live in areas, and I'm looking at Becky, and I'm looking at Trish, I'm looking at Lisa, I'm looking at you, Paul. Well, we're pretty darn close to our neighbors. I still think that people think in suburbia, we all have like 40 acres and uh, we're not near our neighbors. A lot of uh, the new homes being built in several of our districts in order to keep prices down around 35 foot wide lots. And they don't have big backyards, or if they do, there, there's uh, non-disturbance areas and whatnot. So either it would be for everybody, 
or it would be for uh, for nobody. I'm not uh, I'm not interested in uh, differentiating between where you are and what your your uh, garbage pickup is, and particularly since the more urban areas even do seem to pay more higher taxes because of the value of the homes. So I'm okay with having a look at uh, deferring the uh, uh, in having a discussion about deferring the uh, green the blue bin pickup but no the green bin uh, i think should be picked up back to what we promised that it was going to be a one-year thing because of covid if we absolutely did keep it at two then uh to two weeks then it would have to be across the board thank you okay thank you very much uh councillor lovelace Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, have a couple of comments. Um, I agree with uh, what Councillor Othet just said. I do think that moving the blue bags every two weeks makes sense. Uh, much of my district is already at two weeks um, and we don't mind. <laughs> so, uh, but the green bins, uh, as Councillor Hensby pointed out uh, with regards to the bears um, and uh, the coyotes and other critters that we have, uh, that we live with here in our communities is a concern. Uh, but I also would like to see um, more communication, education, awareness about what happens with a storm delay. Uh, so we saw that this winter, you know, blue, not everyone puts their green bin out every week, every two weeks, sorry. And, uh, you know, I'm one of those people, I just wait till it's full, and then I put it out. Uh, but when it's storm delayed, you end up with nowhere to put your compost. Uh, and so I think, you know, the staff were unprepared this year to be able to help people uh, figure out what to do with their compost. So I do think that we just need to do uh, more education and uh, help people understand what, uh, you know, what they can expect as far as service is concerned. And if we are going to raise taxes and reduce services, uh, you know, it, I, I don't think that that is helpful. Uh, and I don't think that, that that it's warranted right now. If, um, you know, pre pandemic, a weekly uh, summer uh, compost pickup was great uh, I think that we need to go back to that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thanks Chair and, and colleagues. Great discussion on this topic. Uh, I won't repeat most of what I heard because I do share the same concerns but I also do support the, 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 the motion that's in question right now. I guess the question I have for Brad is looking at the past summer that we had is are there any lessons learned or information that'd be worthwhile to share because you know I had a handful of residents who, who called um, and a few emails as well um, with concerns of, of us uh, moving it so I'm just wondering uh, through through that period I couldn't find any information in the on the in the in the report and I might have missed it that talked about what what that change and, and how that change affected our not only service delivery but what staff heard and 311 heard, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just wondering if you share any information on that. Sure. Uh, I think the simple answer is what council's already arrived on. There were very few complaints. Now, what was that based on? <laughs> was it based on the empathy that everybody knew they had to take some pain, to, to absorb some pain with COVID uh, in order to keep budget low? Or, and did that suppress the complaints? Uh, certainly, there was no widespread complaints. Um, yes, I believe staff, we could have been faster out the gate with our advice and how to handle a, a green card a little longer. But uh, by the time we got there, uh, certainly staff was fielding uh, calls on a regular basis to help citizens, uh, you know, keep their compost clean enough so as to, uh, to to weather the weather the distance. So. Unfortunately, I don't have any great answer for you. Uh, certainly complaints were low. If they were high, we wouldn't have put it on this list for an option. Thanks. Great, thank you. So if, if it could be included in the brief note, and I'm, I'm assuming that we're gonna come back with the blue bins, getting getting 311 complaint numbers might be worthwhile as well, just so we have the data of what we might have, might have saw. And you know, obviously we could, counselors could input, give you that, in, that feedback as well, but getting a 311 uh information might be helpful for that brief note as well all right thank you thank you very much uh councillor kent thank you mr chair i i i don't think i can uh, support this one at this point i i really think there's a there's a bigger discussion and uh, a, a bigger sort of strategy change that needs to happen on we are all saying much the same thing which is they, that our, our waste collection and our ability to support the 
residents who are at the front end of, of we're, the ask that we're doing, which is uh, recycle, wait, put your waste, uh, separate your waste, um, work with us to, to uh, mitigate the impact on the environment. Around all those layers, we're asking every resident at every home, whatever, whatever structure that might look like, to do their part. But I think we are missing, we're missing uh, some links. And I think that's what we're hearing today. But, but I just feel like there's some good work happening, I think, within solid waste. And uh, on this particular motion, um, we should be looking at that on a larger picture, not trying to shuffle this into this sort of quick response from staff to get it in front of us for this budget. And, and this go leads me to a question to Brad, is that we've just assigned uh, our waste management contracts um, for another five years. Can we interrupt those? contracts to uh, insert this type of change should this particular one come along. Um, before you answer though, I also need to note that the the wait was long and uh, requested regularly for the Eastern Passage Area to get the weekly. There's no way I can support um, a bi-weekly now at this stage. I agree totally with Councillor Hensby that, you know, and, and thank you for acknowledging that um, Councillor Oathead around those of us in areas where there the circumstances are different. Uh, Councillor Purdy's point about rodents is very, very real. And frankly, if we if 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 staff didn't hear the complaints, we just went through an election and Councillor Purdy and I are still getting them almost every day about rodent pr problems. And I can tell you, I literally sent out a notice today that I'm having a, a virtual meeting with folks in the in the area within District 3 and Eastern Passage who are dealing with recycling bags, even though, Councillor Oda, you don't think it's a big problem. Those that of, of us that live on the coast and live near the high winds that come off the water um, are dealing with those bags blowing all over the place, ending up in ditches and becoming something that it does attract rodents. It is problematic. So we've got other things within this whole, uh, I think, um, program that we should be looking at. Staff, I have to say, and and um, Brad, this is kudos to you and your team. They've been really open to helping us learn and understand what's at play, but also open to new ideas and hearing more about what we're hearing from our residents. So I think we can be on the right path. I'm just not convinced that this is the time. We have a lot to consider in a budget and to ask staff now to go back and kind of pull all this back together to, um, the picture is bigger, and I think they need, will need a little more time before we actually get into a, 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 a this next decision on a one-year budget. Just my thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Absolutely, and thanks for the question. So just to reiterate, all of the unders that we put in our budget on that slide have been negotiated. They are negotiated prices within the five-year contract context. So the quick answer is yes, we can enable it. The weekly green cart has always, uh, from, the moment, from the year we put it in uh, as an option, we've always had it there as an option. It's something that we exercise on May 1st of every year. And it is, uh, like I say, it has become the standard of council to go with weekly green cart. I just want to caution, I'm always careful. You only have a few words at council. I, I just want to reiterate, not saying we didn't have any complaints. I, I should say the complaints didn't, they didn't, uh, we expected far more. So I'll let the data, uh, you know, should this come to a briefing, no, I'll let the data be the judge here. Uh, I'm inserting, if you will, my opinion. We expected a far more of a outcry. Um, in terms of the, I just wanna go over the numbers again, just in case any counselors wondering. So on the under slide, we have to make the green cart decision by May 1st. So just to, just to look at your program night right now, as planned, barring any delays, you're scheduled to deal with the ballot list, I believe on April 20th. So if the decision was made on that day, that is executable, that will meet the May 1st deadline for this decision to go with green cart or not. We, that's weekly summer green cart. In terms of the blue bag, and I know that motion's not on the floor, but I just wanna drive uh, you know, the, the, the numbers home. So our estimation is we don't know exactly how quickly we can implement this. So, you know, it'll be a portion of that 850 because we're already into the, the we're going to be into the fiscal year already. So our guess is, you know, we've said 308,000 savings within this year. 
it's, it would be weekly blue bag would be approximately eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars saved annually. But in this particular year, let's just say it might be more like a half, depending on how fast council makes the decision. So I just want to give you the scope of the dollar. So if council was decide to go bi weekly blue bag uh, quickly and throughout for everyone, we'd probably see around four hundred in the range of four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars savings this fiscal. Um, and then if we go long term, more in the area of eight fifty for an annual savings. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would uh, at this point like to speak to this. So I'm gonna step down from the chair and ask uh, Councilor Gagel Gammon to step in for just a few minutes. With pleasure, Mr. Chair. Um, so Councilor Russell, would you like to speak? <laughs> I, I thank you very much, I would. And, and I'm timing myself. So um, I'm not gonna be able to support this. Uh, I was the one who put the motion on the floor last year at the request of TPW. And uh, it made sense. Uh, we were in a difficult time. We were looking at uh, 2020 being a lousy and unpredictable year in many ways. And we knew that this was coming and it had a deadline of it, uh, similar to the May 1st deadline that we're seeing now. So we had to act on it quickly. And so we did that. And, and then we had the election um, and the overwhelming response, about 100%, was that we had made a mistake by uh, moving to a two-week pickup for uh, the blue bins, uh, sorry, the, the green carts. This is from every type of household that you can imagine. Um, this is from all across uh, Lower Sackville. And I got to about 7,000 homes. Um, and I won't say that everybody mentioned it, but everybody who did mention it said, we made a mistake. It was the wrong thing to do. So I'm not going to be able to support uh, this going even for uh, the supplementary report coming back to the budget adjustment list. And if that passes, I'm not going to be able to support uh, this reduction. It, it, we, just, we need to keep it at every week through the summer. We talked about climate change uh, yesterday, I think it was, and it is getting warmer and the summers are getting warmer and it, the problem is getting worse. Uh, so by having it every week through the summer, I, I think is just something that we need to continue doing. Thank you very much. And at this point, I will resume the chair. Um, Councillor Austin, go ahead and we will uh, leave Councillor, not leave Councillor Cleary to close, but uh, we will keep Councillor Cleary to close. Great job, close. Kathy, better than the old chair. Good job, Kathy. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Chair. Um, so just to conclude, just uh, taking a, a bit of a read of the room, I just want to remind uh, colleagues where, you know, where we are with budgeting. I mean, this is not an easy exercise to go through and choose our priorities and, you know, what, where we want to spend the money. But I just want to caution, you know, as that budget list comes, if we're not willing to move cuts of any sort, well, then we have to either forego um, taking on new services or um, raise or raise taxes if we want to have those services, or we have to jeopardize some of our future plans by not being able to prudently uh, keep our reserves up and put money aside for future capital. It is to some extent a zero sum game. So for me, when I look at it, I mean, I had residents complain too, but um, the complaints that I had were not huge. Um, like I said, the, the people who really care about this really care about this. But when I look at things like, well, we could fix every school zone traffic calming for a million bucks, or we can have a summer uh, green bin pick up every two weeks. I think it's at least worth having it on that budget list to have that conversation because we don't quite know exactly where this budget list is going to come. We haven't heard from Parks and Rec. We haven't heard from planning. Uh, there, there's going to be a lot of hard choices. So uh, I leave that and I'll let Sean Cleary close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. And thank you, Councillor Austin. It, it, <clears throat> it is a funny kind of situation we find ourselves in because we have what the CAO has proposed, uh, the department's come forward, 
and we've put a number of overs on the budget adjustment list. And um, to Councillor Austin's point, uh, it, at this point, it is actually a zero sum game. If you add a million dollars for extra traffic calming, then we're either putting an extra million dollars onto the tax rate, taking it from the surplus, or we could find an equivalent cut somewhere else that's less important than traffic calming. And so, um, I have every year that I've been on council put forward and often in some years, the only councilor to put forward proposed cuts. Um, it seems I'm continuing my tradition of putting forward potential savings and, and having those voted down. Um, so, you know, when, when we're at the end of our budget adjustment discussion and we're looking at, well, do we increase the rate by this much or a little bit more than that or a little bit more than that, uh, these are the choices we get to make. Um, I did knock on doors as well. And in fact, in my door knocking, did not hear a green cart once. Um, and I only had a couple of discussions with uh, one as a neighbor up the street who lives actually opposite Andrew Philopolis, our solid waste manager. So he actually yelled at Andrew more than he yelled at me uh, about his green cart. Uh, I offered to give him my power washer to help him with his green cart, but he declined. Uh, but these, the, the choices are priority. What is a higher priority? And this is really at this point, just to get the information back, uh, we know what the potential savings could be if we did a blanket cut. Um, I will be either putting on the floor, uh, the, the bi-weekly recycling or supporting whoever does put it on the floor. Uh, but I, I think we do need to look for some savings uh, because we will be adding extra. And so uh, I guess I'll leave that parting thought with my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I see no further speakers in the chat. Um, so with that, uh, we have the motion in the chat that the budget committee request a briefing note detailing measures and implications for reducing weekly organics collection to a bi-weekly service within the pr proposed 2021-22 budget for the transportation and public works for consideration in the parking lot as an operating under budget option, including areas that should be maintained at a weekly service level. Uh, and with that, I would like to hand it over to the clerk to move through the roll for the vote. Thank you. Beginning with District 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. 8, Councillor Smith. For. 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. Yes. 11, Councillor Cuddle. For the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting yes on the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, that's a yes for me and Shiklis. 15, Chair Russell. Against the motion. Deputy Mayor Outhit. Strong no. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting against the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Negatory. Three, Councillor Kent. Opposed. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting against. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Mayor Savage. Mayor Savage. Sorry, for the motion. By my count, uh, that is 11 to six. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, we are back on the main motion. Uh, my next speaker is Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also want to um, cheer on our TPW. The, you guys are all amazing. And as a new councillor, I, I learned very quickly, I am not alone. Um, the most complaints I get are traffic and pedestrian safety. So. Um, I've had a lot of interaction, I guess, with our with our traffic folks, and 
just amazing. I, I can't sing your praises enough and I'm very, very thankful. And the passion and the expertise is really quite something. So thank you. So I, I just actually had some clarification questions from the report. The first one was, and, and Councillor um, Cleary mentioned this, but the oh dear, road safety, and under road safety, the diagnostic video analysis of near misses, you're gonna send us those 10 intersections, but I was wondering how, how was that data gathered if we don't have the, um, the photo radar enforcement? So if there was video, I'm just wondering where that video came from. And also wondering um, what this means. Um, increased pedestrian recall from 38% to 72% of traffic signal network. I didn't understand what pedestrian recall means. Um, also the pet waste pilot program, I'm getting a lot of complaints about dog poop in our parks and people just throwing their bags just into the, the woods when you know the garbage is right there um, and not cleaning up after their pets. And so I was wondering if you could speak more on what you're, you would be working with Parks and Rec for the pet waste pilot program. So I was wondering what, what is that? That's exciting, a pet waste pilot program. Um, the other, the other question, the, the policy change. So you've mentioned that a few times now in our council and, and meetings and budget meetings. So the, 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 the problem with the AO, the policy of our traffic calming and how the policy needs to be changed. So I was wondering who, who is in charge of the policy change and is there a time um, line on that. So it will be changed by such and such a time. And then the other, the last question is concerning your memo that you sent for the $1 million increase um, and, and what that looks like. And I was wondering, will you speak to that at some point? Um, probably not today, because by the time we all talk about the, the budget, um, but I had a lot of questions with that as well. So just wondering if that is gonna be spoken to, do we put that motion on the floor as well? That's a separate one than this. So just looking for some clarification on that. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mr. Anguish, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Councillor Purdy, great questions. Uh, the, I'll start with the briefing note last. Um, to aid today's discussion, we advanced the briefing note. It has been requested for what's called the budget adjustment list that council will be debating on April the 20th. We purposely got it here for today so that if you did have questions, and we appreciate you've got it on the eve of the meeting, and um, I hope you'll understand that was pretty good in bureaucratic terms of turnaround, but uh, certainly we can... Uh, absolutely entertain any questions around the briefing note. Glad to deal with them offline. Uh, to sum up though, essentially what that briefing note says is, is for an extra $1 million traffic calming as might be proposed by council as an over for consideration by budget, we would propose the 250,000 be put into additional school zones. That would get us probably 16, we're estimating 16 school zones encompassing 21 streets. Uh, so in other words, think of it as a vertical deflection either side of the school zone, so to speak. Uh, that would get us 26 rank streets plus another six neighborhood streets that we feel are going to, uh, that are having impacts from previous uh, um, implementations where the, where this, where obviously putting the traffic calming in is causing shortcutting on other streets. So that was the suggested package we put forward. Um, we did that and we actually gave the list of streets. We did that so council could absolutely see what, what might be the realm of the possible. Obviously that's subject to change. And, but if you have any questions at all, please, please get them to, to, to us and, and you can drive that through my office. Um, the administrative order on the policy change, that discussion, uh, we're anxious to, to make those uh, uh, policy changes to make sure that we're getting the best, uh, that we're hitting the priorities for traffic calming. And so that traffic calming policy is held by council. 
um, staff gives advice on it. And we're, in, because we know this is an important issue for council, obviously, and where there is a backlog of 209 streets for assessment, we are uh, presenting our first uh, um, suggestions around the AO to the Transportation Standing Committee tomorrow afternoon. Um, that will start the journey. We, uh, we have put it in the form of a presentation. We are hoping the Transportation Standing Committee will be kind enough to give us some feedback, make sure we're heading generally in the right direction. And then we would go off, make, the, make a, 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 give a formal report to council and recommendations to start the actual formal policy of, of changing the administrative order. Timeline, that depending on how council receives it, you know, it, it could be long. Um, but, you know, our goal for the reasons I stated is to have this done in a matter of a few months. Um, hard for me to put a hard date on it now, but, you know, if, if, if we had it done by summer, I'd be very pleased. Um, pet waste. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, people not observing garbage cans in parks with their pet waste, uh, talk to parks. <laughs> uh, you can bring that up. Uh, what the what council wanted with the pet waste pilot program is the fact that right now uh, the way our organics system works is we do not accept pet waste in the organics bins. Uh, other municipalities have done that and councillors have asked about that. So we committed to work with parks to undertake a pilot program where we would take the waste, uh, the pet waste basically from the parks um, and put it through uh, on our organic system to just see how that works, what, you know, all aspects of it. What is the handling like? What is the, what is the byproduct at, at the end? And, uh, and basically analyze whether that's gonna be part of, if you will, the, the spirit of councils, is this gonna be part of the game plan moving forward, potentially with our new organics plan? So that's what that pilot program is, is about. Um, the videographic analysis, that, that is separate from photo enforcement. Uh, that was uh, specific uh, video setups at, at the intersections that we'll send you the list of. And essentially to, because um, um, as you can imagine, when you're dealing with an inhuman as, in human form, you can arrive at, a, at a, an intersection, size it up, and you're only going to be as good as the behaviors you see at that time. The nice part about the videographic analysis is it does over an extended period of time, we're able to see the, the ongoing behavior at the intersection and, and draw conclusions. So uh, we did that. Uh, we, we basically submitted to a um, to an insurance firm that was doing this with a number of uh, municipalities and uh, we qualified. And uh, like I say, uh, we'll get back to you with further information from that. We're understanding there's a lot of interest and, and, and understandably so. We'll get back to uh, uh, to you with kind of findings from from that. So I think I've addressed all your questions. If I missed one, I apologize. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, Brad, I just want to say reiterate what everyone else is saying here. I have to say that coming back to Council, there's so many changes. All so many are great, and but I, I'm really impressed with the staff. Uh, engagement with, with us. I was worried at the beginning when I kind of was under the impression that maybe we shouldn't be talking to staff, but you know, I think that there's a really good system right now. So whatever we're doing now, let's just leave it as far as th that kind of thing. You've been really helpful in helping us uh, address and understand the complexities of safe streets, addressing traffic, address addressing speeding and layers and layers and the more I learn the more complicated I feel like it's getting what I am also getting is that there is absolutely a commitment from staff to um, work with us and understand what we bring to the table as counselors who are close to the residents in the neighborhoods we rely on the residents in our neighborhoods to tell us what's happening we're not there all the time particularly during this last year with COVID not being able to even be near our residents so um I I really appreciate that and and the the the, the traffic concerns the life and death scenarios are very real as unfortunately we've seen very recently and I can't I continue to to champion on that but the more I go the, the more I, I realize we're, we're doing a lot is but I I am wondering um, do we have the, uh, I didn't see anything in this presentation around the layers of responsibility that I think we should have 
in educating our public to remind them of their role. We talk about what can government do? Government can change this. Government should change that. What I continue to go back to is that pedestrians have a, a responsibility. Drivers have responsibilities. Communities have responsibilities for educating our children and our and our and taking you know being mindful of of um, being in areas where there is a little higher risk. I I, I it can't all be with the government fix. Uh, although, you know, as we've already identified here, we can do better and we are trying to do better. Um, what I want to know is, is there, is there a layer of education? I, I shared a um, video, a YouTube video that came by me recently, which was, it just reminded me of what we learned as kids, which is stop, look and listen. And it was really, very uh, engaging. It caught your attention. It it, it kind of made you realize that wow, yeah, we we've, we're missing maybe missing the boat on some of our very quick communication pieces. And I've said this to several in several meetings in several different departments that we have to be looking at how do we get that message out there around safe practices that ultimately can change situations in neighborhoods. They can. Um, we, I have said it on a number of occasions that no matter what the situation is, a crosswalk is not your friend when you step out into it. You are up against a vehicle. You will never win against a vehicle. A crosswalk is a place that no matter what we put up there, there is still a, re a, re a responsibility of the person who is stepping out into that roadway. Um, and so I just feel like we're not, maybe we're, I, I'm worried that we may have lost some of that education piece um, because I don't see it here. So I'm going to let you respond to that. The other part, the traffic calming um, uh, piece, uh, uh, the pedestrian, sorry, the pedestrian crosswalks. I really appreciate um, the speaker that came on today to help us understand what's, what his experience was, or just unfortunately, what his family experience was, sadly, but how that's impacted his life and how to how he wants to champion. I have messages from regularly from constituents more recently around a very dear friend to a, a woman who's um, who would passed away by accident by a vehicle accident on Eisner in Portland, and that that driving force uh, of to be a voice for the rest of the community. And so we need that. I, I, I appreciate hearing from our public and Brad, you and I chatted the other day about it. I said like, well, how do I process all this information? How do I get it to where we need to get it? Um, and so I feel more confident about that, but I wanna say thank you to anyone out there who, if you have a concern, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. That's, we, I've said it during the election, we're not the keeper of all the best ideas. We, you know, our residents have them and they're living it every day. Uh, we've addressed the the water, the rodent and uh, waste collection for now. I'll leave it there until we see what else comes forward in a briefing note. The Councillor last, Kent, okay, uh, when you say the one, last. Well, one last question for Brad and it, he it, it is right now, are, is your department the department that is responsible for any uh, engagement around lake health? If it is great, I'll ask a second question after. If it's, I just need a yes or a no for now because I'm I have a question. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, lake health is something that I think we're going to be talking about with planning. But uh, go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Thank you, Chancellor. You stole my thunder. Yes, planning and development, and uh, they're coming. They're coming up to bat real soon. Um, my old colleagues there will. Uh, it's a very big passion of mine. So. Um, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to address your questions there. In terms of, uh, I think the, the real question here is, is was, um, do we have enough education going on? It's a great question. Um, so let me start with why you're not seeing it in our budget. That's the easiest thing. Um, if the money is not in our budget, the money, the money is in allocated in the uh, corporate communications budget. It runs it last, I recall, around $85,000, uh, and they leverage that. They work with the police department, and they work with our department to put that money to use. They used to run basically one or two campaigns a year. Um, so the most famous one was the Heads Up Halifax campaign for distracted driving. Um, there was a lot of feedback that that had kind of lost its, its luster. It was only happening a couple times a year, and we had to be more dynamic and responsive. 
Uh, what therefore is corporate comms is lined up on basically monthly themes that parallel in many in many cases the what's going on with the police uh, department and the money they spend. Um, that's but that's not only the areas they go into. Um, as, as pointed, as I said, to that billboard that I showed earlier. So there's a lot going on there. Um, certainly, um, if you have questions uh, about all the nuts and bolts of the campaign, I can work with you and with Brett and Murphy to make sure you get that information on the details of what they're doing. Um, I'm just not allowing here. But that is not the only education going on. I would, uh, we allocate funding within our bike uh, network projects to advance education because, of course, the bike lanes are coming in, there are new markings, uh, potentially new signals. There's a lot to learn about a bike lane for both the cyclists and the drivers. And we're working to get that out, that message out there because it can be quite confusing. And, and uh, the IMP, uh, the Integrated Mobility Plan also has funding uh, that they use for uh, education to again, um, uh, in influence safety and influence driver behavior, uh, especially as it pertains to single occupant vehicles um, and transportation demand and, and whatnot. So there, there is quite a few, uh, I guess, pockets of, of effort going on in the education. Um, certainly it's, a, it's we work to try and keep it as harmonized as we possibly can. And so that, that kind of gives you an overview of what's going on with the education uh, program. I think that addressed the questions you have. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was typing in the chat, so I, I, was, I was a little, a little lost for a moment. Um, re really quickly, I, um, I have to also thank Brad and uh, your, your staff and your team. Everyone has done that already, Councillor. So I extend that, but I want to also extend the unsung heroes of the traffic analysts. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we forget a lot of what's happening in our communities are because of the work that they, they do. And I've had a few um, and, you know, they feel I, I can't imagine what they feel in, in their inbox and, and with requests. Um, so a big shout out to the traffic analysts out there who, you know, uh, so for me, uh, they, they respond quickly uh, and efficiently and, and get back to residents as well. Sometimes the answers that they provide are not the good ones that the residents want. Residents want. But they do provide it with evidence, um, which, which is great. So, you know, I want to extend that. Thank you to them. Um, so, really quickly, some of the things we already mentioned that I wanted to focus on. So, I'm just going to get to some quick questions uh, and comments. So, with the 40 kilometer zones, which is great, we, we've been able to see some of those come online in, in HRM. The question then becomes what are we doing with integration with HRP? Um, to, to make sure that that enforcement is happening with those areas. So that's the biggest question that I'm getting from residents is what are we doing to make sure that we're enforcing that. So I'm just wondering what the, the long term plan as we move forward, you and, and HRP have to collaborate on on those zones. One of the, the you know, the, the bigger issues um, aside from pedestrian safety is, is the paint. You know, I've, I've slipped on the paint myself in a crosswalk uh, during some wet weather. So and not just the what's happening in our crosswalk, but also the durability of the paint for our streets as well. We, we see areas where you can not sometimes not even see the line. So I'm just wondering what our future planning is for that. I know you mentioned a little bit about that, so I just wonder if you can expand a little bit more on on our on our durability when it comes to paint um, as well. Uh, also mentioned around the the campaign uh, heads up Halifax. I think. You know, it might have been 2016 or 17, Brett, correct me if I'm wrong, the day, I forget which year that we started that campaign. It might be worthwhile for us to do a revamp of, of that and, and look at what messaging we want to get out there because it was it was great and, and, still, and, and still has some uh, impact, but I think we need to, you know, with us looking at towards zero, we, we might need to revamp because um, that wasn't in place when we did heads up. So it might be time for us to, to relook at, at, at that in, in regarding that, I'm wondering with the towards zero uh, for 2038, I believe, where are we in terms of looking at the future? Are we, are we on target, using quotations here, are we on target to meet that or, or yeah, just any, any update on that, on that, on that date there. Um, really quickly as mentioned around the RA8 in principle, great. 
in <laughs> in uh, initiation, uh, not so great. You know, I lost, I think I had one, I might've had two in my district, but one for sure that was lost within the week. And, you know, installing those things are, 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 are harder than, than, than they look. So I know residents love the idea, but they just didn't, didn't last. And that's really because the drivers, drivers, we, we know that drivers don't pay attention. The, the biggest thing that we've heard today is pedestrian safety. And, you know, coming here 2016, really seeing since 16 until now that, that staff, because of the leadership from council and also from, from staff taking it seriously, that we've seen, uh, we've seen that become a priority with, with, with benefit. But we're also still seeing, you know, the tra tragedies and, and deaths that are hap happening because of um, uh, the, more, the work that is needed, but also the education that's needed for drivers as well. So I, I really hope that as we move forward, we continue to prioritize this and that, you know, as, as you said, it, Brad, your staff are 100 percent committed and, and council, we need to make sure that we're holding you to the fire and, and continue to get that work done to, to, to better what's needed with our residents. So I'll let you take, take it away and I'll, I'll, I might come back for some, some other points. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, right. Mr. Anguish. All right, my, my notes, I'm just looking back at my notes and I go, oh my Lord, I didn't put them in the form of a question. Um, so I think the 40 kilometer hour zones, uh, certainly, we work with the police to obviously let them know that uh, the zones are going in, uh, when they're going in, and the timing. Um, they, of course, uh, work. You know, they they dealt they develop their tactics, and so you know we trust that they carry out those tactics. So we're not always in the know of exactly how they're going about enforcing that new zone, other than we do know that it's it's in place and that uh, they you know, that they've been given the heads up and they, they've developed their tactics from there. So um, that question may be based, best placed with the chief and with the commission. Um, that's as much as we know. Um, I will again highlight that the, the police uh, senior members of the traffic divisions that do sit, both RCMP and HRP at the table on the road safety committee. Um, and we look forward, their input is critical to guiding, guiding what we do going forward. <clears throat> there, are, there are eyes and ears. Uh, and as you know, they have their own challenges with, with keeping sufficient resources in their traffic units uh, to meet, I guess, community expectation. And that's, that's been well established through the previous presentations. Fine. In terms of the, the paint, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, certainly we're back to a full paint program this year. Um, we do use glass bead in our paint to, to increase friction in, in all the right areas. Uh, you know, it's, it's still slippery when it's wet. Uh, end of story. Uh, you know, it, people get hurt from time to time on slipping, which is why one of the concerns or why we're moving with caution with the durable markings, because that is, if we've had any feedback from our partners across the country, that is the key feedback. So we're moving carefully in that direction and monitoring results. Um, certainly full, full paint program this year. I guess the one thing I will highlight uh, where there is, we are a little nervous. We participate in a very large uh, paint economy of scale, if you will, with maritime provinces. And we have been indicating, and there is an indicating uh, indication that our contractor was impacted by the events in Texas. We are watching it closely. Uh, a little concerned about paint supply being here on time, because as you know, it is absolutely critical. We get a rapid start to our season. And so we're keeping an eye on that. We have no reason to be concerned at this time. However, um, we expect to be able to do our full, we certainly budgeted for our full season. In terms of heads up Halifax, um, yeah. So that that program has morphed, if you will, to this, this uh, more flexible approach of monthly themes. I think based on the feedback today, the best thing I may be able to do from, for council to, to really get engagement is to I'm going to talk to Breton about distributing the themes uh, to councils. You can see what the upcoming monthly themes are. We obviously, as, as you pointed out, another council pointed out, look, this, this, our best feedback comes from councillors and the citizens who know their communities best. So we'll, we'll get that out there. Um, and, and show how it's working now and, and welcome your feedback, uh, absolutely. Uh, so I'll do that. 
um, as a result of this presentation today. In terms of towards zero, are we on target? That's difficult. Certainly, we had a 23% reduction in, in, in fatal and in injury collisions, of course, that you could argue achieved the 20% towards zero target, but no way can where we're counting the COVID year and nobody's going to rest. We are all pedals to the metal on this um, terrible, terrible analogy, uh, but we are, uh, um, you know, there's nobody resting on this one. Um, and, you know, even if we were to get back to zero fatalities, it's still about the hundreds of collisions that are still happening. So, it's, you know, we got a long way to go uh, to get there, but I am, you know, if, if I was to look at one thing between council's leadership and, and, and the resources that council's authorizing towards this and the implementation to the street, we are getting a lot of attention from around the country, if that's any kind of indicator that, you know, we're really moving in a number of directions at once and gaining attention. And I think we are having impact. I think we've got the right measurement system in place. I think we have the right goal in place from council. And we've got the commitment from resources from our council. I can tell you not all our colleagues across the country have that kind of commitment. So, um, and then as far as the RA8s go, yes, you know firsthand that did not work out. <laughs> so we'll be, uh, we'll be looking for a different, uh, a different uh, uh, approach that's more durable. But, uh, you know, it underscored our commitment to pilot programs, I think, is by giving it a try. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, hey, I want someone to start going to give Brad a break right now or, or, or later on. So, just <laughs> looking up for my constituent. <laughs> it is, it is uh, 2 17. If you would like to uh, consider a break right now, we can, or, or we could uh, take oh, a break at 2 30. Three o'clock? Let's get to it. Yeah, yeah. Brad gets big bucks, he can handle it. Fair enough. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Hensby. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to share some of the comments uh, by Councillor Lovelace in regards to the uh, pending provincial transfer of roads. I know it's not till, not till next year, so it's not have no direct uh, budgetary issue right now, but I'm pretty sure we'll probably be pre-hiring some people before that time uh, to review the the, uh, the inventory list, you know, I'm pretty sure the state of good repair of the provincial assets is not going to be very pleasant. I can tell you from the roads I know, uh, it should be a scary uh, inventory. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how negotiations are going to be going, but I'm kind of wondering, uh, will there be any compensation to go along with this uh, transfer of roads? Or do we just take it over at uh, lock, stock and barrel with nothing to show for it? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. Um, also, with the, the communication strategy with Halifax Water and the, and the dreaded ditch tax, that's what people call it. Some people call it stormwater management fee. It's a ditch tax. And we got to make sure that the, the new territories that we'll be assuming are fully aware that this comes with the price. And that's, uh, and that's part of it. But I'm also hoping that we also have an increased service uh, level, too, that we're then we have experience with the province. Because I can tell you, um, ever since we took over the uh, performance-based contracting for snow removal and ice control in the Lawrencetown areas has been night and day, in my opinion, from the amount of calls I used to get to what I get now. But there has been some uh, uh, bumps along the way in regards to having new drivers who are not familiar with the territory and geography and stuff. So I find that, uh, you know, there's growing pains with new contractor uh, employees, but it seems to work out in the long run. But... Um, I'm also looking forward to the cost share paving projects. Uh, I understand that uh, you and I have had a discussion about what's going to be done this year. I and some other residents in the Porters Lake area are not very happy because of, they were hoping that they would be on the uh, consideration list this year. But I understand the logic of why pro the staff want to move forward because if we don't get these streets done now in the East Preston Lake Echo area, we will not be getting any co provincial contribution uh, after next year. So I understand and appreciate that. And it, it kind of defers the, the Porters Lake cluster is hoping to get done to another year. So I'm hoping that in the future, we will be having a way to look at these clustering of streets. And I'm also hoping that the province will be a little more uh, open with us in regards to their capital upgrades. Uh, from time to time, it's great to couple these projects with their tenders. But that's why to get some uh, valuable um, economies of scale. 
I'm very pleased to see the uh, Kane Street in North Preston being re refurbished, as well as the inclusion of a storm stormwater system, as well as a sidewalk to, to connect the school to the to the daycare and rec center. I think that's going to be a vast safety improvement for the for the children in that particular uh, neighborhood. So I'm looking forward to seeing that getting done. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but uh, I also want to talk about the Ross Road alignment. You know, the realignment of Ross Road has been long overdue. It's a priority of mine. Brad, you know you got to travel through that intersection at least twice a day, coming and going from home to work. And uh, you know how dangerous it has been. I see the new owners are now in the process of demolishing the, the, the buildings that are on site. They're now the, um, taking them apart, uh, stripping them down, the source separating them, the waste properly. So hopefully we'll have a, a clean site to look at in the near future. But the biggest thing is we need to get on with the negotiations and make sure it's acquired as quickly as possible. The corridor uh, designed, ready to go with a shovel ready project as, as soon as we can, because it's been long, long, long overdue. Um, in regards to uh, the solid waste, um, I'll be putting a motion forward in regards to uh, a staff report looking at the, the um, cost implications or savings of going to a bi-weekly blue bag. Perhaps it could be a one-year pilot to see what kind of response there is with the general public and to see if that is, um, uh, and also engage the community in regards to uh, what kind of feedback we'll get from them on a service adjustment. So I'd like to put that motion forward. It's time for the blue bag. I'll second that. Uh, Councillor Hensby, are you putting that forward now with uh, Mr. Anguish to come back later for the, uh, for the other issues or? Well, I'll put that on the floor now because I thought it was getting close to my five minute uh, timing. So I thought, you are. so I thought I'd at least put the motion on the floor and see if it gets uh, passed or not. And then I have a, a ton of other questions, but I'll come back on the speaker's list at another time. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about the uh, blue bag first, uh, Mr. Anguish. I presume you have the rest of the issues uh, recorded so that you can uh, come back and respond to them. Uh, the motion on the floor, uh, moved by Councillor Hensby, seconded by Councillor Lovelace, is that the budget committee request a briefing note detailing measures and implications for reducing weekly uh, blue bag collection to a bi-weekly service with a proposed 2021-22 transportation and public works budget for consideration in the parking lot as an operating under budget option. Uh, please indicate if you would uh, like to speak to that uh, by typing your name in the chat. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Oh, just briefly, I think the motion that Ian put in there doesn't capture the part where Councillor Hensby said it would be one year with public engagement and that we would measure uh, both, you know, the, the, the the outcomes and the outcomes that I think, you know, like can candidly, Cander Councillor Lace, Lovelace and Councillor Hensby and myself have all been texting back and forth about this is, uh, you know, we want to know if uh, diversion at the tip face goes down, right, that's bad. If we go to every two weeks and we have more garbage going to landfill, that would that would end the pilot. And and litter, as Councillor Kent raised, was is an issue, right? We want to measure complaints about that. So uh, I think that those two pieces need to be in there. Uh, and and then we should go ahead and ask for the briefing note about uh, assuming that those two things could be in there. So, uh, you know, it, it, well, those two things don't have to be there. But David did say that the mo the motion should talk about uh, evaluation as pilot. So uh, perhaps we could have it updated. Uh, it there has you go. Been, it is updated. Yeah, it, it is updated that. to include the uh, one year pilot. I don't see any. Public engagement uh, measurement options is enough, I think. Like, I think perfect. that's fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think Councillor uh, Mason has pretty much covered everything uh, that I was going to say. I, you know, my concern is around uh, the diversion uh, rates and also uh, potential for illegal dumping. Uh, so as long as that's included here, um, I'm good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Purdy, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. I, I see that this 
this could potentially be a, a good thing. I can't support this because I cannot support taxes going up and services going down. I, I just don't see how those two things can go together. So I'm not trying to be difficult. I, I appreciate the, I appreciate what this means, but I, I can't support it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question for Brad, um, and maybe uh, I don't have it right in front of me at the second. Um, the this is eight hundred for eight hundred fifty thousand for savings, the same as the green bin. Oh, sorry, uh, most problems there. Nothing related to green bins. Uh, yeah, uh, 850, that would be the annual savings. Now, just to be clear, depending on when we can get to this, this year, um, the savings in this year for the balance of the year would probably be more like in the area of 400,000. Um, and again, when does a one year pilot start? When does it end? These are things I'm gonna to have to work with team on to understand what, our, what is our current contract flexibility. I think it's all doable, but we're gonna to have to sort out the details, but yes, for loose planning, um, you know, the balance of this fiscal would be about, a, we'll say $400,000 savings with, with 850 if we were to continue uh, on an annual basis. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess maybe the numbers the part that's not making sense to me. So uh, reducing summer green bins uh, saves us 850. Reducing blue bins saves us 850. But that truck is driving around picking up the blue bins on a biweekly schedule the entire year, whereas the truck for the green bins is only doing that biweekly for the summer. So wouldn't the savings for the blue be much more significant? These are negotiated, so to, to go back to, these are negotiated prices as part of a five-year deal, right? So it was, it was a complex negotiation. So not everything in this package is going to line up, um, you know, as, as easy as that. So it would be different if we could just start from ground zero and add service as a house by house base, but that's, that's not how these contracts were negotiated. So these are, these are guaranteed negotiated savings, so to speak. And so the target, those, those prices are fixed in the contracts. Okay, well, I'll support this for a briefing note, but I think that's one thing that's worth thinking about folks, um, dollar for dollar, um, if, if those numbers hold, we get more savings out of the summer green bin, we lose four months of service and get 850 back, whereas getting back 850 on the blue bin is you're giving up the service for the for the year so you know for the for what you lose you get less back on the blue so uh, i'll support this looking as a staff report and you know maybe we can refine that up a little bit more thank you okay thank you very much uh councillor out there uh, thank you, Chair, and I will support this going for a briefing you note. Know, I think folks will find that this is a lot less controversial than the green bin. Um, what I'm wondering, and Brad, you touched on this when you were answering Sam, but I mean, if it takes a while to implement it, then we want to do a pilot, then we might want to take it again out of the pilot, uh, out of the pilot, as a result of the pilot not being good. I mean, how much flexibility are we going to have with this hokey pokey of in and out and back and forth with the, uh, with the contract there? So I'm just a little concerned about that. Yeah, and, and, and that's fair, and I'm going to have to answer that in the briefing note, Councillor, because I don't yeah. know. We're going to have to sit down and look at our contract language. Certainly, we didn't contemplate a pilot. That doesn't mean we can't do it. Um, but, you know, this was kind of, you're kind of in or you're out, uh, so to speak, yeah. these prices. But, I, you know, look, I, I, I'm... I'm going with this today. I wouldn't put it. If, I wouldn't put it forward. I wouldn't walk away with it. I didn't think we could get back to you with a reasonable briefing note. So, yeah, no, so, that's fine. As long as it covers that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so here's where we're going to find out that I do not put the garbage out. My husband does. Um, if the blue bag is reduced, is there a, a limit to a number of bags? If it went from weekly to biweekly, is there a limit by the number of bags that can be put out? Uh, great question. Again, I'll, I'll answer that in the briefing note, if you don't mind. I don't think the limits change uh, as a result of this decision but uh and i think i'm being reassured they won't so that is a consideration when we come back to debate this for sure we'll make sure that's included in the briefing note great point counselor 
Thank you. And then just as a quick follow up, if I may, um, earlier in the conversation, there was a concern around the blue bags being, um, I think Councillor Kent um, and Lovelace talked about sometimes the blue bags are um, blowing all over the road, uh, contributing to litter, getting into ditches, that kind of stuff. Um, is the perception that if we went to bi-weekly that that would be a, a reduction in those kinds of experiences? I'm just curious and maybe our fellow counselors could answer that for me. If I can step in, one of the things I regularly do is tie the two blue bags together. They are far less likely to blow around. I'm not sure if anybody else would uh, like to respond to that, uh, but... Uh, I'll respond, but I, we're already bi-weekly and it's still happening and it's still a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon, do you have anything further on that? No? Okay, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, my question actually was very similar to uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon's. It was about kind of the quantity. And, you know, I, I actually see this as a potential success down the road, particularly when we get, you know, if and, and when of being hopeful um, EPR, and there's just a reduction in the amount of recycling that we have. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I know from my experience, I, I actually have more recycling that goes out than I do garbage um, if I was to do it every two weeks. For some people, storage becomes an issue. Where do you, where do you store all that? Um, those darn blue bags blowing around, wouldn't it be nice if uh, if we could do this with proper blue carts, right? And you have a bigger space and you can put your stuff in there. Um, so I, I'm in that briefing note, Brad, I'm just wondering if you could kind of, um, you know, just at a high level even, just talk about some of the other external factors that might contribute to making biweekly blue um, recyclables uh, pick up work, um, you know, looking at, at some of, you know, what happens if we have EPR and there's a reduction, looking at, you know, potentially moving to those blue carts or, or other or other things. Because um, I, 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 you know, it is a significant cost savings, but it has to, it has to work for people. And, um, you know, I'd be interested to see in that pilot, like how well, how well that actually works with, you um, if you're in an apartment and you've got oodles or, you know, I guess apartments don't even recycle, do they? But depending where you live, like where you do with all of that recycling um, can be extraordinary some weeks. So that was just my, that was just my comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you. So I just want to reiterate that uh, there are many communities in HRM that are already recycling, uh, you know, having pickup every two weeks uh, and managing just fine. Uh, I, you know, and I think it's it's great to see the changes uh, that um, our waste folks have made to the Halifax.ca website to include the updated information about which recycling bins uh, are acceptable for pickup and which are not. You know, the, the, the blue bins that have the wheels are not acceptable, whereas the other blue bins are. And so, you know, I think while I understand it, it may be difficult for some folks as to, you know, where are they going to store uh, their recycling? Certainly that is a, a real concern. Um, but there are ways to, uh, to mitigate that. And uh, we're doing it across HRM already. And I look forward to uh, receiving the staff report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. So <clears throat> it's funny on this one, um, you know, there are no bag limits for blue bags. So you could put out as much as possible. In terms of storage, one would argue that it's a lot easier to store some rinsed out bottles and cans than it is to store your green cart. And so I think when the, the briefing notes come back, although the, the green cart one passed, um, you know, there's a, a number of people that could look at this on balance and say, well, <clears throat> do we, do we, do we want to have the green carts? Do we want to have the blue bags on a biweekly basis or maybe both? I mean, my, I, I could certainly do both. And I think this is one of those ones where again, um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just about what your priorities are. And I think, you know, these are some areas that are healthy to have discussions around to see if in fact, you know, if we can save 850 here and 850 there, to Councillor Purdy's point, 
um, it's not about just reducing services and increasing taxes. The way the budget was going, we were increasing taxes and holding services. But we've got now an increasing number of items on the budget adjustment list to do extra services. And so if you want those extras, you got to cut somewhere. So you might look at it as saying, hey, I'm, I'm reducing services, but you're reducing some services and increasing others. And that's the challenge of government is what are the things that our residents want? What are the things they absolutely need? And how can we provide them in the most efficient way possible? So I'm looking forward to seeing this coming back. What I would like to see in there though, um, and this goes to some of the points that Councillor Lovelace and others had about storage, and that is uh, perhaps we could have some information around things like, and I don't know how easy this is to do, but how full are people's blue bags now? I mean, anecdotally, what I see in the neighborhood is they're half full on a weekly basis meaning that on a biweekly basis, they'd only be full. And so maybe storage isn't a big deal, uh, but I don't know if we know right now an average weight or an average number of bags per resident. If we do have any of that kind of data, if that could come back in the briefing note, that would be useful as well. And I see Mr. Anguish nodding his head. So anything that we do have, that would be helpful for the decision. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead, uh, Councillor Purdy. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say I really appreciate this uh, discussion, and I think I am interested to read a briefing note. So um, I'm interested to see what the what the recommendations will be. Okay, so thanks. Super. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any further speakers in the chat, so I'm going to hand it over uh, to the clerk uh, for the vote. Um, just as a reminder, the motion is that the Budget Committee request a briefing note detailing measures and implications for reducing weekly recycling blue bag collection to a bi-weekly service, including a process for a one-year pilot project and public engagement slash measurement options within the proposed 2021-22 Transportation and Public Works budget for consideration in the parking lot as an operating under budget option. So over to the clerk. Beginning with District 8, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. For the motion. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. Fifteen, Chair Russell. In favor. Deputy Mayor Outhit. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Mayor Savage. Yep. Yes. So that motion barely passes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Let's take a 15 minute break. It is 2.38. So let's uh, see everybody back here at uh, 2.55. As a reminder, please just join this link again if you're gonna leave. We will be muting everyone's microphones and everyone's cameras during the course of the break.
Mr. Chair, we are sending everyone live right now and unmuting and starting videos. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody back. Uh, and not all of us can restart our videos yet. But I'd like to welcome everybody back and uh, we are over to Mr. Anguish for uh, responding to the questions that uh, Councillor Hensby brought forward uh, just before the break. Go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, basically, I believe there were three key pieces. The road transfer, um, Yes, we are obviously in the big negotiations without getting into the details of it. Obviously, given that the condition of the potential condition of the assets of which we've asked for reports, uh, and we are getting cooperation, good cooperation from the province, but they don't have reports on everything. Obviously, we will not be looking to take everything as is, where is, and making strides to get as much protection for the municipality. Uh, we have no reason to believe there won't be a reasonable agreement there. Uh, in terms of getting ready for the transfer, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, three uh, new hires from the operating cost of capital planned later in this year, so having minimum impact on this year's budget. Um, in terms of what the standard will be in those uh, new areas that we inherit, uh, those will be at HRM standards uh, wherever possible. And yes, there absolutely will be some growing pains, no two questions there, but because um, it has been difficult for the province to staff those areas as well, uh, staff or, or contract those areas as well. So, but we're hoping our scale and our approach with our contractors will get us uh, will get us up fully up to the HRM standards as are in other areas. Cost year paving uh, projects, um, they're picked on condition based. Uh, this year being the exception, as the councillor pointed out, we focused on those areas that would be transferring to us and using that leverage to get uh, good value for dollars. So, but otherwise on a go forward basis, we typically do it through condition-based assessment. And yes, clustering is a factor. So trying to get best economies of scale when we do go out into uh, suburban and rural areas uh, in terms of mobilization costs. Finally, the Ross Road realignment, I'll defer to Kelly's presentation for the, for the, for the the most of that. Um, what I can say is that Tasso is working uh, with the province on potentially reducing the speed through that zone. Um, uh, one of the conditions we have is that the best practice says there shouldn't be more of a 30, more than a 30 kilometer an hour change between zones. So we're working with the province to get them to reduce on the other side of the boundary, if you will, a uh, little salmon or salmon river. So um, Tasso is working actively with the province to do that. And you have probably already noted that the province did step up. They have cut back the sight lines to the entrance uh, North Preston uh, turnoff and uh, in vastly improving the sight lines. And as of yesterday, I saw a dynamic uh, speed display sign put up by the province there as well to really improve uh, certainly the ability to enter in the highway from North Preston. Uh, East, East Preston, East Preston. I apologize, East Preston, absolutely. That's it, thank you. I think I've answered your questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's go over to Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Brad and your staff um, for this presentation and all the hard work that you do. Um, as a new counselor, I found your staff very friendly and very helpful and knowledgeable. Um, I get responses on the weekend too, um, as uh, noted by Deputy Mayor. Uh, and I think that's wonderful. I'm you know, sending off emails thinking I'm not gonna hear and then Sunday morning, there's a response. It's just wonderful. And my um, constituents appreciate that as well. Um, I'm very happy that uh, two of the areas that I have that are within uh, school zones have been, have, oh, sorry, have had their speed limits lowered to 40. Well done, well done, thank you. You know, there are a few more streets, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's nice to see these ones done. One question I do have though, is your staff supervisors, do they monitor uh, contractors? Um, when they do the street blocking and the detour signs and accident prevention, 
and I refer to this because of, if you remember um, earlier, la later, I guess, in last year, there was a little boy that almost got hit um, during the plowing of a school zone. Um, it was part of a repaving project on James Street. And I know um, I had not only that incident, which was a close call and very sad, I got a lot of calls about it, but also uh, other residents were talking about the um, detour signs. It would detour one street and then you go around and then out the street would be detoured. And then you go, it was like a complete circle. Like nobody had an, any idea where they were going and how to get out of it. So I'm just wondering on those two respects, if you could let me know um, how your staff overlooks contractors. My other question is, um, is there any way we could get contractors to add speed zones to their priority list? I know um, the um, contracts go out and technically, you know, for most part, they do them in order that they're received. But I once again refer to James Street. Um, it was supposed to be paved in the summer when school was closed. And for whatever reason, it ended up being done in September, of course, when the kids were back in. Um, this all happened from what I understand because the contractor was behind. So in that case, wouldn't it be possible for him to bump the school project up and perhaps leave something else? I'm not sure how that works with the contractor, but I just thought maybe I'd throw that out as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anguish. Yeah, uh, excellent questions. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, there's lots of pressures on our budget. Look, one area that, you know, we could use infinitely more resources in is in construction inspection. Um, that said, uh, we keep a close eye on the infractions. Um, we are concerned. Um, there, you know, COVID was a, was a challenging year because we were full tilt with 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 construction. Yet it was a bit of an odd year in terms of availability of certain functions. Long story short, uh, our construction inspectors are, are few in number, but they try to get around to every site. Uh, as well, we have our uh, municipal planning supervisors who get out as well, and and they are looking left and right. Uh, when they're looking at their own jobs because they go out and look at state of good repair of, of, of much of our infrastructure. But of course, they're also keeping an eye on construction sites. So it's hard to be everywhere all the time. Um, and But certainly when we do get reports, they're pushed through 311 quickly and there will be an inspector on site as soon as we're aware of an issue. But they can and absolutely do happen. Um, it's unfortunate. We do have an education program and a bit of a kickoff to our season with our contractors about these types of things. In terms of each project, they each have a pedestrian management plan uh, and a detour plan. So again, we'll have to dig into the particular project you're speaking of. It, it, it sounds like it was very miserable. Um, which, which seems odd, which typically, if it's our project, we've approved the plans um, and, and they should be acceptable. So uh, we'll dig into that a little more. Um, in terms of, so that's, uh, and then in terms of uh, moving the work, yeah. Well, last year was a very difficult year. Uh, it certainly does happen that a contractor will overcommit. That is not unheard of um, in our environment and they will get behind schedule. We certainly do, no different than we do with painting and, and any other project related to schools. Every, everybody's warned quickly that, you know, the work is to be done by September. It's not always possible. Again, I don't know the particulars of this one and, and what happened with that contractor, but uh, certainly what I can say is when we know it's school work, uh, no different than we highlighted in our briefing note last night to council. We'll do everything we can to try and make sure that those school zone uh, vertical deflections are in for September so that they have impact in the year they're intended. Um, so I apologize. I don't know the specifics of this particular project other than to say that we do certainly alert contractors to these issues. We manage them as best we can. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Anguish and your staff and uh, for the great presentation. It is such an extensive business unit, transportation and public works. It just feels like there is so much 
So the value of coming 14th on the speakers list is that uh, our call, my colleagues have very nicely covered a lot of my questions. Um, I do have a few left over though. Oh, but first I wanted to say a shout out to Stephen York. So as a new counselor going through the first winter, that gentleman has been a godsend. He has just been so good, so responsive, getting back to us uh, with all those issues. I just need to say patience of Job he has. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, now onto some of the questions. So around the trees and the power on lines, I'm just wondering if the pruning schedule, is that based on you know a budget and what can be done or is it based on need? Um, because I do know that in our district, quite a few power outages are a result of trees and then freezing and affecting the, the power lines. So there, that was one question. The similar to early this morning, Councillor Blackburn's question around um, school zones and parking and what's happened with the uh, changes there. I know that um, on the Fall River Road, it is ridiculous to see what's happening around the junior high school there you're coming up on a little bit of a blind crest getting into the school. And so it, it, it is very, very concerning, um, especially now that they've added uh, pre-primary into that uh, space. And still with schools around the traffic calming, the briefing note, I do know that in Dutch settlement, there's been a lot of concerns there around their elementary school and speeding. And, and, speeding. and I actually didn't see that anywhere on the list. So I was just wondering if the briefing notes um, covered schools uh, in the outlining areas of HRM as well, just to make sure that they were on the list. With respect to the speed radar signs, I know that there were a couple um, that were bought by the previous district capital funds, previous councillor, and one has gone up in Fall River, and we were told that the other two would come up. And somewhere in your presentation, I thought, or in the conversation, I thought I heard it said that we can make a recommendation but I was told that traffic services determines where those speed radar signs go. We might make a recommendation, but it's really up to them to decide. So, and they have certain metrics that they use. Uh, so just a clarification on that, uh, if we could. Um, and then the only other thing is that the Waverly Road, we're coming up to spring and summer and the cyclists and the runners love the Waverly Road and it is treacherous. Um, even when I was campaigning, you know, there was a couple of times that I almost got hit and I was walking on a very, very narrow shoulder. Like it's, it's scary. Um, and the amounts of emails that I'm getting, even now, spring is starting. How are we going to keep uh, the Waverly Road pedestrians, residents, cyclists safe? So if there is any kind of a plan that uh, is coming forward uh, around that, I would be very happy because we really don't want to see a fatality. So those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anguish. Okay. Uh, actually, Councillor, I just want to pick up on one of your early questions. You asked about the bag limits, and I apologize. I didn't give a very clear answer on that. I was so busy worried about the contract uh, language around the blue bag program. I, as Councillor clearly stated, I just want to reinforce, there are no limits on blue bag now, and I want to reinforce that for the public so they're recycling the max possible and there would be no limits going forward if we change the uh if we were to go bi-weekly across the municipality so i just want to drive that home uh in terms of uh the budget and priority for um uh tree pruning uh, basically that is a priority based system it does rotate through the municipality and it is limited by budget so it's kind of all of the above what i'm going to ask uh, bev and our urban force to do is follow up with you to let you know what you may expect uh in your area um and just just touch base so you understand what uh, what may be coming in terms of uh you asked about the briefing note uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the briefing note and the Dutch settlement and school and traffic calming. So the parameters for the briefing note on traffic calming were very uh, clear and, and very confined from council. And that was we were to look at everything that was on the existing request list of council. So, um, and this is one aspect of the AO that we're, we're going to try and clarify with council going forward. So if that settlement wasn't on that list, I suspect it either didn't have a request or it didn't quite rate high enough. But again, 
we'll follow up. I suspect it's the former that it just wasn't, it's not on the, uh, it wasn't on the list, but I, we will check and follow up with you. Um, because again, under the current AO, traffic calm street needs to be requested either by a resident or by the counselor. Um, in terms of the uh, display signs, yes, a lot of confusion about that. We're gonna be coming out with written, uh, written guidance around that. Um, you're correct. I did suggest that uh, councillors submit. We, you know, at the end of the day, we know you have pressures. Um, it is an evidence-based system because we want to deploy these signs for maximum impact. So we are asking, uh, you know, our staff to consider councillors' requests and then get back to them with the evidence base if we're if we're not proceeding with that area at that time. One of the challenges with speed display signs is you can get uh, the area can get. The area or the regional municipality can get saturated with the signs to the point where they're completely ineffective. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that they're deployed on an evidence-based uh, uh, evidence system in the right areas at the right time, but it does not negate uh, the input that we would hope to receive from counselors on this. And we do receive that input from counselors. So um, again, we'll be coming out with written guidance so we can straighten that out because um, there are other questions around the display signs that have also uh, come up and we're trying to clarify for everyone. So I think I've answered all your questions. At least I hope so. Um, the Waverly Road. Oh, um, in terms of Waverly, I'm not sure. Uh, basically, if there was no traffic, certainly in terms of, I hope you received your list of uh, projects, uh, capital projects that you're receiving for your community. Yeah, if there was nothing on there, then there's nothing planned of a capital nature. Um, and that's uh, that's what I have now. I'll check with staff to see if there's anything further on Waverly Road, but uh, that's all I have at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mason for your second time. Yeah, okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So Brad, I'm gonna try and very quickly go through all three buckets. On capacity for large projects, um, there's a couple of areas that I have concerns, well, and capacity in general, actually. Large projects are, uh, I worry that uh, we're not able to keep pace with the active transportation that I already mentioned. And, and, I, and with respect to what the solicitor said after my last question, I'm not looking for a over and under option. I just want to know like what is the pacing, the, the planned rollout for the next three years for the regional center bike lanes. And I think that should just be a, a memo like the one that we just got on uh, the uh, like the budget briefing item on uh, need and pool. I just want to. I, I need to be able to tell the public what's what, what's happening. So so that's an ask. But but more more broadly, we you know the Herring Cove functional plan will be a TSC uh, on uh, on uh, Thursday, and I think that a lot of the the councilors are going to push that we don't put that off five years. Like I would just I would find a way to borrow the money and get some federal funds and do it right. And same with Bedford. Same with Windsor Street Exchange. I didn't make a big deal of it during Capital because it's the COVID year, but I'm not comfortable waiting till Cogswell is done uh, because the city is going to be 550,000 people in 2030 and 660,000 people in 2040. And, and, and we're now talking about putting some of these critical uh, transportation things that are essential for uh, connecting the suburbs to, to the employment areas properly off by three and four and five and seven and eight years. And, and so I worry about capacity in the uh, engineer shop, you know, Ann Sherwood and her folks. Uh, secondarily, I also worry about uh, capacity in the sign shop after how long it took to get things up during uh, the parking changes. So those are my capacity concerns on vision zero and safety and all that stuff. Uh, I think we need to start with communicating that the 80% by 20 uh, in, in five years, reducing f fatalities and serious injuries by 20% is, uh, is not the end goal. Right, like that, that, that are because we're being hammered on social media all day about that because it's being perceived that that's the goal. Uh, I think we need to change the APS stickers to say you don't have to press them during the day because we're getting a lot of confusion about that where we've gone to pedestrian recall. The uh, road safety, uh, you know, is the list on the memo we got for school zones. It says these are the additional school zones. I don't think we have a list of the school zones that are being 
proposed for next year. The only one in my area that would get done is Walnut Street. And, and it was being talked about by staff and I don't see it on the additional list, but I think it's on the original list. So some clarity there. And uh, and I guess I will have to come back, Mr. Chair, because I see I'm down to 15 seconds. But but I think on the road safety piece, you know, it's amazing work that's happening this year. Uh, there's you know we're we're talking about doing almost as much stuff this year as we've done in the last three years on that slide, and that's amazing, and we should be proud of that. But there's still more that's going to come. People want to talk about signal controls and right and left turns. People want to go back and revisit the red red light, uh, no no right turn on red light, which is a report that's coming that Councillor Cleary asked for. Uh, so I managed to do two of the buckets. My concern is about capacity to be able to deliver those changes with road safety. Uh, and I'll come back, I guess, for the third one, the funding gap. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anguish. Again, all great questions. It's kind of intimidating today. I've done this a long time, but I'm getting. Uh, so I just want to come back. I apologize. I, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammons, just really got my number today. I answered her somewhat wrong on Dutch settlement. Look, Dutch settlement uh, to make matters worse, Councillor. Uh, uh, the AO pertains to HRM uh, streets for traffic calming. So where Dutch settlement is uh, provincial, uh, that's that's why you're not seeing that. Um, we can uh, we can double back with you uh, to talk about what we might be able to do there or work with the province to do there. So I apologize for that confusion. Uh, hard to keep it all straight sometimes. Uh, in terms of AAA bike network, I hear you, Councillor. We'll get a note done, uh, basically laying out the kind of framework for the remainder of the project, potential timelines, and make sure it's up on a website so it can be uh, it's not a one-time note. Um, Look, your point about the large projects, you know, this is this is probably my most frustrating challenge as a, as a member of staff and, and working with council. Um, and certainly Jane's well aware of it. And, and you know, if if we want to move faster and we want the resources there to do it, it requires council to amend the four year capital plan this year, next year, whenever, kind of late this year, but to really press those decisions because we get into that endless loop that uh, Councillor Outhit had brought up at one point where council wants to add more money at the last minute and we just don't have the resources to push it. And that is not a state we want to be in. Conversely, we don't want to roll on a lot of staff and a lot of uh, you know fixed costs to the municipality if we're not going to have that workload. So it is a, it is a two-way street. We have to work with you to understand how fast you want to move. And I look forward to those discussions. Right now, we are scaled to deal with the next uh, four-year plan. We have, uh, within transportation, we, go, we look out a little bit further. We actually have looked out as far as 10 years, not in complete detail. Are we concerned that we're not moving fast enough on the corridors? Yes, we are. But as you know, we're balancing that against the gap on the state of good repair on our bridges, on our appetite for AT increases and, and all the other. And so again, that that is a difficult one. So it is, but it is driven by budget and it's, you know, the earliest we can get the indication the council is gonna ramp up, if you will, it's capital output in the transportation areas, you know, we'll move quickly as a staff to deliver um, and, and ramp up as well. Vision zero. Yes, absolutely, and I'm I'm sorry to hear that the thinking is is that 20% is good enough because that never has that is not what Vision Zero is, um, but what sets HRM apart is we have set more or less a roadmap. Staff have had the same question: When do we engage council on the next layer goal, um, or or I'll possibly even change this goal? Um, so that we're constantly looking out and challenging ourselves. That's why I reinforced in this budget, um, the results are what they are right now after a COVID year. It has not changed. We've taken every dollar that we feel was available. We've allocated it. And of course, we've uh, got back too quickly with the briefing note. And, and if there's a desire to push further faster, we're absolutely standing by to, to execute on that. Um, like I say, it's all about it's all about the availability of the money. Uh, Ped, recall just quickly because uh, I think I missed this question with Councillor Purdy. Um, pedestrian recall is basically, uh, as I think Councillor Mason will appreciate, this is to eliminate the need to press the bank button, and that is to have the pedestrian walk up, press the button, and 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 wait for the traffic to stop. 
head recall essentially puts uh, eliminates the need to press a button, puts the puts the pedestrian signal on a schedule, and it will go and uh, put the pedestrian uh, walk on whether there's pedestrians there or not. And so we are pushing to move that from 38% uh, to. I've got it to about 72 or 78 percent of our network. Just to be clear, um, that that initiative to move to PED recall will happen and roll out in the spring, and there will be a lot of uh, communication to go with it, so the residents aren't confused. Um, essentially, there'll be a sticker at the push button indicating they will not need to press a button between the hours of 6 a.m. and midnight. Um, and like I say, the only areas left in municipality that won't be on pedestrian recall are those key corridors, uh, transportation corridors, where we need to keep traffic moving in order not to, uh, you know, lock the lock the two unnecessarily. In terms of school zones, if I wrote down school zone. I'm not sure what the question was. I apologize. The, the complete list, including proposed oh. ones and and then additional ones, because I, well, I don't have a single list. Well, it's funny. And interestingly enough, I realized that last night when I was reviewing the briefing note. I don't think we ever told you what the what the first list was. So I don't think so either. <laughs> we'll get the total list though. Thank you. That's great. I'll I'll come back for a third time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brad. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cuddle. I apologize greatly. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, this is for your first time speaking. Go ahead. Uh, Mike, you're muted. Thank you very much. And uh, with the indulgence of Councillor Cuddle, uh, thank you. Just to very briefly, uh, Brad. So um, one of the things that really pleases me as mayor is to see how our uh, staff step up with ideas. I didn't always uh, necessarily see that. I see it all the time now. And I think about a number of people in your department. Victoria, I think, was the one that came up with the idea of the uh, free parking for deliveries and things like that before uh, Christmas and, and bringing those ideas forward is, is to me an indication of the fact that our senior staff are empowering our employees really well and and um, I, I just want to commend the people in your department on that so thank you for that. Um, on um, uh, the All Ages and Abilities Bike Network. We announced $25 million joint project a few years ago. It's been referenced by a couple of other councillors. Can you just give me a very brief update as to where we are on the implementation of those things that we announced back probably a year and a half ago? Yeah, so we're essentially midstream. Uh, like I say, 18, uh, 55 kilometers of the network is, is constructed. We got uh, a, a long way to go. We're a third of the way. This is really the heavy end of the schedule now. We have about three years left, uh, both in the funding and uh, in, the, uh, in the schedule to complete this work. Um, and I don't know, did you need more than that? That's, that's... No, as I recall, that was 25 million. We only paid, I think, four and a half or four and a quarter million oh, towards okay. 25 million, largely, most of which was in our capital plans anyway. So that was a real benefit uh, yes. to us. I just want to make that's correct. Yeah, it's a very, uh, we have a very small piece of that uh, investment. I can't remember the percentage offhand, but yes, it is uh, uniquely small. And the, the McDonald bikeway was part of that. I remember yes. many budgets, we've talked about the McDonald bikeway. You mentioned it in your presentation. How close yes, are we on that? Well, we start uh, project management and detailed design this year. So uh, we're getting close. Uh, Will it be next year? Or will it be the following construction season? I don't want to write a guarantee just yet, but that's that's where we're that's where we're heading towards. Because I remember a few years ago saying we were going to do that come hell or high water, and uh, um, <laughs> water's it's, getting it's big, high. Yeah, it's a huge piece of the network and uh, one that everybody's looking forward to. Beautiful. And the last thing is um, Andy Fillmore, and uh, who's the PS on infrastructure, and Catherine McKenna announced, I think it was $400 million for active transportation. And I'm just wondering, are you guys um, following that? Do we know what we might consider applying for in that fund? Obviously, the details I don't think are all out, but they've announced the funding. And just want to make sure you're aware of that and that we might be able to uh, get at least half of it. 
<laughs> Certainly, we're, we're fully aware and we're always working to have as many projects shovel ready as possible. Uh, there's no shortage of projects, as you know, are fully aware here in HRM. So yes, uh, you're right, the details aren't fully out there yet. We're fully aware of the program and we'll be working with government relations to line up to be ready to go and apply. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry for cutting you off earlier, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, go ahead. That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Brad, I just want to say like, whew, take a breath. <laughs> Talk about being on the hot seat for hours here. Um, I, uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you staying with us and continuing to uh, answer all our questions. Um, one thing I was going to say, and I think we just cleared it up with Councillor Mason, is that list of schools would be great. I think I asked that in my first round of questions about where I find that information, and and so I don't know. So yeah, that, that would be really wonderful. Um, you know, in terms of the traffic calming, I'm just wondering how we're working with you know how. Transportation Public Works works with HRP. I see that this is like a, there's an enforcement issue. There's a traffic calming issue. There's, you know, we put up signs, but what good are the signs? No one's paying attention to them. Um, so I don't, I'm just wondering if you could just comment a little bit about how that communication works back and forth between PTW and, and HRP in, when new speed zones are implemented or new traffic calming measures are implemented. Um, the other thing was just a comment to some some things Sam, uh, Councillor Austin said way back about the water quality, which goes back to the original presentation we had from a resident this morning. And, um, you know, I, I know a lot of our water management is just really looking at the quantity, not the quality. Um, and I'm not sure how those stormwater credits work or how we're taking advantage of them or where that falls into what we do with TPW. But, um, you know, I don't want to add another briefing note at this point, but because I don't think it's a budget item, but um, some better understanding around that, um, I think would be, would be useful for, for me at least. And um, I just want to say the, the, the pet waste pilot project in municipal parks. I was, I was like, uh, Councillor Purdy, I was like, oh, so exciting. <laughs> like those colorful little baggies left everywhere, really driving me insane. Like it, it's like, it's gone crazy. Like, I, it's, I don't know what, it, the whole thing is just crazy. And then you have the piles of garbage cans with bags overflowing and there has to be a better system. So on one hand, I'm happy to see that we'll be looking at composting that, I guess. I guess the other thing is the mitigation on the front end of that. Uh, do we need more garbage cans? Do we need regular pickup? Um, you know, I think just a bigger, strat better messaging. Like the, the whole, like we, I think we need to tackle that dog poopy bag thing, like <sighs> head on there. Um, and, um, and, I also just want to note back to this urban forestry piece. It is it is ten to 10, twelve to thirty thousand dollars for one tree in the urban hardscape, right? So that's I just want to back to how do we roll this out in a way that makes sense because that is a crazy amount of money for one tree. That's why I think when we talk about planning, um, you know, yesterday at Regional Council with Councillor Morris and the setbacks of the building and not building to 100% lot coverage. You know, I see every time we do that, it's an opportunity to put in urban trees. So I think the strategy can't just be going in afterwards and putting them in, particularly in urban hardscaped areas. It's got to line up with what we're doing in planning and development too, so that we're not spending $30,000 a tree. That's how much each tree costs on Argyle Street. So, you know, that's like, we, we, need, we need a better strategy around that. And I would love to see the thinking. And I know you're flagging me, Mr. Chair, for speaking too long, but um, uh, I'm done for now. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just want to clarify the, the schools, and I apologize for the school list. You're, you're correct. The, the 
So there's two tranches of, uh, so there's what was approved in the 21-22 capital plan for traffic calming. You, you're correct. Um, we haven't got that list of schools out there. What you received last night in your briefing note does show the list of additional schools that we would propose to do if we receive the additional million dollars. We will get back to you with the full list of schools. So there's uh, reduced confusion there. Um, that's an oversight on my behalf. Uh, in terms of uh, parks and garbage cans, uh, I guess a few things on the pet waste. So given my past experience with parks, uh, I will let them deal with the uh, sufficiency of garbage, pan, garbage cans in the parks. Uh, however, I will say there is a long overdue report, I believe requested by Councillor Cleary, uh, perhaps, and seeing that's how much I remember this, we are working on this. Um, it's, it's been delayed multiple times for multiple reasons, but we are coming back with our best attempt at answering that question about sufficiency of garbage cans throughout the municipality. Um, it's been proven to be a beast of a report to write, but uh, we're giving it the, the old heave ho, and especially on the, it's appropriate that it comes on the heels of our work around uh, illegal dumping. So that report is forthcoming. Uh, certainly this, in terms of pet waste making the garbage can, this is just purely a human behavior issue. It's unfortunate. And uh, hopefully, you know, as people see more value and maybe maybe some marketing around the organics factor might be enough to get folks to get it into the can, at least out of kindness to others. And I apologize, Councillor. Uh, uh, well, sorry, I'll deal with our urban hardscape first. Uh, yes, absolutely. The cost to put it into an urban hardscape such as Argyle Street is, is significant because it requires quite a soil cell. I, I will say that the vast majority, if not all the trees that we're talking about today in our, in our uh, tree canopy are not fitting into that characteristic. Certainly where we are moving forward with urban hardscape programs, um, certainly all of that is being planned in. And uh, certainly uh, would encourage your questions to uh, planning and development who are preparing, of course, the spring garden treescaping project, which involves uh, these considerations. So, um, but yeah, I just want to clarify it's, it's those are not, uh, that is not the typical tree that we're putting into our, our urban forest tree canopy program. And then finally, I do apologize. The stormwater question, I didn't quite come away with the question. I think I understood the, the 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 realm of what you were looking for. I didn't I didn't get the exact question. Yeah, I don't know if Mr. Chair is going to let me speak Go again. Ahead. That. Okay. Go ahead. Since you've already asked. I'm, it. I'm leaving for Heritage Advisory in a minute, so uh, you'll be you'll be done with me. Um, it, it was it was about um, you know in the stormwater management where you know Halifax Water looks at the quantity of water, not the quality of water, and so. I'm right, and, I, and and we're talking about doing bioswales and these kind of gardens to capture stormwater, and you get stormwater credits or something. And I don't really understand how all of that works, but I'm just was wondering how that fits in to um, you know what the earlier conversation we were having around stormwater management or treatment. Um, and perhaps we can bring that up another time. I don't want to, I know it's not a budget item, so I don't yeah. want to. Yeah, I guess the quick answer is uh, the way this splits off uh, is we've got HRM has above the ground. And if you will, from the moment it gets inside the, uh, inside the grates and into the stormwater system, it becomes Halifax waters. That's the easiest way to say it. But of course, our, our, our uh, environmental component this year is to increase street sweeping, right? Which will help Halifax water in a myriad of ways. One, it, it will improve stormwater runoff to a certain degree, but it also will improve a, a significant sedimentation of the stormwater system, which of course re reduces the capacity and causes overflows, which creates all kinds of other uh, environmental concerns. So, so that's that piece of it. In terms of, uh, um, you know, They've been very upfront right now. They're not focused on quality of stormwater. They're just taking whatever uh, they get in the stormwater system and dealing with it. As you know, council has, has pushed um, our team um, to start to look at this, especially around lakes. And thus we're going with the uh, stormwater best management practice, if you will, above ground, above the grate on Prince Albert Road. That will be our kind of foray into that, that type of work. Um, 
all kinds of other initiatives going on throughout the municipality around runoff. But well, that's the key thing. Um, really, it's 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 uncharted territory, and uh, certainly a, 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 an issue we'll have to work with with Halifax Water if we're going to make a big uh, leap into uh, stormwater quality, uh, if you will, at end of pipe. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Morris, for your first time speaking. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say everyone has uh, has um, commended you, Brad, and I would also like to say that you do an amazing job and every interaction I've had with uh, your staff has been uh, extremely professional and, and they're always super helpful. So I just wanted to echo those comments. Um, uh, my questions are uh, about some of the major projects like the Bedford Highway and the Windsor Street Exchange that seem to be getting bumped out further. So I'm just wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges with those big projects and um, the timing considerations and when we're likely to see some of those uh, projects begin. Uh, and somewhat related to that is the Dutch Village Road um, uh, major reconstruction that's uh, planned for next year. And I'm wondering how confident you are that that will um, be completed next year. Um, it's been on the books for improvements for a long time. And um, finally, I have a number of, um, well, I have a neighborhood in my district that is on extremely hilly terrain and there are no drains uh, for stormwater runoff. And I believe it's related to non-accepted streets. So I'm just wondering if you could touch on what is, it seems like it, it would be um, not a huge budget item to try to work out some of these um, streets and then to perhaps get started on installing drains. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could touch on that, please. Sure, Go ahead. there's no, no, uh, no easy question today, I'd say. Um, so the Bedford Highway, look, regrettably, um, the Bedford Highway, uh, we want to get started. It is a budget. It is a budget issue, and of course, uh, we have not. We are actively pursuing the uh, design, the preliminary. Sorry, the functional designs and preliminary designs necessary to get there. As far as construction goes, right now it is sitting at the edge of the, at the. I think in the fifth year to get rolling. You know, so it's not showing up. You know, in terms of hard construction in the fourth year. And again, I'm going from memory, so please forgive me. Um, so that was that was difficult for us. Uh, we are concerned about the condition along the Bedford Highway. Certainly, if you drive and you look at the curbs, there's a great example of there's no curb left to work with. So even if you wanted to patch, you're you're not you've got nothing left to, to work with. So it is it is a concern. We are actively working on it. None of us is really satisfied that we've got the right answer yet there. Uh, but again, money was a key driver in trying to determine what was going to fit into this four-year capital plan, given all of council's, uh, you know, urgent priorities. Uh, Windsor Street Exchange, you know, feeling good about that. We did, we did delay the project a little bit uh, solely because uh, the other piece of it, which is being done by the port, was behind schedule. And we had some uh, potential conflicts with access to the peninsula with the way it was lining up with other construction projects. So pushing that just a little bit to the right did make a lot of sense. So, you know, we're fully committed. It's just a question of the proper time and place to do it. And I think quite frankly, given the man magnitude of the project, a little more planning breathing room is not a bad idea on that particular project. Um, Dutch Village Road, <laughs> yeah, there's a question. Confidence level. I'm not sure I'm going to do that in public. <laughs> but look, I, you know, it's, it's on the plan. It's on the docket. We're committed to it. A lot of work went into determining to keep it there. We feel it's in a sweet spot in the plan uh, and it's in the right location to be able to get it done. So my confidence level, you know, is high. Um, obviously, anything can happen in projects of this magnitude, but we feel very good about that one. Uh, in terms of non-accepted streets, that's a great one. Um, the biggest issue with non-accepted streets, and for all uh, new counselors, is an issue where we have a lot of streets in HRM that, 
in the ownership or the land ownership is in dispute or it's just not known or it's actually private. And of course, many councillors have private streets. These become a bit of a, a bit of a challenge for us when we're trying to do infrastructure upgrades or it needs infrastructure upgrade. If we don't have clear ownership, it makes it difficult to make an investment into it. And so we have a lot of these councillor uh, clearies district, especially. Um, we did get direction from council to, to move forward. Uh, we did get the green light. We've been unable to get sufficient budget together in terms of, because the first step is to really uh, do the title searches and get that work done. Um, phase one of that was going to be about $400,000. Um, and like I say, we, we had it sitting there as an over. We don't feel good about this. We feel it's something we need to get done, but it's just on the balance of all the priorities. It's just something that's kind of, it's there, but it's just not quite high enough to rate, but we're keeping it visible for council so that you can see that we're, we're just, we're, we haven't been able to get the money put together uh, within our available resources. So that's, um, but yeah, step one is getting clear title to these streets. And then really the next step in the acceptance process is once we know who's got it, then we can start working with folks because typically our program here is that we don't take over a street until it's up to municipal standards. Now, that also is a bit of a challenge for council because that's not always possible. And so this was an area that needs attention in the municipality. It's just one where we're having problems getting off the ground. Sorry, that's my best answer there. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll start off with a point of clarification. Uh, Brad, the garbage can motion is actually mine, not Cleary. I know that uh, Councillor Cleary needs all the help with good motions. He's not taking mine off. Uh, oh, but, okay. <laughs> but it's interesting uh, you say how complex that motion is, right? For, you know, Brad, for our residents, they call us, can we have a garbage can? We say no. They say, what do you mean? I just want a garbage can. They don't understand the complexity. So I think I look forward to that when this motion comes back so they truly understand the complexity of this. And so uh, thank you for that. Uh, painting lines, you brought that up earlier on. And I know Councillor Ed had mentioned that in Bedford, he saw the painting done sooner. Well, that may have happened in Bedford. It didn't happen in District 6 because I believe we had lines being painted still in September uh, last year. And so you can speak to that because especially crosswalks and getting it done uh, in a timely fashion and getting it done before the school year starts. Uh, that'll be appreciated. Thank you. The green, green bin, is there any evaluation or any impact done when we went to the bi-weekly this last year? Uh, any, uh, any data you can share with us uh, what impact it had in our facilities and so on? Uh, the household waste, you know, and, and Councillor Hensby has been talking about this since I got first got elected. I mean, having one facility and not having one on the dark facade is, is a problem. We constantly hear about people who are restricted when you can bring some of that household waste. They get there in Bears Road. It's, there's a large lineup to do so. Uh, I'm you know, glad to see that you're looking to expand the household waste events. And we did shut that off because of COVID last time. I mean, it's, it's very popular when it's in uh, Councillor Austin's area. Nick Mac Mall, it's lined up, and now you may have to be in a lineup for a couple of hours. It just shows to the need. Is there any discussion, any strategy, or any feasibility study done on looking at a second facility? Uh, I'd like to hear about that. Um, and two more items, and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, street trees you brought up also, and uh, tree pruning, and HRM being Tree City of the World. Uh, that's all. That's all great, and. And I know with Crispin Wood, our, our, our arborist is not a big fan of how we've planted some of our street trees in the past based on his experience. Uh, it's the warranty work piece. And you and I have talked about it. Crispin and I have talked about it. I'm still not clear on it, uh, Brad. I, I still drive down District 6 and roads and I see streets, uh, trees rather that are dead for the last three years and they're still there. And, you know, I just don't understand the warranty piece on it. Why aren't they taken down? And now, you know, you go through a season now they all look dead because of the time of year and we have to wait to see, you know, the spring come and what you're living. And why, you know, I really rather see them not there if they're, if they're not alive. Uh, so if you could speak to that. And the last item is lime green crosswalks. You know, I understand it's, we're not allowed based on the province. However, we see them in other, other municipalities uh, around Nova Scotia. It is truly frustrating. Are there conversations with the province about changing the color and, and what will happen even if we are successful in changing the color 
people become complacent, then the next question, can you change them back to where they were before? But if you can speak to those, those are my items, uh, Mr. Chair. How do I do in timing? How's it timing? Three minutes and 10 seconds. Well done, Tony. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, on the line painting, I'm, I don't know how far I can go with that answer other than to say that, you know, overall, we had a good year for line painting last year, only in that, you know, the traffic was reduced and the weather was good. So for the most part, the work got done uh, really ahead of expectation. I'm sorry to hear that your community was lagging. I, I'll, I'll have to confer with staff to see what might have been the issue there. Um, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not clear on why. Yeah, we can shut offline of that, Brad, that's fine. Yeah, sure. Uh, you talked about the uh, green bin and the impact on facility. Uh, certainly there was no, no impact per se in terms of production or flow through that I'm aware of. Uh, so I, that's what I have. I'll, I'll double check with my team, but I don't think there was any impact on the facility. Um, negative or positive? I mean, is negative there, or positive? That's, yeah, that's ho right. hoping there was a positive impact, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you know, the load the loads would have been down overall due to the reduced green card pickup. Uh, we think, but I'll check. Uh, I'll check what the flows were. Uh, household hazardous waste. There is no plan for a second facility at this time. Uh, we did, however, so last year was a, you know, you learn your lessons. Uh, because of all the handling that goes on with hazardous waste, it seemed very logical and that we would not encourage hazardous waste uh, disposal drop off uh, just because of the amount of contact that occurs. And, and certainly that initial decision made great sense. Obviously, though, when we turned the, we did, we were able to turn on the facility sooner than we had thought. We spent some extra money doing so. When we put the system back in place, of course, the pent up demand for that depot was huge and the lines were absolutely miserable. We got a lot of complaints about it, which is really what has spirited us to, you know, um, you know, we, well, we know on one hand it was based on pent up demand. On the other hand, we also know there is a real desire for citizens to want to handle their waste appropriately, and that should be addressed. And so that's why we put forward in our budget the potential over to do the additional mobile vents if council so chose. But yeah, there is no there is no plan at this time to, to do a second permanent, if you will, facility. You know, the and challenge for that, sorry, Brad, the challenge for that is when we talk about illegal dumping, if it's difficult for our residents to unload these this waste, unfortunately, it ends up in the environment, right? So there, there's the big challenge, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and uh, warranty work on trees? Well, you, you're a master at it by the sounds of it. <laughs> uh, you know, look, we, we, we do have the warranty. Well, what I can say is there has been a change. Crispin has made some changes within his staff. We now have a supervisor dedicated to uh, warranty and contract work to do a better job of that. Um, and as you say, we don't typically know till the spring exactly what all the losses are. But again, and again, I apologize for bobbling the question earlier. One of the things that Crispin has put in place is he's increasing the planting spec on our urban canopy program so that there's more soil and more support bracing for the tree to have a better chance of survival. Uh, so we're not seeing the high levels of warranty work. Because again, um, if it's not put in properly in the first place, it's not going to survive. And so, uh, and as Councillor Cuddle has pointed out, I mean, in some of our cases, we just don't have the proper soil depth to be trying to put trees in. Uh, so Crispin is making great strides there to improve the quality of what we do, albeit it could be a little more expensive. Um, that, and then lime green crosswalks, well. <laughs> I, I just it's made the comment. Yeah, it's, it's a no response. response. Yeah, it's okay. It's it's, but I think it's worthy of of the the new counselors. Uh, certainly, lime green crosswalk signs uh, they are seen throughout of the Nova Scotian municipalities. Clearly, those municipalities are choosing not to follow the manual uniform traffic control devices as set out by the provincial traffic authority. Being yeah. the largest municipality in the in the, we, we take it we take it seriously that we're to set the example. So, and as you know. We had council and councillors and leaders from TSE go and speak with the province personally on this issue to try and motivate change. And, and we were unsuccessful and of course received a letter that, that we were not to move forward with that change. So we have respected that, albeit we don't particularly like, like it. 
Thank you, Brad. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to put on the uh, parking lot the mobile household special waste uh, on the uh, on the parking lot, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a do we have a seconder for that motion to add the Second mobile? Add, please. Councillor Lovelace. Okay. So at this point, we have on the floor the motion to um, increase the number of mobile household special waste events. Uh, I think by a count of six uh, for an extra of 115,000. And the uh, clerk has just put the motion in the chat that the budget committee include 115,000 in ongoing funding for costs associated with mobile household special waste events uh, within the proposed 2021-22 budget for the transportation and public works in the parking lot as an operating over budget option. Uh, so we are on that motion. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Austin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and apologies if I missed this somewhere in the uh, conversation. Um, I, I, how many more, like, what would this look like? How many more um, events would this um, provide? Um, oops, this would provide six more events, Councillor, and there's no magic to that number. We just, we do 12 now, it was like, well, 50% increase, you know, it could be any number up to that. Uh, or over that uh, runs about nineteen to twenty thousand dollars an event to host some mobile. And I assume then that these would be uh, scattered throughout the municipality. Correct. Correct. We, you know, if council wants to proceed in this direction, we would uh, we would uh, come forward with some recommended locations uh, and and distribution. Would you anticipate coming forward with that uh, sort of thing um, it, before we get to the budget adjustment list, or would this be after, you know, down the line? Well, as, as I sit here today, I don't see there's any reason why we wouldn't uh, give that a try and lay it out for you so that you can understand what the distribution would look like that makes complete sense to me, and I believe it would be achievable. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question to Mr. Anguish. Uh, so you mentioned there are 12 events going to happen in the next fiscal. And so this would be 18 if we added this, is that correct? <laughs> well done, Councillor Cleary. I've always known to pause. <laughs> I am gonna call a friend on this one to make sure I got this right, okay? Uh, I think Andrew's standing by. Uh, I'm not trusting my, some of my uh, numbers at the moment. <clears throat> just gonna Hi, Brian. God, thank you, Andrew. Can you just repeat that question? Sorry, I was just going. Uh, so how many uh, uh, mobile household special waste events are currently proposed? Because this is an over for an additional six. So I'm just wondering what, what's proposed in the budget as it exists now? There's, there's 12 mobile events currently planned in the budget. So there's already 12, so this would be an additional six. And are those current 12 spread out? Because I remember going to some at Micmac Mall. I remember some in other places. So roughly the 12 existing ones, are they spread out around the municipality now? Uh, they are, and we tend to, uh, thank you, th uh, through the chair to the councillor, um, the, the, um, we, we tend to focus on areas in the municipality that are a little further away than our depot out in Bears Lake. So there is like, to your point, Sackville, Dartmouth, you know, uh, further north, further east, um, away from the Halifax core, right? And would there be multiple in some of those areas or only one in Sackville or would there be multiple in Sackville, two or three, for example? So, um, and I have the, the list right here. I'm just kind of looking at it. So with the original 12 that we have planned, so for example, there would be one in Sackville. But if council were so to select doing the additional six, we could potentially look at a second event in Sackville or for example, another popular location is Micmac Mall, right? We could do a second one out at Micmac Mall. Okay. All right. Thank you. For, I appreciate that, Mr. Falkless. Thank you. Um, here we are. Thank you. Let me see now. I think Councillor Dago Gammon, you wanted to speak on this motion? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, my question is, um, when you think about the 12, are they, from a calendar point of view, uh, seasonal? I know that when you think about when people are doing a lot of work that it's either the spring or the fall, um, and so do we look at seasonality about when we do the mobile um, 
uh, hazardous waste options. Andrew, I'll just let you keep swinging away. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pat. Thank you through the chair to the counselor. Um, so we we um, we we tend to schedule the mobile events from spring to fall, um, and that is driven by weather and um, just outside conditions to make it more pleasant for people to be able to drop off materials. That being said, you know, spring to fall, I mean, spring cleaning, for example, uh, there is mobile events planned during the spring, but again. Uh, we, we do look spring to fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, um, you know, state the, the obvious, I guess, that <clears throat> the majority of the illegal dumping is happening in our rural areas. So having the opportunity to have uh, more education, more awareness and more presence, uh, you know, with these mobile community events, I think is really essential in addressing the illegal dumping. Um, so while it's a great opportunity to have people, you know, come uh, to, you know, head of St. Margaret's Bay or Upper Tantallon or, you know, Indian Harbor uh, to drop off their, their household, uh, their household um, waste items, you know, being able to also communicate to communicate and educate at the same time, I think is really important. So I'm just wondering, Andrew, if you could speak to, you know, how these uh, community events are also communications and education opportunities as well. Uh, thank you through, uh, through the chair to, to the counselor. Great, great question. Great observation. And, and so absolutely. Um, promoting these events, um, educating uh, the public in terms of uh, what we accept um, at them and the importance of, of keeping this material out of landfills is definitely in integral. Um, and, um, you know, we do, we do spend a lot of um, money and time and effort certainly in, in promoting uh, these events. The, the other thing I would just add is that um, we also um, do spend um, a, a lot of time trying to promote alternatives to the HSW depot. So there are a lot of opportunities for people, for example, our residents to drop off paint um, at an Enviro depot is a very, very common one. No need to drive if, if the depot is far for you or the mobile event's not accessible for you. There are lots of other options uh, for paint, for, uh, for your fuels, uh, for other items, electronics, et cetera, et cetera. And so we certainly do uh, promote that as well via our website and via uh, social media. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Councillor Lovelace just prompted me to think of a couple of things. So when uh, garbage is collected now curbside, it is uh, brought to the, uh, the, the facilities and is it not opened and inspected before it goes to landfill? So for example, if someone sticks in a bunch of batteries, CFLs, et cetera, um, are those kind of things uh, discovered and diverted once they're at a facility or, or do they go directly to landfill? I guess my question is around, so some people would, if they can't easily um, put waste out, illegally dump it, but others might say, well, if I can't get there, I'll just stick it in my black bag and no one will notice. But those kind of things, are they not discovered at the facility when they're dropped off? Thank you through the chair to the councillor. Um, so at Otter Lake, we do have a front end processor um, bags. Uh, it is a mechanical process. Uh, there is some HSW that is recovered predominantly um, the, some batteries and, and like the smaller camping style propane tanks are the common ones. But the one thing I would mention to you, Councillor, the, um, the capture rate is very small compared to what we capture um, from our mobile events, from our, our depot. The, the best way to capture this material is source separation and, and having this material dropped off. One of the things that a resident brought to my attention just recently was batteries. So there's apparently a couple of studies that look at how many batteries are sold in jurisdictions and how many are actually recycled. And it seems like a very ridiculously low number are recycled. He, he has sent me a report that indicated about 20%. And so in, in our experience, what do these mobile events or are there other things that we could do? Some counselors have mentioned things like uh, education, more promotion. What could we be doing besides this? If we were, 
you know, if we had a limited, as we do, if we have a limited amount of money to spend and we want to spend it in the best way possible, are there better ways to let residents know that here's how you deal with your waste? Here's what doesn't go in. I mean, we have apps, we have websites, we have mail outs, but are there other things that we can or should be doing to help with the diversion and with people source separating and making sure things are going in the appropriate places? Thank you for the question. I think the biggest thing, counselor, is um, promoting these alternatives. Batteries, there's lots of options to drop off batteries. Lots of retailers will take back batteries. Um, and so I think sometimes um, our, it's kind of educating residents. Yes, you've got the, uh, the HSW program and you have that option, but there are lots of others that may be more convenient when you go out to a retailer and you're buying new batteries, take some of your old ones back, right? So I think it's promoting um, the alternative visit, I think is a big opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any uh, further speakers in the list on uh, the motion about uh, household special waste. Uh, so with That's that, motion. We, the question has been called, so over to the clerk. Beginning with District 9, Councillor Cleary. Uh, yes, for the briefing note. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. 12, Councillor Stoddard. 12. Councillor Stoddard has left, uh, and so has Councillor Cuddle for the Heritage Advisory Committee meeting. District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Chair Russell. In favor? Deputy Mayor Outhit. Voting no, it's cheaper by the dozen. <laughs> One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the briefing no. Two, Councillor Hensby. As long as I get my three depots, I'm in favor of it. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. For the briefing note, yes. Four, Councillor Purdy. Same. For the briefing note, yes. Five, Councillor Austin. For a briefing note, yes. Six, Councillor Mancini. For the real thing, yes. <laughs> Seven, Councillor Mason. For a briefing note, yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> Mayor Savage. No. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, that motion passes. So we are back on the main motion. Oh. I was missed. You were missed, Councillor yeah. Smith. Uh, four. Thank You're you, in favor. Smith. Thank you very much. Um, so we are back on the main motion. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, she, Brad, I could probably talk about this for hours and hours. I mean, my goodness, so much information here to, to digest and, and I have a lot more questions, but uh, Mr. Chair is only gonna give me three minutes. So I'm gonna be real quick. Um, and I can't let this go, Brad. You uh, just, just terminology, the way you said that we need to bring provincial roads up to HRM standards. I just wanna sit with that for a second <laughs> because it's really important to my just to my district to many rural uh, residents and businesses that uh, that we do hold those standards. And I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, however, I do have to point out I've got Hammonds Plains Road behind me. Residents marched on this road in March 2011 to get the road paved, to get it widened, to get the shoulders paved, uh, to get the speed dropped, to make it safer so we could actually walk on the roads, so we could bike on the roads, so we could cross the road. Uh, you know, and we're seeing that continued uh, that that continued problem on the rest of Hammonds Plains Road. Now I know we don't own uh, the whole road, uh, but from uh, the 103 exchange. Um, through to uh, Yankee Town Road, we really do need some support. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about uh, the high rate of speed at 80 kilometers. I know that uh, TASO is going to continue to look at that. But when we talk about uh, the second exit uh, that's needed, um, you know, our crosswalk that's needed, safer bus stops, you know, I know bus stops, not your bailiwick. But that being said, we have to find a way to create a, a safer roadway on that section. And with regards to the provincial road transfer, uh, I know I've mentioned this before, you know, we've got uh, a couple of PIDs that need to come over. 
that are currently provincially owned, uh, and that's at the Sylvania, uh, Sylvania extension, um, you know, as well as the West Point uh, Drive extension for Margeson Road. You know, those two provincial pieces of road, they need to be addressed so that we can continue to uh, expand connectivity and have safer roadways. Um, you know, it, it, the, the whole project planning and design of David Hubley and his team thumbs up, you know, really great work there. I know they've got a lot on their plate, uh, but the Hubbard Streetscape project is not gonna slow down. It's gonna speed up. So, you know, that project uh, team, I think needs to begin to start uh, having conversations um, with, uh, with the Hubbard Streetscape and make sure that everybody's at the table with the province uh, to ensure that uh, Upland uh, consultants are, are, have what they need to move ahead effectively for a connected, safe, viable, healthy community in Hubbard's. And, and just on that note, I wanted to raise the paved shoulders uh, conversation. We know that paved shoulders increases the integrity of the roadbed. You know, the road lasts longer. I know that it's not part of the Red Book standard, but, you know, thinking about how can we ensure that those paved shoulders are safer for us to walk on. I think uh, a couple of other councils, uh, councillors have mentioned have mentioned that. Um, speed radar signs. So we had a few here in Hammonds Plains, Upper Ten Talon, that they've now been decommissioned. Uh, are we going to get some more uh, that we can use within our community? And I have to talk about public washrooms on active transportation trails, uh, because, you know, I, I think it needs to be uh, talked about and, and planned as far as where are people going to go? Uh, we're creating, you know, all of these great trails, uh, but there's no access to public washrooms. And the last thing that I just wanted to mention very quickly. If would, I have, you mind, oh, would you I'm mind over. coming back? <laughs> okay, I'll come right. back. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Anguish. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll just try to confirm work that's ongoing. So certainly on Hammonds Plains Road, we're very aware of your concerns there. And I know Tasso is working with, the, with them. That is actively being looked at by staff, both from uh, infrastructure and a uh, traffic management point of view. Uh, in terms of the road transfer in the PIDs, what I certainly as it pertains to Sylvania extension, we're working on the briefing note now. In fact, I have a draft that will be coming forward as request, you had requested at Capitol. That'll be in there in time for the, even though there's no BAL uh, budget adjustment list impact, it will, it will be there on time. Uh, so that's there. Uh, Hubbard Streetscape. Um, Planning and Development is leading the report on that, and uh, they have the, the streetscape team at the moment. Obviously, we work in very close uh, proximity to them on this, so I'll be sure to make sure that uh, we pass on the heads up about how fast the community wants to move. Uh, paved shoulders, I assume that comment was pertaining to provincial roads. Uh, you're correct, that is, that is not in their standard. Uh, however, um, that's why, uh, continue to put that alert out there. We're keeping an eye out based on our experience in Mineville for uh, provincial roads that may be in, um, I guess, uh, best to say in, in, in suburban or, or, you know, have fairly dense areas where we got opportunities to pave the shoulders alongside of their project. Certainly Mineville was a good example for a handful of dollars we got in there with, a, I think, quite a decent impact for Mineville. Um, so we're on to that. We know about it, but we do have to pony up the money for that um, and come through with our share because that is not in their standard as it sits today. Uh, the decommit, the yes, I have your email on the decommissioned um, uh, dynamic speed display signs. I, I will confess it's not making sense to me. So I believe there's a there's some kind of communication confusion there. We are working to actively sort that out, and really that is what's driving us to put out written procedures around these signs, so that both the RCMP, the HRP, our team, and of course the provincial government, uh, sorry, not provincial government, but our provincial counterparts. And I'll be on the same page with how these things are going to be managed, you know, how they get how they get bought, how they get put up, how they get life cycled. There's a lot of uh, a, you know, for a handful of signs they are causing a lot of administrative work and chasing. So we know we have to get these written procedures done. So and we will get back to you on that that specific issue of, 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 of what happened with you with the RCMP detachment. I, I just believe, honestly, there's some confusion there um, in terms of public washrooms. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, come from Parks and Recreation, join TPW. Uh, public washrooms are absolutely just something, you know, our community has not historically had, and we are working hard to recover on that. It's not easy nor cheap to put public washrooms in, in you know, of a proper standard. That said, uh, we acknowledge this. Uh, we do work with our community partners to see what can be done. These are factored into our funding applications on AT uh, where, it's, where it's warranted. So my best answer there is on a priority basis, we're working to do what we can. Uh, but yeah, there is, a, there is absolutely a deficit of public washrooms, whether it be in our park system or in our trail system. Uh, but it is acknowledged and certainly in the key areas, we're trying to respond to public pressure as best we can. To, to get something in place. So, sorry, I don't have a better answer on that one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to follow up on what Councillor Lovelace said. So, um, you know, washrooms on trails uh, impacts disproportionately women and children. And uh, it'd be, be great to have more of those. I know on the Chain of Lakes Trail, uh, there's some portable washrooms that are there. Uh, and of course, uh, if you look at the, um, the websites, whether it's Rum Runners, uh, the trails uh, sites uh, for Nova Scotia or our websites, uh, they actually show you uh, where private businesses are and other places where you can actually go. So that's a great resource, but we do need more. Um, so I'm just putting in the chat window here uh, my motion. So this is with regard, Mr. Anguish, to the potential over for transit stops. And it was, um, I don't have it open right in front of me, but I think it was roughly two mil. Uh, and so my motion is that the budget committee request a briefing note detailing the measures and implications for enhancing transit stop clearing from 48 hours to 24 hours for the proposed 21-22 transit and public works budget uh, for consideration in the parking lot as an over budget option. Second, Councillor Mason. Se seconded by Councillor Mason. And yes, that is for $2 million. So thank you, Mr. Chair. So very quickly on that one. Um, if we are serious about the integrated mobility plan that we unanimously passed in December 2017, and if we are serious about the mode shift targets, which is also part of our Halifax plan. We need, and has been mentioned by a number of people, we need to get more people on transit. And so one of the things that has been an issue for years is that our sidewalks along arterial routes are sometimes, not always, sometimes clear to the standard and it's, it's ready to go for people. Unfortunately, our transit stops don't always get cleared when the sidewalk is being cleared because it's a, sometimes in certain zones, a different contractor, it's a different uh, uh, time standard under our policy. And so my next motion will be later to test council, but I want to bring this one first to see if people are willing to go this far. Uh, but if we're serious about getting people on transit, building transit back up, making a difference on climate change, this is something we need to do. So um, uh, in the briefing note uh, for, for Mr. Anguish, just a quick question. What would be the challenge in the upcoming year, if any, of making this work. Uh, two million sounds like a lot. Is that because of the contracts that we currently have, the zones that we currently have? Would it be cheaper over the next few years as all of the zones are merged and these are parts of packages that other contractors do? Why, this seems like a lot of money for me. And so I'm just trying to understand why it's so much. Uh, purely it's, it's the standard being done within 24 hours and the sheer volume of the stops. I don't have the number on my hand, but it, it's a loss. Um, that's the, the key driver, obviously. And, and I apologize, you know, I don't have much of the information detail at hand. I'll certainly make sure it's in the note. Um, um, you know, and, and obviously be very clear about what we can fit into contracts for this year. Um, uh, but yes, it's, it's absolutely got to be added into the contracts. Uh, they're pretty much at, at, uh, at rates. So it was a pretty clear calculation as I recall, but again, I'll apologize. We'll flesh out those details in the briefing note if this goes forward, but we're pretty solid on the number. That was a number that we worked up as you recall as, as a result of the snow standards budget. And it, you know, and, and it was a recommendation from staff that, that council endorsed and it was to support IMP. The one question that I will say, we haven't 
uh, we have to work off anecdotal information, which is always unfortunate. But one question we get asked a lot is, you know, how often do we hit the 24 hour standard? Um, you know, just through the current standard of 48. That one, we, it's, it's less, we have to go off anecdotal. We understand we're hitting a number of them within 24 hours. We don't know what percentage and frequency. So um, that question is a harder one to answer, but, but at the end of the day to, to push this more of a, of a certain standard, yes, uh, we'll, we'll, it's gonna require an investment for sure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other speakers for the motion on the uh, enhanced transit. And I just saw uh, Councillor Outfit, Outfit uh, pop up. So go ahead, uh, Councillor Outfit. Thank you, Chair. And it'd be interesting to see that 24 hour, uh, and it was anecdotal. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, certainly before a briefing note uh, came back or the discussion in the uh, parking lot. If most of them or many of them are being handled 24 hours now. I don't know what others think about this, and I, I guess I thought others might speak on this, so I wanted to throw out the feedback that I get more is that we don't have shelters. And the feedback that I get more is that, of course, areas that still don't have service or enough service more than I get uh, pushback on the amount of clearing. But I just wanted to throw that out there. In, in my case, it's more of the, uh, the lack of shelters that I hear. And of course, Sean's right. We want to increase usage and we want to change people's habits. But what I'm hearing, if we want to change people's habits and, and get them using it, is give us a shelter so we don't get drowned or frozen on the side of the road or, uh, or, or and again, uh, you know, a little more fast and frequent service. But uh, we'll see what others are here, if anything. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wonder, is, uh, I assume, Jane, you're on the line. Are you? Jane Frazier? I am. Hi, hi Jane. Sorry, I, uh, you thought you were going to get away. Scott free <laughs> all day, Jane. I've been waiting. I know, I know, I know. Uh, if it was anybody else, I would make a comment about sleeping and stuff, but I know you're not never sleeping, so I, I won't do that. So you sent us the budget adjustment, or your team did. I just want to understand that. So that budget adjustment that you sent prior to today's meeting shows a little over $2 million. That's $2 million that's on the parking lot base on our meeting so far in budget, is that correct? Correct. So today, uh, my 100 grand and Councilor O'Cleary's 2 million, so we're up to $4 million over the budget. So correct. just want to clarify that for everybody. Um, so thank you, Jane, that, that, that was all. I just want to make sure I was reading this correctly. Uh, you know, Mr. Chair and colleagues, um, it's only a briefing note, so great, get it on the parking lot, but, uh, and, and I'll vote for it, allow it on it, but we're up to 4 million bucks already. And so some councillors said today they don't want to increase taxes and uh, reduce uh, services. So this is, and I think there's more to come before the day is over. So uh, I'll agree to, uh, I'll vote for it and allow it to go, but I caution you when it comes to talking about the parking lot, um, you know, I, the reality of me voting for most of these items are gonna be pretty slim, but uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, I don't see any additional names in uh, in the chat. And Councillor Mason, a couple of minutes ago, called the question. So I'm going to hand it over to the clerk to run through the roll for the question. Thank you. Beginning with District 10, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. 12, Councillor Stoddard. 13, Councillor Lovelace. I didn't see that she had left the meeting. Councillor Lovelace. Are we still good with quorum, uh, Mr. Chair? We are good with quorum. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Apologies, I'm having a hard time connecting. Um, can you repeat that, please? This is the motion for the budget committee uh, briefing note on enhanced transit stop clearing from 48 hours to 24 hours. This is simply for a briefing note. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will approve that. Unfortunately, you were frozen. <laughs> thank you. District 14, Council Blackburn. Voting yes for a briefing note. 15, Chair Russell. In favor? 
Deputy Mayor Outhead. Finished as we had initially. Or briefing, nope. One, Councilor Daigle Gammon. October, we have to be open. Voting in favor of the briefing note. Two, Councilor Hensby. That's affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor of a briefing note. Four, Councilor Purdy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in favor of a briefing note. Although I think it already gets cleared in 24 hours. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. In favor. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councilor Smith. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Channeling my inner Councilors Purdy and Blackburn, yipper dipper do. Mayor Savage. Opposed. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, by my count, that motion passes. Uh, we are back on the Main motion with Councillor Hensby. Um, we're good to go. And then Tony. One moment there. I got to turn down my other meeting here. But again, it would be nice by that time if you had whatever plans. All right. Back to my list of questions I had. Okay. I think the biggest concern I have in regards to has his waste depot I'm glad we're going to have uh, looking at more of them. But um, I'm still concerned about the organic collections. I'm, I'm hoping our, our legal dumping uh, initiatives will come forward, try and crack down on this. I'm looking forward to that. The streetlight inventory has been always been an issue for me. You know that very well. Uh, where's the status of our inventory in, in dispute with Nova Scotia Power? I keep saying there's a lot of private roads that we put streetlights up on when we had the area rates for streetlighting. And they're supposed to come over with us because they're all part of the tax base of servicing those roads. So uh, I need to know the status of that, as well as I have some recreation centers in some of our parks. We still have the old lights on and people uh, are disputing who owns what lights. So I'm getting tired of this being dragging on and dragging on. And we need to bring that list forward and settle it uh, once and for all. Um, also, I thought with the LED lighting capacity, um, I'm grateful you put more in the North Preston area to, to bring up the minimum standard for lighting in that area. But uh, those areas are concerned about uh, starlights instead of street lights. I thought we had the capacity of dimming down our LED lighting um, in evenings and stuff. So I don't know what the status of that is. I, I, I don't recall seeing any ad, in action uh, while I'm driving the streets at night, coming home from the Sheet Harbor area to, uh, to home. I'm grateful to see that our billboard agreements are finally going to be reviewed. I think the technology upgrades need to be done on those billboards as well as leasing. I hope we're going to have an open competitive bid process for those uh, for those leases and uh, move forward with that. I can't wait until the uh, rural active transportation and the integrated mobility plan comes together with a report with some kind of funding mechanism, hopefully the tie in with the federal uh, federal monies that we just heard about. And my last question is going to be about uh, two last questions. I hope we have a, a contingency fund for any severe storms in regards to uh, tree debris material collection. And this uh, comment about non-accepted streets, I'd like to have more detail of what do you mean by non-accepted streets. I've had this debate in the past about um, streets that are not up to so-called red book standards. And we're starting to accept uh, certain streets that are below certain red book standards. Then there has to be um, an equal application in rural areas because I had some old roads. I like that too. So that's it, my, my list of questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Anguish. There you are. Okay. Uh, yeah. Regarding uh, the streetlight issue, uh, certainly that has, I, I agree with councilor has been on the books a number of years. Uh, the CAO has uh, got me a front row seat with uh, NSP to deal with this firsthand. So it is on the docket. Uh, I start meeting with senior officials, I believe, uh, with DASO um, in about mid-April. Um, that is uh, one of two items, uh, the other being vegetation management, that we hope to get resolution on quickly. We understand this is a significant issue in certain communities. In terms of the billboards, yes, it'll be a competitive process. In terms of uh, the non-accepted streets, that's different from, I think, Councillor, what you're referring to, which is you have a number of private streets in your in your uh, area. Those private streets are currently governed by a policy which requires them to be brought up to standard before being transferred to the municipality. Um, I have committed to meeting with you that got held up as a result of COVID. We'll, we've committed to meeting with you and discussing 
uh, some of the particular streets you're interested in uh, to see what could be done there. I expect this the path to resolve uh, private streets being transferred to the municipality will have to come through council in some form or another uh, for policy change. But uh, that's, that's where we are today. I think that was all of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is now 425. We're already a half an hour past the 4pm scheduled stop time. I'd just like to reach out to everybody, uh, both uh, councillors and staff, and see what people's thoughts are on breaking now until Friday morning. Uh, we have four speakers left on the list. It's really close, Paul, but people got to go get their kids and stuff. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, and I'm seeing in the chat as well, uh, three councillors have weighed in about uh, breaking at this point. So at this point, I would like to uh, uh, ask for a motion for recess until Friday morning, uh, resuming at 9.30. I so Moved by Councillor Lovelace, seconded by Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Great. I believe we are recessed until Friday morning at 9.30. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Brad. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Brad. <laughs> Thanks, Superstar. <laughs> thank you. That was yeah. awesome.